This is Audible. Zero Twenty Two by Chris Ryan. Read by Michael Fenner. Chapter One. Twenty three forty five hours Eastern European time. The convoy headed west. It comprised four vehicles, three sand-coloured jackals, each containing three guys, and mounted with two general-purpose machine guns. The jimpies had an effective range of 2,000 metres in sustained fire mode. Regular infantry would need two men to operate each weapon, not the SAS. Each gun was constantly manned by a single regiment guy wearing night vision goggles, surveying the desert terrain and ready for whatever threats they might encounter. The fourth vehicle was a bushmaster, camouflage paint, sturdy rear-mounted spare tyres, a safe sealed air condition unit, five guys, remote weapon station with a manned 40mm grenade launcher, heavily armoured. It led the convoy as it trundled through the night along a rough, unmade road. The Iraqi border was 75 clicks to the east, 30 clicks north, Turkey. This bleak, blasted patch of desert was officially Syrian territory, and there was always the risk that the convoy would encounter Syrian government forces. Unofficially, emboldened by the American withdrawal and the backing of the Russians, the Turks were making frequent sorties across the border. The militants of Islamic State still infested the region. The Kurds, fierce fighters with good reason to fight, viewed this land as part of their tribal territory of Kurdistan and were still in situ, despite their supposed friends the Yanks fucking off and leaving them to the non-existent mercy of the Turks. The Russians had Spetsnaz special forces on the ground and some remaining Delta force were here try to untangle that little web of enmity and alliances, try to distinguish your friends from your enemies in this messed-up part of northeastern Syria. Danny Black didn't care to. He was happy to follow orders, and so were the rest of his troop. They were heavily armed and confident in their ability and firepower. They knew they could handle anything they came across. B Squadron, SAS, had been in country for a month now. At first, Danny had been glad of the distraction after the rigours of his previous op, a mission to hunt down a lone wolf killer called Ibrahim Khan that had not gone at all the way anyone had expected. Now Danny was throwing himself into B Squadron's current objective, regular sorties mounted from a base in Iraq over the border into Syria to take out known IS targets. It had been a blood-soaked month a month of night raids on isolated villages, of 9 millimeter rounds discharged ruthlessly into the skulls of IS scumbags. Danny had no problem with that. None of the guys did. Each IS militant they put in the ground made the world a better place. But it had also been a month of screaming wives and suddenly orphaned children. It would get to even the most cold-hearted regiment death squad eventually. Their latest orders, delivered to Danny that morning over the encrypted radio, felt like a momentary relief. Even Bullethead had said so. Implacable, relentless Bullethead, who had more kills to his name than anybody Danny knew. He was so called because of the pointed shape and shine of his bald head, which beaded with sweat in the heat whenever he wasn't wearing a helmet. He had the lowest voice Danny had ever heard. When he spoke... It was like the engine of a motorbike turning over. Change is as good as a rest, he'd growled, as Danny told them they had new instructions. There's a secure prison facility 300 clicks southwest, Danny said. Up until a couple of months ago, it housed IS prisoners and was guarded by Kurds. So, when we say prison facility, we mean torture facility, right? Bullethead said. Otherwise, the Kurds would have just killed the fuckers. 
I guess, said Danny. Anyway, the Kurds came under attack and had to abandon the site. The IS prisoners escaped. Chances are we've shot a few of them in the last few weeks. The facility's been deserted since the breakout, but a Kurdish unit have just returned. They've got some documentation that might help identify further targets. And reading between the lines, they're shitting themselves. They want an escort out of Syria in return for the intel. That's us. Operation Call Sign 022. Which was why, as the rest of B Squadron continued their dark work across the area, Danny now found himself sitting in the Bushmaster, the constant groan of the engine grinding in his ears. The vehicle had two places up front and two vertical rows of four seats in the back facing each other. It was cramped and hardly luxurious, but it was a hell of a sight better than the tin ovens that were the jackals. As the senior guy, Danny reckoned he'd earned his place here. When they grew closer to the target, however, he'd transfer to one of the jackals. If anything went wrong, he wanted to be in the best position to call the shots, not stuck inside this armoured beast. Bullethead sat opposite him, staring into the middle distance, his body moving with the vehicle. Next to him was Duggy, an acerbic Glaswegian with a shock of ginger hair. They were all in their early thirties, tough men in the prime of life and peak of fitness. They were dressed similarly, cry-precision camouflage gear with knee pads sewn into the trousers, armoured flaps to cover their groin area, currently clipped up, plate hangers with magazines for their personal weapons stashed round the front and side, personal radios at shoulder height with a stubby antenna pointing upwards and coax cables coiling round their bodies, boom mics and earpieces, Helmets cut away around the ears, with night vision goggles fitted to the top, ready to pull down when necessary. GPS units on their wrists. Their personal weapons, suppressed C8 rifles and Glock 17s, were sprayed in olive camouflage colours. Dougie had a black bandana over his mouth and nose. In other circumstances, it would be there to conceal his identity. Out here, it was a filter from the dust that stuck to everything. Lots of the guys wore them. Danny didn't bother. He'd operated in this part of the world so often that clean air was now a novelty to him. Dougie's head was resting against the wall of the Bushmaster and his eyes were closed. Other members of the troop were driving and manning the weapons stations. It was probably a good shout to get some shut-eye while you could. Danny couldn't. He wasn't wired like that. On the face of it, this was a straightforward op. It would be a stupid move for anybody to take on this heavily armed convoy, but it was in Danny's nature to repeat the operational details in his head over and over. The prison facility was a three-pronged building with a high perimeter fence. The vehicular entrance to the fence would be open, but the convoy would not cross the perimeter until the Kurds on site had given a prearranged sign that it was safe to approach. Three flashes from a torch, repeated at one-minute intervals. Once the troop had the all clear, one of the jackals would enter the facility grounds and pick up the Kurds. They were expecting three men. The jackal would take them back to the convoy. Then the troop would escort them through the night, back across the Iraqi border, to the safety of the British military base. It was up to the headshed what happened to them after that. Danny's earpiece burst into life, it was Ollie McAllister who was driving the Bushmaster. Danny could see the back of his head and that of Chinese Mike, who had that name because he preferred Asian women. He was sitting up front in the passenger seat. Beyond them, through the toughened windscreen of the armoured vehicle, a milky half-moon hung in the sky. From time to time, Danny could see the silhouetted outline of a distant mountain range. Other than that, nothing. They were driving without headlamps, so they couldn't be seen from a distance. Ollie had his night vision engaged. OK, lads, said Ollie over the radio. We're on the edge of government-held territory. We're going to head off road now. Follow my lead. ETA to target 90 minutes. Danny felt the Bushmaster swerve off-road. The terrain instantly became bumpier, and Dougie, who had appeared to doze through Ollie's radio transmission, opened his eyes. There was no sign of sleepiness, instant alertness. The guys in the back all began to raise their hands to their helmets to engage their NV. 
Immediately, the interior of the Bushmaster turned a hazy green colour, and small details appeared that had been invisible before. A first aid kit strapped to one of the doors, a holster on Dougie's lower leg containing a tiny snub-nosed pistol. Extracurricular, but that was OK. In the badlands of Syria, each man took whatever he felt he needed. It's my kid's birthday today, Dougie said in his deep Glaswegian accent. It was a surprising admission. Normally on ops, the guys kept personal stuff like that to themselves. Neither Danny nor Bullethead said anything. If Dougie wanted to open up, he'd do it of his own accord. The missus wants to give her a fucking iPhone. Eleven years of age, man, and we give her a fucking bat phone to every pedo on the net. Dougie had a particular obsession with pedophiles. If he ever found himself behind bars, and that wasn't unlikely for a guy of Dougie's temperament, the sex case criminals would be in for a rough time. She'll be fine, buddy, Danny said. It'll be Candy Crush and Ariana Grande all the way. Dougie made a non-committal grunt, and Danny found himself thinking about his own daughter, Rose, who he hardly ever saw. He'd met her mother, Clara, in Syria all those years ago, but Clara didn't like Rose having a killer for a father. Danny preferred not to dwell on it, so he was pleased when Ollie brought the Bushmaster to a halt, announced that they were thirty clicks from Target, and called for a changeover. Bullethead took the wheel while Danny climbed on top and manned the grenade launcher. It was good to be out of the vehicle and in the open, even though it was much hotter, and his eyes immediately started to sting from the dust kicked up by the convoy. They were back on a road now. The desert glowed green around him, rough scrub here and there, boulders dotted around, the occasional distant glint of an animal's eyes. But no people, no threats. The surrounding terrain was quiet and effectively empty. It somehow made Danny twice as alert. He scanned the area carefully up ahead, left and right. When he turned a full 360, he saw the three jackals following and his troopmates manning the double-mounted jimpies also searching for threats. Nothing. After 45 minutes, something appeared up ahead. A low building, probably three clicks distant, but visible because of the largely flat terrain. Danny was about to alert the others when Bullethead's voice came over the comms. Eyes on a target. Repeat. Eyes on a target. Go static. The convoy came to a halt. Danny continued to scan the surrounding area. There appeared to be no infrastructure in the vicinity of the prison. This rode in and the occasional drainage ditch on either side. Otherwise, this was a solitary facility and abandoned, as he expected. There were no vehicles nearby or any sign of life. He flicked a switch on his radio pack, changing to the satellite channel that would put him in touch with the ops base back in Iraq. Alpha, this is 022, over. A brief pause, then... 022, this is Alpha, go ahead, over. We're three clicks east of the target and we have eyes on. Have you heard from the Kurds? Over. Roger that. They made contact at 2200 hours and confirmed the approach procedures. You're clear to advance on target at will. Over. Understood. Out. Danny switched the radio back to the troops' personal comms frequency. We have the all clear from base. We'll advance to a click from target, then recce on foot. The convoy moved off, trundling slowly over the hard-baked desert earth. Ten minutes later... They came to a halt again. Danny and Dougie dismounted from the Bushmaster and silently jogged towards the target. They stopped 500 metres out. Danny noticed a deep drainage ditch heading off at right angles to the road. He wondered if this area was prone to flooding in the winter months. The prison complex was clearer now. It was a surprisingly modern building, low and sleek. The guys back at base had described it to Danny as a symmetrical three-pronged construction, each prong leading from a circular central space. They were approaching from the east, heading to the area between two of the prongs. Danny retrieved a telescopic night sight from his ops waistcoat as he and Dougie hit the ground to put in surveillance. He identified the perimeter fence, topped with rolls of razor wire, and three security towers evenly spaced about it. There was a gap in the fence where a gate had been opened and a small guardhouse next to it. 
The perimeter didn't look massively secure to Danny, but one glance at the surrounding terrain explained why that would be the case. Escape from here on foot, and in this unforgiving landscape, you'd likely be dead in a couple of days anyway. Any sign of the safe approach signal? Bullethead asked over comms. Not yet, Danny said. Hold your positions. He raised his night sight again and scanned the prison buildings. Still nothing. No vehicles. No personnel. No movement. What the fuck are they? Dougie said. Danny continued to watch. He was looking out for three flashes from a torch in quick succession. None came. A minute passed. Two. Nothing. Danny switched his radio frequency. Alpha, this is 022, over. Go ahead, 022, over. We're on target. There's no sign of the Kurds. No safe approach signal. Can you make contact with them? Over. Roger that. Wait out. Over. Two minutes passed. Then... 022, this is Alpha. We've lost contact with the Kurds. Looks like a comms outage. Over. Danny swore. Losing radio contact was an occupational hazard, but why was there no safe approach signal? Zero twenty-two, are you in a position to make an approach and recce the target? Danny narrowed his eyes. He didn't like it, but the only other option was a full retreat, and he didn't like that either. Roger that, he said. Wait out. He switched frequency to speak to the rest of the troops. The Kurds have lost contact with base, they want us to make a recce. Advance with care. Danny and Dougie stayed on the ground, keeping eyes on the target while the convoy approached. Once the three jackals and the bushmaster had caught them up, Danny and Dougie rejoined them. Place looks deserted, Dougie said. Maybe the cards got cold feet and fucked off. Yeah, Danny thought, maybe. This is the plan, he said. Jackal one, make an approach. Jackals two and three remain static to provide covering fire. The Bushmaster will hold back in a protective position. I'll take the top gun in Jackal two. Danny took his position at one of the jimpies on Jackal two. As Jackal one advanced towards the target, Jackals two and three positioned themselves on either side of the road that led towards the prison, which was 400 metres distant. The Bushmaster was 30 metres behind them. To Danny's right was another drainage ditch leading at right angles from the road. Danny and the other three Jimpy operators rotated their weapons towards the prison compound, ready to give covering fire if necessary. Jackal One trundled towards the prison at a slow, steady rate. In his peripheral vision, Danny was aware of Chinese Mike aiming the Bushmaster's grenade launcher towards one of the security towers. Danny raised his night sight again, looking for the three regular flashes of the torch. They didn't come. He switched his radio frequency to speak to the ops base. Alpha, this is 022. We have one vehicle approaching the target now. Over. A pause and a hiss. Roger that. Over. Jackal 1 was ten metres from the entrance. It stopped. Through his sight... Danny saw the top gunners making a precautionary sweep of the compound. A voice in his earpiece said, Clear. Jackal One sustained its slow advance towards the guardhouse. Danny continued to watch through his sight. It happened suddenly. One moment the jackal was advancing, the next there was an explosion so fierce that even from a distance it sent a shockwave through Danny's body. There was a brief flash bright enough to dazzle him. When his sight returned he saw smoke belching from the position the jackal had held. It was so thick that it completely obscured the vehicle. Danny screamed into his radio. Landmine! Contact! Contact! One vehicle down! Three guys! But it was already going noisy. Tracer fire shot through the air from positions inside the prison. It lit up the night, burning through and over the perimeter fence, at first landing only in the vicinity of the convoy vehicles and spitting up vicious explosions of desert dust. It took only seconds for the shooters to fine-tune their aim. Before any of the team could return fire, the tracer rounds, 40 and 50 Cal Danny estimated, slammed into the two remaining jackals and the Bushmaster. Each time a tracer round hit, there was a sickening metallic crunch and a multicoloured burst of ricochet-like fireworks. 
After a few seconds' delay, the air exploded with the thunder of the SAS team returning fire. The night split, with the cacophony of the four jimpies on jackals two and three pumping ordnance back towards the prison. Danny fired bursts of three to five rounds, the most effective and accurate way to operate a jimpy. The empty rounds spat out of the weapon, and the 762s flew through the thick plume of smoke billowing from the wrecked Jackal One. Grenades smashed through the perimeter fence and exploded in the vicinity of the prison. But sustained and relentless and brutal though the SAS's counterattack was, it seemed to have no effect. If anything, the incoming fire increased in intensity. More lines of tracer fire sliced towards them, slamming into the jackals and the bushmaster, which were rocking and smouldering with the impact. Two RPGs starburst in the air, showering the area with shrapnel. Two more exploded on the ground 15 metres behind the bushmaster. The incoming grew heavier and heavier, high-calibre rounds drilling into the armoured panels of the vehicles. Bullet head! Danny screamed through the comms at the driver of the Bushmaster. Advance! Advance! We need more covering fire! He could feel the heat coming off the barrel of his jimpy. As the Bushmaster moved forwards, Danny switched frequency. Immediately he heard a stressed voice at the other end of the radio. Zero twenty-two, what is your sit rep? We're under heavy fire. We need air support now! Even as he spoke, things got worse. Through his night vision, he saw a flare from inside the prison. In the two seconds that followed, he became aware of an anti-tank missile hurtling through the air directly at Jackal 3. The vehicle was to his three o'clock, no more than 20 metres away. Against a weapon like that, it didn't stand a chance. The missile slammed hard into the Jackal. The extremity of the explosion punched all the air from Danny's lungs. Jackal 3 was thrown onto its side like a toy. Flames engulfed it. Within the space of 90 seconds, whoever was lying in wait at the prison had demolished two jackals and six men, and things were only going to get worse. Danny fired more bursts from the jimpy. The barrel was glowing faintly and smoking. He was going to burn it out if he kept this rate of fire, but there was no chance of changing out the barrel. Fast air! Danny shouted into the comms. Fast air! He didn't hear the response, because right then... The Bushmaster hit an IED in the road that the rest of the convoy had miraculously missed. The gutting crack of the explosion cut through the noise of tracer rounds and jimpy fire. The front end of the Bushmaster crumpled horrifically and the whole vehicle tipped over onto its side with an ominous creak. And then its problems really started. Three anti-tank missiles slammed into the Bushmaster's undercarriage. The noise and devastation were immense. Metal ripped, smoke belched, fuel ignited. It was obvious at a glance that everyone inside the vehicle was fucked. Danny quickly switched his radio to personal comms. He wished he hadn't. All he could hear was inhuman screams from inside the Bushmaster. McAllister? Bullethead? He couldn't tell. Danny tried to concentrate on keeping the rounds from his jimpy raining down on the prison, but now he was aware of someone moving away from the Bushmaster. It had to be Chinese Mike, thrown from the remote weapon station. He was staggering towards Jackal 2, then he stumbled and fell, perhaps 15 metres away. Danny could hear him screaming. Danny's reaction was instinctive. He threw himself from the Jackal, hitting the ground with a heavy, deadened thump. Chinese Mike was in trouble. He needed help. Danny struggled to his feet, the air around him a riot of tracer fire and shrapnel. He sprinted towards Chinese Mike, who had managed to get to his knees. He was only five metres away when the rounds hit. If the effect of the tracer rounds on the armoured shells of the convoy vehicles was brutal, their effect on a human body was obscene. They cut through Chinese Mike's neck, abdomen and groin like he was made of warm butter. Blood and the hot mush of decimated internal organs and fragments of bone showered everywhere. Danny hit the ground, pressing himself hard onto the desert floor to avoid meeting the same grisly fate as his mate. He looked back towards Jackal too. It was ten metres from where he was lying and only had one jimpy operational since Danny had gone to Mike's rescue. He evaluated his options. Jackal 2 was the only remaining vehicle. He had to get back to it. No chance. Less than a second later, a missile hit the Jackal. The shockwave physically threw him several metres away from the vehicle and onto Chinese Mike's gruesome remains. There was a sudden wave of intense heat as the thermobaric warhead did its work. 
Danny thought he was on fire. He roared with pain, but somehow had the presence of mind to push himself back to his feet and sprint away from the conflagration. A secondary explosion from the Bushmaster threw him to the ground again. Danny was horribly aware of the stench of his scorched clothes and the constant barrage of tracer fire devouring the remains of the convoy. He was gasping, gulping for air. Still pressed into the ground, he fumbled for his radio and switched frequencies again. Thirteen men down, he shouted. Where's that fucking fast air? Incoming from northern Iraq, ETA five minutes. Danny swore and looked around. He saw four individual fires, the four vehicles still burning, spewing black smoke. Jackal 2 had fallen into the drainage ditch that led from the road. The air wavered with the heat haze, and the prison was barely visible beyond the glare, although he could make out gobbets of fire rising from the perimeter fence. The incoming had subsided. There was an ominous silence. It was only when he raised his night sight, which was still hanging by a lanyard round his neck, that he could discern the movement of personnel near the prison. Enemy advancing. Was it the Kurds? Had this been a catastrophic blue on blue? Or an elaborate trick? He didn't think so. Why would they have ditched the safe approach signal if they wanted to ambush the troop? Would they have access to that kind of firepower? No, this was someone else. Islamic State? Perhaps. They'd have gladly butchered the Kurds that had once guarded this facility and might have forced the intel of the SAS's imminent arrival out of them. But even that didn't quite ring true. Those anti-tank missiles were serious bits of kit, and the shock and awe tactics they'd used to get the better of an SAS troop smacked to Danny of special forces operators. SF operators who had, without question, been expecting them. He had no rifle. He'd left it in the jackal. His Glock 17 was holstered, but it was a poor replacement, useless for long-range firing. The terrain was flat and featureless. If he ran, the enemy would see him, no question. His only hope of finding cover, he realised, was in the drainage ditch where Jackal 2 had ended up. He crawled towards it, grimacing against the heat radiating from the burning jackal. His body hurt, and he moved slowly. It took twenty seconds to cover the ten metres to the ditch. He rolled down into it. It was a little cooler here, below the level of the burning jackal. He saw the circular opening of a culvert, an underground drainage pipe perhaps a metre in diameter. It would do as a hiding place. But as he prepared to climb in, a voice came over his earpiece. Zero twenty-two, this is Alpha patching you through to fast air. Go ahead, Danny said. His own voice surprised him, raw, dry and hoarse. A new voice. We're one minute from target. Repeat one minute from target. What is your location? Forget my location, Danny barked. Drop everything you've got on the prison. Blast area is going to be big. Are you in a position of safety? Thirteen men down and I'm next. Drop the fucking payload. Roger that. Out. He could hear the fast air approaching. Very quiet at first, very distant, but the noise of its engines increasing by the second. He scrambled a few feet into the culvert and screwed his body up into a ball, his arms protecting his face and covering the hard Kevlar of his helmet. His only hope was that the culvert, the Kevlar and the burning bulk of the jackal would protect him from the payload. It wasn't much of a hope, but it was something. The crescendo of the fast air became more intense. Danny screwed up his eyes as the deafening roar of the aircraft passed overhead and the vibration thrummed even here under the ground. And then the bombs hit. The noise was unreal. Five explosions so loud that they caused stabbing pains in Danny's ears. But the noise was not the worst thing. The overpressures so close to the blast site were like nothing he had ever experienced. His mouth, his head, his lungs, all felt as though they'd had the air sucked out of them. The ground shook and his body shook with it. There was a cracking sound and he knew that the concrete culvert was collapsing around him. He felt dust in his mouth and could hear outside his hiding place the brutal, relentless rain of shrapnel pelting the ground. There was another enormous metallic crash and crunch nearby and several afterblasts, each of them sending a vibrating shock through Danny's body. And then suddenly, silence. Danny gasped noisily his lungs suddenly working again, his mouth filled with grit and dust. He opened his eyes. Everything was spinning. It was dark, 
and he realized that the air was still so full of dust it was completely obscuring his vision. He crawled out of the culvert. As he moved, he heard the concrete collapse behind him. Out in the ditch, he coughed and retched as the thick, polluted air seemed to suck its way into his nose, mouth and ears. His right ear, where his earpiece was fitted, felt clogged. There was moistness on his left earlobe. He realised that his eardrums were bleeding. It took a minute for the dust to settle sufficiently that it was worth Danny re-engaging his NV goggles. Astonishingly, they were still working. He wreckied the surrounding area and immediately saw the source of the nearby metallic crash. The force of the blast had thrown the nearby jackal into the air and out of the ditch. It lay on its back, crunched and smouldering, ten metres away. Danny raised his goggles, fumbled with trembling fingers for his night sight, and looked back towards the prison. It barely existed. Two minutes ago, there had been a strong, secure edifice. Now it was rubble. Several individual fires glowed where the prison had once been, and the perimeter fence still standing in places was aflame. Danny knew how lucky he was to be alive. It was obvious to him that the airstrike must have taken out any other person in the immediate vicinity. Zero twenty-two, this is Alpha. Do you copy? Over. The voice in Danny's ear was muffled because of the blood. He removed the earpiece and tried to clear out the ear hole with a thick, dirty forefinger. When he replaced the earpiece, the guy back at base was repeating his communication. Zero twenty-two, this is Alpha. Do you copy? Over. There. Gone, Danny muttered. His voice was slurred, slow. He could barely understand himself. What is your status, over? Ev everyone's gone. Danny surveyed the bleak scene again. The guys were dead, all of them, ambushed by a force with superior firepower, who had known, Danny was certain of this, that they were coming. Thirteen good guys Thirteen friends. He felt a surge of anger boil through him. Zero twenty-two. Danny, activate your personal tracking device. Over. He stared into the distance for a full ten seconds before the instruction registered. His tracking device resembled a smartphone in a tough, rugged case. He fumbled for it, his attention still on the blazing bomb site. He swiped and tapped the screen to transmit his distress beacon back to base. Listen up, Danny. We need to get you out of there. Your nearest patrol is a day's drive away, so we're going to dispatch a chopper. That blast site's going to attract attention, so you need to get the hell away from it. Keep walking east. Don't stop walking. Get away from that place as quickly as possible. Do you copy? Danny didn't reply. He realised he was stumbling around aimlessly. Danny, do you copy? They were... Waiting for us, Danny muttered. You need to calm down, Danny. You need to listen carefully. Get away from the blast site. There could be... Danny switched off his radio and the voice died. The Bushmaster and the two remaining jackals were mere shells. He went through the motions of checking for survivors, but he knew it was useless. He couldn't even recognise the remains of his unit mates. Their skin were scorched away, their features melted. They stank of burned flesh and hair. Beyond the vehicles, closer to the remains of the prison, he encountered dismembered body parts among the chunks of rubble and pockmarked craters in the earth. He picked some of them up, a forearm, a lower leg. He felt he should do something with them, but he didn't know what, so he dropped them on the ground again. None of them helped him with his objective, to identify the fighters who had been lying in wait for them and who had killed Danny's team. And so he started stumbling groggily in the direction of the bomb site. He was 200 metres from ground zero when he found his first piece of evidence. To the untrained eye, it would look like nothing more than a hunk of twisted mangled metal. But when Danny pulled out his torch and examined it more closely, he knew immediately what it was, or at least what it had once been, a metal tripod with a thick cylindrical tube atop, still warm to the touch. 
This was one of the anti-tank missile launchers that had made such short work of the convoy. It was a Cornet EM, laser beam guidance system, range of 8 to 10 kilometres, and Russian. Danny spat the dust from his mouth. His mind was clearing. He pulled out his camera and photographed the Cornet. He staggered on. A minute later, he came across a body. It was almost as mangled as the missile launcher, its limbs pointing at strange angles from broken bones, patches of clothing burned away, and whatever skin remained on the face covered with a thick, sooty layer. Danny knelt down beside it. He took his water canteen from his ops vest and poured a little water on the dead man's face before scrubbing away the dirt and rinsing it again. There was no doubt about it. This was not the body of a Kurd or an IS fighter. This was white skin. He photographed the dead body, then got back to his feet and stared down at the corpse. A wave of overwhelming anger rose in his gut. He drew his pistol and aimed it at the body, discharged a full magazine into its torso, and then, when it was empty, threw the weapon at its face. And then he felt stupid. He'd lost control, and he had no spare magazines. Now he was without a usable weapon. He muttered to himself, the cornet, the white skin, they both pointed to a single fact. They'd been ambushed by Russians. How or why, he didn't know. He bitterly turned his back on the burning bomb site and retraced his steps away from the prison. He switched his radio back on. Almost immediately, the voice was barking down the line. Zero twenty-two, do you copy? Repeat, do you copy? Over. Yeah, I copy. Danny said as he staggered towards the smouldering vehicles that contained the remnants of his mates, finally heading east like he'd been told. Send that chopper in. Roger that, the voice said. Danny barely heard it. He had just seen something. A single light. A vehicle was approaching from a distance. A motorbike, perhaps. The headlamp bumped over the rough terrain. It was coming from the north and advancing quickly. Danny tried to judge the distance. It was tough to do at night and with his head dazed. A mile? Maybe a little more. Who the hell was it? One of the Kurds late to the party? No, the Kurds were dead. He'd put money on it. More likely, this was part of the hostile force. One of the guys, or maybe two, who had been coordinating the ambush from a distance and were now approaching to see what the hell had happened and if any of their men were still alive. Fuck, Danny muttered to himself. He faced east and started to run. He didn't get far. His ears were still bleeding and his balance was all over the place. He tripped and fell and the world started to spin. He was half aware of the bumping headlamp. It etched neon lines across his vision as he tried to stand up. He only managed to get as far as a kneeling position when he had to bend over to vomit. He felt an urgency to get away from there, but his body wouldn't do what his mind demanded. He stayed there, hunched in a ball next to his own puke, resisting nausea and mustering strength. Then he managed to straighten up again. The bumping headlamp wasn't bumping anymore. It had stopped. It was twenty metres away, and it dazzled him as he squinted at it. A distended silhouette appeared in front of the headlamp. It approached slowly, preceded by its long shadow. Danny staggered to his feet, cursing himself for wasting his ammunition. The incoming danger forced his mind to achieve more clarity. Whoever this was, he wasn't shooting. Did that mean he was friendly? No. It meant he'd calculated that Danny was unarmed since Danny hadn't drawn a weapon either. He was ten metres away when Danny was able to get a proper look at him. He was huge. Danny was a big man. This guy was bigger a head height taller, and another foot around the shoulders. He wore standard military camo gear, but the sleeves of his jacket had been torn off to reveal thick, muscular arms, grimy with sweat. They were the arms of a bodybuilder with perhaps a few steroids thrown in for good measure. His head was shaved, with the exception of a thick black mohawk down the centre of his scalp, buzz cut to a height of a centimetre. The skin on one side of his head was horrifically marked with an embossed network of red scars. He had a weapon in his belt, but he didn't draw it. Obviously his hands were weapons enough. He was clenching and releasing them, like he was loosening them up, ready for action. He stopped five metres from Danny, who staggered to his feet. 
The man looked him up and down. Then he grinned. It was the kind of grin that had a very particular meaning. I'm going to rip you apart with my bare hands, motherfucker. Fuck, Danny repeated under his breath. The guy took a step forwards. Danny took a step back. He noticed something else. The guy had two patches sewn onto the chest of his jacket. They were SAS squadron patches. The A squadron patch portrayed an animal that looked like a cross between a tick and a scorpion. The D squadron patch was an Indonesian Chris sword. They looked like trophies. Danny evaluated his options. He couldn't run. The guy had a handgun and a vehicle. He couldn't shoot. He had only one path open to him. This guy looked like he was spoiling for a fight. Danny had no choice but to give him one when it was all he could do to stay upright. Fuck, he said for a third time. If this guy hit him, Danny would be on the floor in an instant, no question, and there was a good chance he'd never get back up. The guy stepped forwards again. His fists were permanently clenched now, and the grin had morphed into a strained scowl. The guy lunged towards him, raising one fist to deliver a hammer blow to Danny's head. Danny sidestepped. The guy overshot, and Danny managed to raise his right heel and kick him hard in the kidney. If he'd done that to anyone else, they'd have been flawed, groaning in pain, and possibly unconscious. This guy barely seemed to notice it. Danny felt like a wasp stinging an elephant, a minor inconvenience at worst. He glanced over at the motorbike. He could hear the engine turning over. Perhaps he could get to it. Not at the moment. The Mohawk guy would just pull his weapon and shoot Danny in the back. Danny would have to play this out a little longer. The guy turned and bore down on him again. This time he was ready for Danny's sidestep. His fist clipped Danny's right shoulder. It was enough to send him staggering back. His arm went numb. The Mohawk guy pressed his advantage. When he charged again, Danny was too dizzy from the last hit to get out of his way, and he landed his first proper hit. It was a solid punch to the solar plexus, and it delivered all the raw power that the guy's physique promised. Danny's legs collapsed beneath him, and the air shot from his lungs. The pain was excruciating. He wondered if he'd cracked a rib or even his sternum. His respiratory system didn't seem to work, and he felt a moment of panic as he tried to inhale, but couldn't. The next blow came to the side of Danny's face. It came from the thick sole of the Mohawk guy's boot, and it nearly took Danny's head off. He felt blood spurt from his nose as he hit the dirt, and it was flowing more freely from his left ear again. He choked and coughed and tried to grab some loose earth in the hope that he could throw it at his assailant to blind him. But the ground was baked. His fingernails only scraped the hard earth, and one of them tore. Then the Mohawk guy was standing above him, huge and threatening. Danny looked up at him through a film of sweat. He noted that the guy hadn't yet pulled his weapon. He obviously wanted to finish Danny off manually, but he wanted to gloat first. Say a scum, he said. He spoke English, but his accent was definitely Russian. He tapped the two patches on his jacket. I killed two of your comrades with my bare hands. You will be an easy third. He laughed as if he'd just told a great joke. Then he took a couple of steps back, like a rugby player preparing to take a kick, and Danny's head was the ball. His mistake was not finishing Danny off the moment he was on the ground. In a weird way, Danny was disappointed in him. This guy and his men had just ambushed and massacred an SAS team. They were pros. They knew what they were about. And the first rule of hand-to-hand -hand combat? Fight to win. Finish your opponent quickly and by whatever means possible. No second chances. Danny had a second chance. The Russian took his run-up. Before he could take his kick, Danny rolled fast towards him and into the foot that remained on the ground. The guy tripped and fell, and now he was on the ground face up, and Danny was on his feet. Danny stamped his heel into the Russian's face, and he roared in pain as his nose broke, and blood spread and spattered over the scarring on the side of his scalp. He was fumbling for his weapon now, and Danny had a split-second call to make. Observe the first rule. Grab his gun and finish him. He couldn't. His arm was still numb. He wasn't sure he could operate the handgun effectively, and in any case, the Russian had gripped it now. So he ran like hell towards the motorbike. It was twenty metres away. He moved in a zigzag out of the beam of the headlamp, so he was hard to see and harder to hit. He figured that big as his opponent was, a boot in the face and a broken nose will at least have stunned the Russian and give Danny time to reach the vehicle. 
He figured right. Danny threw himself onto the bike, just as he heard the retort of a handgun behind him. There was no sound of the bullet impacting. Danny forced the bike into a tight turning circle. The tyres protested against the desert floor as he moved the vehicle and accelerated hard. The gap between him and the Mohawk guy began to widen. Thirty metres, then forty. Danny braked and skidded. The headlamp lit up the terrain in front of him. He could taste the fight in his mouth, a taste of blood and dust and pain. Around him, he was aware of the burning fires of the jackals and the bushmaster and the bomb site, and he felt again the bitterness of losing his unit mates. He turned the bike to face his enemy and revved the engine fully intent on accelerating towards his assailant and hitting him with the full momentum of a heavy vehicle at speed. The Russian was now on his feet again. He had his weapon raised and pointing at Danny. There was no chance of him landing a shot on target at that range. Their eyes locked. The guy had blood streaming down his face. Danny knew he himself probably looked twice as bad. He let the guy's features imprint themselves on his mind. The buzz-cut mohawk. The horrific scarring on the scalp. The SAS flashes on his jacket. One day, he muttered to himself. One fucking day. It was almost as if the Russian could hear him. He grinned, inclined his head, and then he spat on the ground. But he didn't lower his weapon. Danny turned the bike and accelerated again, heading east. He only glanced in the side mirror once to see the burning remains of the Zero 22 op and the fading silhouette of the man who had just tried to kill him and failed. Chapter 2 Devon, one week later Half past three, going home time. The rain was incessant. The kids were spilling out of the playground, anonymous in their raincoats, with the hoods crimped tight around their faces. They shook their teacher's hand before being allowed off the premises to meet their parents. The mums and one or two dads congregated around the gates, a phalanx of umbrellas protecting them from the unusually heavy rain. When they each saw their child, they bustled them under their umbrella and hurried them to the car. One of the kids was called Danny White, he didn't have many friends. In fact, he didn't have any friends. He'd arrived halfway through the school year. Friendship groups were established, and try though he might, he hadn't been able to break into any of them. So he was alone as he shook soggy hands with the teacher. "'Where's your mum, Danny?' she asked. He pointed to the yellow umbrella that he recognised, set slightly apart from the crowd. "'All right, then. Good afternoon. Have a nice weekend.' Danny didn't think he would have a nice weekend. His weekend would be like all the others, solitary. Since moving down here with his mum, she had been different. She was kind enough, all right, and she looked after him, made sure he had enough to eat and his clothes were clean, and he got to school on time every morning. But she was distracted. She kept the curtains closed during the day, but often slightly parted them to look outside, as if checking for something or someone. When Danny asked if they could go to the park, she always found a reason to say, "'Another time, sweetie.' She only went out to do the school run and make the occasional trip to the supermarket, and even then she always wanted to get back as quickly as possible. His mum was standing next to the lamppost as usual, Danny's shoes were wet through as he approached her. He was looking down at them, thinking about how much darker they looked when they were wet, so it wasn't until he was under the umbrella that he realised that the person holding it wasn't his mum. It was a man. Danny was embarrassed and was about to turn away when the man took his shoulder. He had a cheery, friendly face. Danny? he asked. Danny nodded. The man wore brown leather shoes, smart new jeans that were wet from the knee down, and a black leather jacket. He offered him a moam chew. Your mum said these were your favourite, he said. They were Danny's favourite. He took the moam and started to peel the wrapper, but then decided he might keep it for later and put it in his pocket. Where's my mummy? he said. Her car broke down, said the man. She asked me to come and get you. Shall we go? Danny frowned. He knew about stranger danger. "'What's your name?' he said. "'Sorry, I'm Andy. You've probably seen me around.' Danny shook his head. "'Well, I live next door. Come on, let's get you home.' Danny hesitated. 
The man had very broad shoulders, and he'd just noticed a scar on the right-hand side of his nose. Why didn't my mummy come with you? he said. Her car broke down on the way. I'll have to tell my teacher. Don't worry about that, said the man. We'll get soaked if we don't get back to my car. He pulled a mobile phone from his pocket. We'll call you, Mum, shall we? OK, said Danny. I'm parked just down here. Want to hold the umbrella? He handed it to Danny, who had to walk on tiptoes and hold it aloft in order to cover them both. The man offered Danny his free hand. I thought you were going to call my mummy. I've got her number in here somewhere, the man said, swiping the screen. He took Danny's hand in his and started to walk away from the school. There was a firmness to his grip, and Danny found he had to walk quickly to keep up. The man showed him the phone, as if to indicate that he'd located his mum's number, then put it to his ear. They turned a corner at the end of the street into a tree-lined avenue with cars parked on both sides. She's not answering said the man. We'll try her again in a minute. Danny stopped. Where did you get her umbrella from? He said. She lent it to me. Didn't want you getting wet. You know what mums are like, eh? She keeps it in the car, Danny said. He might only be six, but he wasn't stupid. He could tell the man was lying. He tried to release himself from his grip, but he couldn't. The big hand enveloped his, and the man was too strong. Danny wriggled. Let go of me, he said, and then he shouted it. Let go of me! The noise of the rain against the umbrella was loud, and the nearest person was on the other side of the street. He knew nobody had heard him. The man didn't reply. He put his phone back in his pocket and gripped Danny's hand a little harder. Danny tried to stop walking to drag his heels. It made no difference to the man who walked faster, pulling Danny along the pavement. Danny tried to hit him with the umbrella, but the man simply grabbed the umbrella back. Danny started to cry. He wanted to scream, but suddenly found he was too scared to do it. It was like someone had punched him in the stomach. He could barely catch his breath through the sobs. He looked back over his shoulder, hoping somebody might see them. But nobody did. There were very few people in the street. Those that were had their heads down and their umbrellas up. Danny was invisible to them. Up ahead, there was a white van. The rear windows were blacked out. As they approached it, in the side mirror, Danny saw the reflection of somebody watching in the passenger seat. The door opened and the person stepped out. He looked similar to Andy, the same broad shoulders, the same thick neck. But he wasn't smiling. He closed the passenger door and banged against the side of the white van with a clenched fist. The rear doors opened, by which time the new guy had grabbed Danny's other arm. Danny wriggled and writhed even more strenuously. He even managed to shout out, despite his breathlessness. But he was completely overpowered by the two men. They lifted him from the pavement, while Danny's kicks simply bounced off their shins. They manoeuvred him over a puddle of water that had collected by the curb and towards the back of the van. Through his tears, Danny saw two more men in the vehicle, but it was gloomy in there, so he couldn't fully make out their features. All he heard was a gruff voice saying, Get him in! Danny knew he only had one last chance. He screamed as loudly as he could, then raised his legs and struck Andy with all the force he could muster. He obviously hurt him, because Andy said, Little shit! One of the guys in the van said, Just throw him in! The two men hurled him into the van, roughly. He caught his foot on a lip in the doorway. It caused his body to twist, and he hit his head hard, once on the side of the van and a second time on the floor. And that was the last Danny knew of his abduction. Fuck sake, said Kit Kat. They called him that because he only had four fingers on his right hand, like the chocolate bar. His thumb was missing in action, last seen spinning through the air when his SBS team were providing a training package to a group of rebels in the DRC. He'd been demonstrating how to use a Russian landmine as a booby trap when it went off prematurely, earning him not only a nickname, but also the loss of sight in one eye and a career henceforth limited to carrying out the SBS's donkey work. Work like this, abducting a six-year-old kid. Nobody joined the SBS to abduct six-year-old kids. Fuck's sake, Kit Kat repeated. What were they playing at? There was nothing to the boy. Why did they have to throw him in so hard? 
Kit Kat winced when he saw the kid's head hit the side of the van. His neck had jarred to the right, and there might even have been a crack. He wasn't sure. He lurched forward to catch him, but too late. The boy had gone limp, and his head slammed hard against the floor. The kid lay there, still as a corpse. One of his feet was still poking through the door opening. "'Get him in!' said the guy outside. Kit Kat grabbed the kid's shoulders and pulled him further into the van as the doors slammed shut and they were plunged into darkness. Rain hammered on the roof and the engine turned over. By the time Kit Kat had pulled his maglite torch from his pocket, the van had pulled away. He shone the torch at the kid and rolled him over onto his back. Every Special Forces operator is well trained in field medicine. The training kicks in when it's needed, automatic, instinctive. Kit Kat reached out with his good hand and placed his index and middle fingers against the kid's neck. He knew he wouldn't find a pulse. When you'd seen as many corpses as he had, you learned to recognise the signs, the rictus of the mouth, the heavy stillness of the body. Kit Kat went through the motions, blowing rescue breaths into the kid's mouth, performing chest compressions, but he knew it was hopeless. The kid was dead. "'roughed up by a four-man SBS unit "'whose instructions had been to abduct him and keep him safe. "'Fuck's sake!' he said for a third time as he gave up on the CPR. "'He turned to his mate, who was watching from the corner of the van. "'He's a fucking goner!' he spat. "'And we're toast!' "'He slammed a fist against the inside of the van in frustration. "'The van accelerated.' Kit Kat switched off the torch. He didn't want to look at the boy's pale face any more than was necessary. Chapter 3 Back in the day, when Danny Black had first joined the regiment, an old-timer told him that there were two kinds of SAS men, the ones whose minds gave up before their bodies and the ones whose bodies gave up before their minds. Danny was beginning to think he was the latter. That wasn't to say he slept easy. How could anyone do that when they'd seen the things he had? The Zero 22 debacle was a week old, and it stuck with him. The image of Bullet Head's burned face kept returning. He'd visited Dougie's missus. He'd put on a clean shirt and even shaved. His face had felt naked after months of wearing a beard on Ops. There'd been no sign of Dougie's daughter, but Danny couldn't help noticing the precious new iPhone that had so worried her dad. It was sitting on the kitchen table in a Hello Kitty case. But there was no doubting that his body was sore and tired, much more so than it would have been during his early days in the regiment. His shoulder still ached where the Russian had hit him. The bruising on his face had only just started to fade, and his ears were still clogged. Back at base, they'd offered him a little R&R, &R, but he'd turned it down. He preferred to keep his fitness sharp, his strength and endurance at their peak. It wasn't his style to put his feet up. Even so, he was surprised to get the call. He'd clocked into base early, ready for a morning on the range. One of the clerks who manned the Kremlin, the inner sanctum of RAF Credenhill, where the CO and all the other Ruperts had their offices, approached him outside the B Squadron hangar and told him his presence was required in briefing room C at 0930 hours. He made his way there alone, ignoring the looks from the administrative staff that followed him as he went. Word of the 022 op had spread. Of course it had. The loss of thirteen men on a single mission was a wound the regiment would carry for a long time. Danny knew that those inquisitive glances masked many different questions. Was Danny Black the hero of the hour for making it out alive, or was he in some way responsible for the death of the guys in his troop? Could he have done more to save them, had he just saved his own skin? Danny ignored those glances. They weren't posing any questions he hadn't asked himself. He was comfortable that he'd done all he could. Like he'd said in his debrief, they'd been ambushed by a heavily armed force that hit them hard and fast. He'd reported his suspicion that the enemy had been Russian. Maybe the Kurds had set them up. Who knows what impenetrable alliances existed in that part of the world. Bottom line, 022 
had been played by someone. He knocked on the door of briefing room C. A suit with a funereal expression opened it, looked Danny up and down, then opened the door wider and indicated that he should enter. Danny stepped in. Aside from the suit, who had opened the door, there were three other men in there. His CO, Mike Williamson, sat at a round table dressed in military camo. He had a handsome, leathery face and a pale scar on his chin. Danny liked him. To his left was George Atwood, Director, Special Forces, grey, bushy hair, sparkling blue eyes. He had his hand over his mouth, and Danny saw the old bullet wound that had scarred the space between his thumb and forefinger. Danny liked him, too. To the CO's right was a gaunt, skinny man with yellowing eyes and thinning black hair, an immaculate suit and a neat tie in an Oxford knot. His fingertips were pressed together, and he watched Danny from over them. This was Alan Sturrock, chief of MI6. When a patronising politician had suggested that the victims of Grenfell Tower had lacked common sense, Danny had shared the public's distaste. At the same time, he had thought of Sturrock. That was the sort of thing he would say. Danny loathed him. Danny felt a sense of déjà vu. Barely six months earlier, these three men had briefed Danny in the matter of Ibrahim Khan. It had led to an op with an MI6 agent called Bethany White, who had turned out not to be quite who she seemed. On the outside, an MI6 agent and single mother. On the inside, a killer of SAS men. Had Bethany White not been in possession of intelligence that could have deeply harmed MI6 and Alan Sturrock in particular, Danny would no doubt have received the order to kill her. But she had, and he hadn't. Danny would have preferred never to lay eyes on Sturrock again. Now here he was, giving him a smarmy smile as he opened a small bottle of lotion and started to moisturise his hands. My dear chap! said Sturrock. You're looking very well, all things considered. Danny ignored him and addressed the CO. You wanted to see me, boss. Sit down, Danny. I prefer to stand. Sit the fuck down, will you? Danny inclined his head and took a seat opposite the three men. Sturrock nodded to the suit at the door. He left the room. There was a moment of silence. Then George Atwood spoke. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Black. Questions are being asked about the Zero Twenty Two clusterfuck. Plenty of bleeding heart liberals in Whitehall think Hereford is a drain on the public purse. They'd love to use this as a reason to shut us down. Tell them I'm sorry my unit mates chose to die for their country before they'd earned out, Danny said. I'd love to, Black. Believe you me, I'd love to. He glanced at the CO and Sturrock before continuing. Zero twenty-two was compromised. Somebody knew you were coming. They were expecting you. Tell me something I don't know, Danny replied. I'm about to. That photograph of the enemy combatant that you took, we've had some people look at it. We think we have a positive ID. Russian, Danny said. Atwood nodded. Leonid Bogatov, former Spetsnaz, retired in 2013 to join the Wagner Group. Uh, you're aware of the Wagner Group? Sturrock asked. Yeah, Danny was aware of the Wagner Group. It was a private military company, several thousand men strong, run and in part manned by former Special Forces agents. Except, of course, like most PMCs, it wasn't really private. The Wagner Group was in practice an extension of the Russian administration called in to bolster their armed forces and to perform deniable operations. It existed to carry out the whims of the Russian president and to cover the trail leading back to him. Danny nodded. We have a high degree of certainty that it was the Wagner Group who hit you, Atwood said. Why? Two reasons. I'd have thought the first was obvious, Sturrock cut in. You were extracting high-level Kurdish personnel. The Syrian regime wanted them dead and for us to lose our taste for defending them. The Russians are Syria's de facto protectors. He gave Danny a thin smile. Are you keeping up? Danny was more than keeping up. His mind was racing ahead. 
How could the Wagner group possibly have known the details of Zero 22's arrival? It was a secret SAS operation. Atwood and the CO were watching him carefully. It was almost as if they could see his line of reasoning as it unfolded. What's the second reason? Danny said. Sturrock held up a photograph. Danny caught his breath. The photograph showed a huge man standing in front of a sand-coloured jeep with a desert background. He wore a camouflage jacket with the sleeves cut off. He had a black mohawk and prominent grotesque scarring on one side of his shaved head, almost as if his veins and capillaries were on the outside of his skin. He was holding up the heads of two men by their hair. Their necks were cleanly severed, and the skin was not yet waxy, which told Danny that they were freshly executed. He recognised the man, of course. It was the guy he had fought in Syria. He recognised the victims, too. They were young SAS men, Hal Robbins and Tommy Evans, who had been reported KIA some months ago. "'Friend of yours?' Storrock asked. "'That's him,' Danny said. He had described the man in his debrief. "'His name is Alexander Tugenev. "'He's a self-appointed colonel in the Wagner Group. "'He has quite a CV. "'Putting to one side the fact that he was responsible "'for the deaths of two SAS men... Fifteen SAS men,' Danny interrupted him. "'If you add the Zero Twenty Two guys, "'and if it's all the same to you, "'I don't think I will put that to one side.' Sturrock continued as if Danny hadn't spoken. He was a Spetsnaz operator for seven years, very highly prized, despite having a criminal record as long as your arm. The unofficial record suggests he has a history of the extrajudicial killing of gay men in Chechnya. He was discharged from Spetsnaz for gun running. They didn't have a choice about that, but the Wagner group welcomed him with open arms. Our working theory is that he was coordinating the Zero Twenty Two ambush. If he's the guy you saw, Atwood said, it's the smoking gun that puts the Wagner group in the right place at the right time. He's the guy, Danny said. No question. He stared at the picture and remembered the devastation of the op and the fight that followed and the two SAS patches on Turgenev's jacket and his taunt. S.A.S. scum, I killed two of your comrades with my hands. You will be an easy third. When do I get to waste him? Danny said. He was trying hard to keep his voice level. You don't, Storrick said. Tugenev is very far from being our principal target. Danny remained stony-faced. Speak for yourself, he said. How did the Wagner group know we were coming? Does the name General Frank O'Brien mean anything to you? Atwood said. Rings a bell, Danny said. He's American, five-star general, popular with the men, thorn in the side of the guy in the Oval Office. Atwood glanced at the other two men in the room. Danny could tell he was about to deliver some sensitive information. It's obvious that the Russians received information about your movements from someone with inside knowledge. The CIA believe that person is O'Brien. Danny did not think he could dislike Sturrock any more, but at that moment the spook proved him wrong. A self-satisfied smirk crossed Sturrock's face. Danny wanted to grab him by the throat, pin him to the wall, and ask him exactly why he found the death of 13 regiment men so amusing. He restrained himself. He just said, Something funny. You wouldn't understand, said Sturrock. The three men stared at him. Very well, he said. For the Americans to have a Russian mole at that level is a matter of extreme embarrassment to them. You wouldn't understand if you didn't work in the service. Back in the 50s, Kim Philby was our principal liaison with the Americans. He was exposed as a Russian spy. I'm not exaggerating when I say that the CIA have been holding that episode over our heads for the past 70 years. They should get a life. Administrations have long memories, Black. MI6 has an ill-deserved reputation for being leaky. But a five-star general passing operational information to the Russians, that's bigger than Philby. For all we know, 
O'Brien's been sharing classified information for the past two decades. Our transatlantic cousins are eating some humble pie just at the moment. How do you know it's him? Danny said. It's him? Sturrock replied, as if that ended the matter. The Yanks have shared their intel with us, Atwood said. Look, if they hadn't withdrawn from Syria, it would have been them picking those Kurds up from the prison. Truth is, we were extracting those guys at the Americans' request, so there were elements in the American military who knew what you were doing that night. O'Brien was one of them. Atwood picked up a tablet from the table in front of him. Three nights before the Zero Twenty Two operation, O'Brien was in Crete on holiday. He was staying in a hotel outside Chania. Turns out there was another guest there by the name of Dmitri Polyakov. Polyakov is a known FSB agent. Atwood held up the tablet and showed Danny a picture. It looked like a still from a CCTV camera and showed two men sitting at a bar. One of them was well-built with a straw trilby hat and a tropical shirt. He had a flamboyant cocktail in front of him. The other was much skinnier with short dark hair and a sober sleeveless shirt. He wore dark glasses and his lips were pursed. In front of him was a small coffee cup. O'Brien and Polyakov having a cosy little chinwag. And let's be clear, said Sturrock, they weren't discussing the temperature of the pool. We know what they were discussing, said Danny in a tone of disbelief. Atwood looked at him. Well, it's a fairly busy bar, lots of smart phones around. You don't need me to tell you that the CIA have ways of remotely accessing data on these devices. Video snippets intended for social media, voice assistant recordings. They managed to piece together bits of their conversation. It's not the whole thing, not by any means, just a patchwork, really. But it's enough. They supplied us with the recording. This is the transcript. He handed Danny a piece of paper stamped top secret. O'Brien, we shouldn't be seen together blow everything apart. Polyakov, I need to know that you mean what you say. O'Brien, you don't need to worry about that. O'Brien, 14 men, nighttime raid, 022. Polyakov, this is the biggest operation we've worked on. We need to be careful we don't make a mistake. O'Brien, I need to be careful nobody points the finger at me. Danny let the paper drop to the table. He felt sick. You have this on tape, he said. They nodded. Where's the general now? Danny asked quietly. The three men shared another glance. We'll come to that, Danny, said the CO. You want some water or something? Danny shook his head. Water was the last thing he wanted. Sturrock cleared his throat. Clearly? He announced, something needs to be done about O'Brien. Something involving a nine millimeter round in his skull, Danny said. Delta will deal with it like that. He clicked his fingers. Sturrock gave another bland smile. There are good reasons for keeping Delta Force well clear of this, he said. Like I said, General O'Brien is popular with the men particularly with the special forces, fights their corner when the liberals start making noises about war crimes. Sending in an American SF force to deal with him would be high risk. They'd do what they have to do, Danny said. Forgive me, Black, but you yourself are walking proof that special forces operators are not entirely averse to going off piste. He raised a sarcastic eyebrow. The Yanks have passed it over to us, Atwood said. They're dressing it up as a favour, giving us the chance to hit back at the guy responsible for our boy's deaths. It's bullshit, of course. O'Brien's a big problem for them, but they want to keep the solution at arm's length. Ordinarily, we'd leave them to clean up their own mess, but the PM's been informed of the situation, and he doesn't see it that way. Politically, it suits him to do the Yanks a favour, Brexit and all that. When a big US-UK trade deal's on offer, it helps grease the wheels if we can remind them how we helped out with their little problem. We don't need to worry about the politics, said the CO. 
Frank O'Brien as good as killed 13 of our guys, Danny. Nobody gets away with doing that. You want me to nail him? Danny asked. There was a moment of silence. We want you to help someone do it, the CEO said. I think I've got the skill set. Atwood gave a bleak smile. No doubt, he said. So why don't I just do it? The thought of avenging his mates was a comforting one. That's one possible plan, said Atwood, but there are several reasons why it might need a little, um, tweaking. Like what? O'Brien's not easy to get to. Danny pointed at the transcript on the table. Polyakov managed it. Of course, but that meeting would have been set up by the general himself. In the normal course of events, he has a ring of steel around him, bodyguards wherever he goes, special forces mostly, and especially in the next few days. He's attending a summit in Jordan, laying down the basis for a peace deal between the Turks and the Kurds. O'Brien's the main event. Like we told you, he's a popular fellow, very Charming, very diplomatic. He's well liked by certain elements high up in the Turkish administration, and the Kurds trust him. If he's there, the warring parties will at least come to the table. You want to take him out in the middle of a peace conference? Of course not. We want to take him out before the conference even starts. We know he'll be staying in the Hotel Grand in Amman for two days before the conference begins, prepping for the talks. What about the peace deal? Danny said. You take him out before it happens. The Turks are going to carry on butchering the Kurds. It's a good job, said Sturrock, that men like you are set to fighting rather than thinking. The man's a Russian agent, for heaven's sake. Isn't it obvious that he'll simply do what he can to destabilize the peace talks? The Russians are quite happy for the Kurds to be wiped out. There'll be no peace agreement while O'Brien's involved. He's right, said Atwood. We can kill two birds with one stone here. He narrowed his eyes. Actually, perhaps we can kill three. What are you talking about? said Danny. O'Brien will be well guarded in the hotel, but he has a weak spot. It's about six inches long and hangs between his legs. It's a common enough flaw in these people. We all remember Petraeus, Sturrock muttered. O'Brien's cut from the same cloth. Can't keep his dick in his pants. He's got a reputation for picking up girls in hotel bars when he's abroad, even on work tours. Everyone hushes it up because he's so respected. Of course, it's going to be hard for you to get close to him because you don't have blonde hair and big tits. But if you hook up with somebody who does, all of a sudden we have a strategy. Except you need a blonde with big tits who you can trust to kill him. Another silence. Another long glance between the three men. We believe we have someone who fits the bill, said Sturrock. Danny had never heard him sound more weaselly. Sturrock moisturised his hands again. There was an unpleasant slippery sound as he did it. Show him, he said. The CO handed a sheaf of photographs over the table. They were scene of crime pictures, and they were grotesque. One showed a corpse bound to a pole with a cable tie round his neck, his ears missing, blood streaking down the sides of his face. Another showed a dead man on a bed in the position of a crucifix, fingers removed and lying on his chest, blood blooming into the bedclothes from his butchered hands. A third picture, the worst, showed a male body with a cut throat and the genitals removed. Danny had seen these pictures before. He put them down on the table. You've got to be fucking kidding me, he said. He knew that these killings were the handiwork of the former MI6 agent Bethany White. The victims were ex-SAS, and Bethany had taken them out in a bloody spree of anger and revenge. She would have killed Danny if she'd had the chance. It was only because her kid had begged her not to that Danny was still alive. You're insane. She'll never do it. She's got you over a fucking barrel. This was true. Bethany White had hard documentary evidence of British war crimes. Copies were secretly stashed with various lawyers around the world. 
She'd made it very clear that if anything ever happened to her or her son, the lawyers would release the evidence to the world. It may be true, Storrock said, a hint of self-satisfaction in his voice, that at one time Bethany White had some leverage. That time has passed. She made it particularly hard to track down the lawyers she'd engaged, but we managed it. The guardians of her precious so-called evidence have been dealt with. The phrase dealt with had a note of finality about it. Danny didn't probe any further. There's still no reason why she should do what you ask her, he said. She fucking hates you. She hates all of us. Plus, she's a psycho. I can't disagree with you there, Starrick said. But you're quite wrong in other respects. Bethany White will do as she's told. We've arranged some leverage of our own. Yesterday afternoon, Atwood said, an SBS team abducted her son. I believe he's also called Danny. Yeah. Danny said, he is. And though he would never have admitted, nor even let it show in his face, he felt a moment of queasiness. No matter what Bethany White's faults, and they were many, her boy was a good kid. Dragging him into the mess, Danny didn't like it. The boy's being held in a secure location, Storrock continued. He's safe, he's well looked after, rather better looked after than he was with his mother, I should think. Does Bethany know? He nodded grimly. Her reaction was extreme. I bet it was, Danny muttered. There was an awkward silence. Then Danny shook his head. This doesn't add up, he said. There are other ways to deal with O'Brien. Why does it have to be Bethany White? Starrock looked at the two military men. It looked like he didn't want to articulate whatever was coming next. It was Atwood who took over. Let's be plain, he said. We're green-lighting a British op to take out an American five-star general. The fallout is potentially catastrophic. It's all very well doing the Yanks a favour, but who's to say they won't use our complicity against us at some time in the future? If that happens, it either compromises the assassin or it gives them a great deal of leverage over us. It's much better if once the job is complete, the assassin is taken out of the picture. And suddenly it all became clear to Danny. You want me to kill Bethany White when she's done it. You want to use her because she's ruthless and expendable. More than expendable, Starrick said. She's a rogue MI6 agent and she has intel that cannot enter the public domain. He pressed his fingers together once more. Like I said, three birds with one stone. Again, silence. It was Danny who broke it. What about the kid? He said. He will be well looked after, Starrock said. We have the budget for it. He'll be rehomed in a more stable environment. To be perfectly honest with you, the outcome will be much better for him. Once he's got over the initial distress of losing his mother, of course. You reckon? He couldn't help thinking of his own daughter, Rose, the daughter he seldom saw. Was his absence the best outcome for her, too? The three men were staring at him. There was no sense that they were waiting for his agreement. Danny had been a soldier for long enough to understand that was not how it worked. They were waiting for an acknowledgement that he understood his orders. Just to be clear, you want me to babysit Bethany White on a mission to assassinate General O'Brien. When it's done, you want me to kill her. It's more than babysitting, Atwood said. Of course you need to make sure that she does what she's told. But getting her into Jordan isn't straightforward. For obvious reasons, Storrick said, we have wanted to keep tabs on her movements. She'll be pinged at any border with facial recognition technology. It means we don't want her making a standard border entry into Jordan. You'll have to get her in covertly. We're proposing a tandem halo, said the CEO. We'll get you into the Jordanian desert and you can make a way across country into Amman. Once you're there, we'll have counterfeit IDs and press passes waiting. We'll arrange for you to be on the press list for access to the hotel where O'Brien is staying. Our intelligence suggests that his routine is to go to the hotel bar every evening at 1800 hours sharp 
for a cocktail. That's where you'll need to make contact. Get the job done and get her out of there and out of Amman. We don't need to worry about getting her out of the country, of course, Storrock said. His self-satisfied smile had returned. What's the time scale? Danny said. O'Brien is already in Amman, said the CO. The drop happens tonight. Where's Bethany now? On her way to Bryce Norton, said Sturrock. By all accounts, she's making rather a nuisance of herself. No shit, Danny muttered. A van's waiting for you, the CO said. Check out anything you need from the armory. He pushed a folder of documents across the table. That's your target pack. It has your movement orders, details of the location of the hotel in Amman where the general's staying, everything you need to know. The rest is up to you. Danny nodded, stood, and left the room. The door clicked shut. Sturrock, Atwood, and Williamson remained silent for a full minute. Can he be trusted? Sturrock said finally. You asked us that once before, Atwood said. I think it's safe to say that Danny Black has proved himself. Frankly, Starrock, I'm surprised he sat in the same room as you for so long, said the CO. Another long pause. We should have told him that Bethany White's little boy is dead. Both Atwood and Starrock shook their heads. A rare moment of solidarity between them. The boy's the only leverage we have over White, said Starrock. If she finds out he's dead, we have nothing over her. He coughed. It's all very tragic, of course, he added. He's right, Mike, said Atwood. We can't risk Black letting it slip. Danny Black's a professional, said the CO. Agreed, said Atwood, but he's also a decent guy beneath it all. Not always an advantage in situations like this. Nobody had anything to say to that. The three men collected their papers and left the room. Chapter 4. London. Ten Hundred Hours GMT. Alice, good enough, was married to her job. All her friends said so, but they didn't know what her job was. They thought they did, something boring and desk-bound in the civil service that kept her in the office way past six o'clock. It was a big joke that she was always too late to get around in. As long as she smiled and joined in on the joke... Nobody asked what had kept her. Alice was twenty-nine. They'd recruited her at a university careers fair. She thought her degree in Russian language and literature might lead her into the foreign office, so had chatted with a bookish civil servant. No, he had assured her, being a woman of colour would not impede her application in any way. He encouraged her to put her name and email address down on a clipboard list. She received an invitation to come in for an informal chat the next day. It took place in a bland office near Victoria Station. One chat led to another and another. Gradually it became clear to Alice that she was being recruited into something more interesting than the civil service. Alice accepted the need for secrecy. In the seven years she had worked at the MI6 building in Vauxhall, she never told her friends or even her widowed mother, who lived in a council flat in Peckham, what she really did for a living. She sometimes wondered what would happen if she found herself in a serious relationship. Would she be able to keep the secret then? That was academic anyway. Yes, Alice Goodenough was truly married to her job. And she was good at it. Very good. She had an inquiring mind and an eye for detail. It could make her unpopular. Hers was not a workplace where young black women from poor backgrounds were expected or even intended to thrive. She endured all the usual slurs, racist and sexist. The pale, male and stale contingent, the PMS, as she liked to think of them, routinely raised their eyebrows at her South London accent. As for the coloured strands in her braided hair, her elaborately painted nails and the tiny stud in her nose, Alice stood out in the offices of MI6. People stared and talked behind her back. She ignored all this as best she could and concentrated on her work. Right now, her work involved research into an FSB agent called Dmitri Polyakov. The assignment came from the top. 
Alice could practically hear the muttering from the PMS contingent when she was summoned to the fifth floor to see the head of the Russian desk, Maxwell Stark. Stark was a powerful guy, second only to the chief. The odious Sturrock. You wouldn't have thought it to look at him. He was a tubby old-timer in his late sixties, with eyebrows so bushy Alice wanted to reach for the tweezers every time she saw him. He wore thick, rimmed spectacles that often looked as though they needed a good clean, and he had a helpless addiction to extra-strong mints. The tang of peppermint accompanied him at all times, and his teeth were shocking. Stark was a mild-mannered old boy, though. He wielded his authority lightly and treated Alice with respect. He clearly saw something in her. He asked her opinion on important matters when he didn't need to and listened carefully to her replies. If he was male and pale, perhaps he wasn't quite so stale as some of the others. The brief was concise. We'll be needing every last bit of intel you can find on an FSB agent called Dmitry Polyakov, especially in respect to any contact he may have had with the American general, Frank O'Brien. We think O'Brien's dirty. Would you be OK with that, Alice? Oh, that's very good of you. Needless to say, we can't allow this to go any further. Alice fully understood. A five-star general on the Russian books? In her world... That was as big as it could be. The need for secrecy was obvious. Equally obvious was that putting Alice on the job was a vote of confidence in her abilities. If she worked this case well, there might be a promotion. That, she thought, would silence the PMS contingent for good. Stark briefed her more fully about the reasons for this research. She learned about a disastrous SAS mission in northeastern Syria, Thirteen men dead at the hands of a Russian paramilitary force. He showed her the transcript of a recording made by the CIA in Crete between O'Brien and Polyakov that incriminated the American general. And she knew not to ask too many questions when Stark said, The O'Brien situation is being dealt with. His statement had an air of impropriety about it, and Alice was smart enough not to probe further. Her job was to do some digging on Polyakov, nothing more. Alice had a small office, more of a cupboard, really, on the fourth floor overlooking the train line into Waterloo. River views were not for people like her. It was neat and adequate for her needs. She sat at her desk. To one side was a laptop displaying a screensaver image of a Caribbean beach. She had a file open in front of her, fresh from the records office in the basement. Her index finger guided her eyes down the page as she read. She felt she had a good idea of who Polyakov was already. Born the 3rd of September 1970. Father, an intelligence analyst for the KGB. Mother, no job listed. Married to Alexa, a florist in Moscow, with two children. One boy, one girl, Ivan and Sofia. Polyakov had been a known field operative for at least 15 years and likely been working for Russian intelligence for much longer than that. He'd been active, so far as MI6 knew, in Georgia, Ukraine and South America. Alice studied a picture of him meeting with a contact in a Bogota cafe in 1998. He was a handsome man, or at least he had been then. Short black hair, an aquiline nose, a mole on his left cheek, heavy stubble, and, according to this photo at least, a charming smile. Charm was the most important attribute in an intelligence officer working in the field. You couldn't learn it. Charm was either there or it wasn't. Alice continued to look through the file. Here was Polyakov in Rio de Janeiro. Here he was in Tbilisi. Here he was with his wife and kids waving at the camera under the Eiffel Tower. Nothing in the file suggested that Polyakov was an especially important or successful FSB agent. He had recruited a minor Dutch member of the European Parliament and had been responsible for spreading some low-level misinformation about elements in the Gilets Jaunes in Paris. Alice wasn't fooled. She had learned back in her days on the council estate that the criminals to fear were not the famous showy ones who had spent more time inside than out, but the quiet, clever ones. The ones the police could never pin anything on. So it was with spies. 
A thin file didn't necessarily suggest a lack of activity. Sometimes it just meant they were good. Was Polyakov good? It was impossible to say from the information available. But if he'd been assigned contact with General O'Brien, the smart money was surely on him being higher up the tree than his file suggested. She kept this in mind as she continued to work her way through it. She found copies of his children's school reports and the transcript of a Skype conversation between his wife and her mother in Kiev. There was an unconfirmed report from an agent in Moscow that he had a penchant for cocaine. Someone had written in red pen the word blackmail and circled it twice. Then, at the back of the file, she found something interesting. It was a one-page report from a British agent she knew well. His name was Mark Corley, and he worked under diplomatic cover at the British Embassy in Moscow. He was a sleazy old dinosaur, but his information was usually reliable. She read his memo greedily. It was dated just two days ago and reported a rumour that Dmitry Polyakov had been missing for one week. Ordinarily, this would not merit any kind of comment. Polyakov could be anywhere for any reason. He was a spy, after all. However, his wife and two children were also missing. And for anybody who knew anything about Russia, that was alarming. The families of FSB agents were protected citizens, but only for so long as the agent was in favour. If the agent messed up in any way, the family could expect to pay a price. Alice put the file down and stared out of the window over the train tracks. A southwestern service trundled by, glinting in the bright sunshine. She thought it through. Polyakov was General O'Brien's point man, but he'd messed up. He'd been spotted with the general in Crete, their conversation overheard. Did the Russians know this? If so, they would most certainly want to eliminate Polyakov. So was he still alive? Was his family still alive? So many questions impossible to answer from a broom cupboard in Vauxhall. She picked up her work phone. It was a regular smartphone, but with a dedicated app for making encrypted calls. She used it to dial Mark Corley in Moscow. He answered quickly. Calling, he said. He had the affable, patrician voice of British diplomats all over the world. Mark, it's Alice from the office. What can I do for you, Alice? Uh, you can speak openly? As openly as anyone can speak in Moscow, my dear. Alice let the my dear pass. I'm looking at your communication regarding Dmitri Polyakov. Yes, said Corley. He elongated the word yes. I have an intelligence source who is a friend of his. He's rather unreliable, to be honest. Bit too fond of the old Stolichnaya. Told me about Polyakov and his family after a sherbet too many. Didn't think it would be of much interest, if I'm honest. Can you find out more? Is he still missing? Do we have any idea of his whereabouts? Of course, my dear. Might it be important? Just putting my ducks in a row, Mark. She made a face. It was the sort of thing the PMS contingent said, but she used it now because this was Corley's language. Could you make it a priority? I've got the fifth floor breathing down my neck. Say no more. And maybe we could have a spot of lunch next time I'm over. Alice made a sour face. That would be super, Mark, she said. You'll call me as soon as you know anything. The very the line went dead. Chapter 5 Cincinnati, Ohio, USA 0500 hours Eastern Standard Time Hamud al-Asma's sheets were soaked in sweat every morning when he woke. Today his thin, bony, naked body was clammy, the mattress uncomfortably damp. At least he hadn't woken to the sound of his own screams. That happened two or three times a week, and it made him feel bad all day. Not bad for himself, but for his wife, Rabia, and his children, Malik and Melissa. It distressed them terribly to hear their father in such anguish. No matter how often he tried to persuade them that it was just a silly bad dream, that it was really nothing to worry about, that he was absolutely fine, they never believed him. Why would they? They weren't stupid. 
Hamud's night terrors had haunted him ever since the blessed day he had left Guantanamo Bay. During his two years as an inmate, he'd never dreamed at all. The horrors had happened when he was awake. When he was asleep, his mind blocked them out. Now a free man, he relived them every night. This time it had been the salt water. In his dream, as in real life, rough men had woken him in his cell. That cell, empty but for Hamoud, the flies, and the two bowls in the corner. One bowl was his toilet. The other contained dirty water to wipe himself clean. They changed the bowls only every three or four days. He slept on the hard floor, and the flies would crawl over his waist and drink at the foul water and then settle on his face. In the early days, he would flick those germ-ridden insects away. As time passed and his spirit broke, he lacked the motivation and the energy even to do that. The men had arrived in his cell without warning. Perhaps it was midnight, perhaps midday. Hamoud had no way of knowing. There were four of them. Two carried five-gallon containers full of water. Two carried a piece of apparatus that resembled a child's seesaw. He knew what it was for, and he panicked. He tried to fight the men, but he was thin and malnourished, and they were burly and strong. One of them hit him. He fell and hit his face against the raised end of the seesaw. It collapsed under his weight, but the corner was sharp and it cut him badly. He could still remember the agony of the skin tearing in a line up his right cheek, over his eyelid and up over his right eyebrow. He could feel the hot blood stinging his eye and the panic that he might be blinded. They strapped him to the seesaw. They pivoted the seesaw so Hamoud's feet were higher than his head. They placed a bucket under his head and a thick wet cloth over his face. Hamoud's eye was agony and he found it difficult to breathe. He strained against the strapping and emitted a muffled cry. He knew what was coming. They had waterboarded him before. They had poured fresh water over his covered face. That was bad enough. Within seconds he had been screaming at them to stop. When they repeated the process, he had shouted at them whatever he thought they wanted to hear. Yes, he was a jihadist. Yes, he had come to America from his native Mauritania with the express intention of murdering American citizens. Yes, he could name others. Mohammed, Ahmed, Khalil. Never mind that these so-called accomplices were entirely made up. Never mind that Hamoud would never hurt another living creature, let alone murder an American. If they needed to hear these confessions to make it stop, Stop, he would say them. This time was worse. The five-gallon containers contained not fresh water, but salt water, which burned his throat as well as the wound on his eye. It made him want to retch, which only made him ingest more and increase the terrifying, paralyzing suffocation. And when the sluicing stopped, although he tried to gasp for breath, his burning throat was so full of salt water that he could do nothing but splutter and choke. And then, after only a few seconds, they started again. Hamoud would never be able to say how long the torture lasted. He only knew that when it was over, his throat and lungs throbbed with pain, that he was dizzy and nauseous and disoriented, that the wound on his eye had been numbed into insensitivity. In the brief intervals when they had removed the cloth, he had rasped information at his torturers, any information, names made up, places invented, plots fabricated, all now forgotten by him, at least. He had shivered in the corner of the room as they silently removed their equipment. When they'd left, he had noticed through his good eye that the bowl of dirty water had been upturned and was spreading across the floor of his cell, and a fly was circling the rim of the toilet bowl. Hamoud had dreamed vividly about that torture last night. For a moment, in the twilight between sleeping and waking, he thought his salty sweat was the salt water from the five-gallon containers and that it was all happening again. Even as he woke more fully, clutching his right eye, he thought he was lying in his cell. It was only the calming voice of Rabia and the touch of her cool hand on his brow that told him he was safely at home. The memory of Guantanamo Bay 
was just that, a memory. It was dark in their tiny bedroom. They couldn't afford curtains, let alone blackout curtains, so he knew it was before dawn. He crept out of bed and pulled on his plain white robe. He had to wear loose clothing because anything too tight hurt the scars on his abdomen. But even the robe clung to his sweaty skin and he winced with discomfort. He tiptoed sideways round the bed because there was so little space and walked lightly so he didn't disturb the two children who shared a thin mattress on the floor in the next room. Rabia kept the bathroom scrupulously clean even though the constant condensation made the wool sweat even more than Hamoud. Here he splashed water on his face and looked in the mirror. There was enough moonlight for him to see his reflection. Hamoud was only thirty-two but he looked at least ten years older. His skin was dark, but the rings around his eyes were darker. His beard was flecked with grey. It was long and soft. The children liked to put their hands through it. Hamoud would have preferred to shave it off because he knew that it made him look more Muslim, and that could be difficult. But Rabia persuaded him to keep it. She liked it, she said, and he should not be ashamed of who he was any more than he should be ashamed by the scar on his eye. He looked at it now. It was white and embossed. It stretched in a straight vertical line from his right eyebrow over his eyelids and down his cheek. It made him look like a criminal. People stared at it, at him, and he knew what they were thinking, that his appearance indicated a hatred of America. The dream had stayed with him as he sat at the table in their living space. He could almost taste the brine in the back of his throat. He scratched his palms. It was a habit of his from his time in Guantanamo. They were red and inflamed. The more he scratched them, the sorer they became, but he couldn't stop doing it. He poured himself a glass of water and drank deeply. To Hamoud, who had spent so many days in prison starved of water... This was a real luxury. He felt much better when he'd finished it, calmer. Hamoud owned a box. It wasn't a special or expensive box, just a plywood thing that he'd bought in a thrift store. He kept it on the top shelf of the bookcase, out of the children's reach. Rabia had wanted Hamoud to dispose of the contents, but they were important to him. He fetched the box now, placed it on the table and opened it up. It was brimful of newspaper clippings, neatly trimmed and folded. He removed the top clipping. A face stared out at him, a man with brown skin like Hamwood. He looked sinister, scary almost. The caption under the photograph read, Former Guantanamo Bay inmate Ahmed Kenan. Hamoud had never met Ahmed Kenan. They had segregated him from all other prisoners during his time in the camp. He had never met any of them. He didn't know whether Ahmed Kenan was falsely accused like him or a violent terrorist. He would never know. They would never meet. But he felt a connection with the man who stared out of the newspaper clipping. He felt a connection with all the former inmates whose details he had meticulously collected and stored in this cheap box. He selected another picture, a more friendly-looking fellow, with an unnaturally long face and a beard that seemed to elongate it even further. Hamoud liked looking at this man. There was something appealing about him. He thought in a different life they could have been friends. It grew light outside. He could hear Rabia moving around. He folded up the clippings and returned the box to its place on the bookcase. He knew she would tell him off for looking through it. Why are you looking at those pictures? she would say. How many of those men are criminals? It's almost like you want to be back in that cursed place. There was nothing Hamoud wanted less, and he couldn't explain why he found the pictures such a comfort. Perhaps it was just the thought that there were other people who knew, who truly knew, what he had been through. He worried that she would one day throw them out, but for now she at least seemed to accept that they were important to him, even if she didn't like it. He heard her enter the bathroom. Soon she would leave for work, cleaning houses, and she would not be back until it was dark. Hamoud would take the children to school and return to the apartment 
where he would remain until it was time to pick them up. There was no question of him getting a job. His nerves were not up to it, and his wife would never allow it. Not until he was better, whatever that meant. And anyway, at some point, he would have to let an employer know where he had spent two years of his life, and who, in their right minds, would give a job to a former Guantanamo inmate. It would make no difference to them that he had been released without charge. It would make no difference that he was a U.S. citizen. Nobody wanted Hamoud to help make America great again. So he would spend today, as every day, alone in his tiny apartment with its musty carpets and patches of damp provided by the American government as a meagre acknowledgement that they had inflicted two years of horror on an innocent man. And when his family returned from their full days, he would be diminished, less of a man than he had been when he'd said goodbye to them. Each day chipped away at him. Soon, he thought to himself, there would be nothing left. As these thoughts raced through his mind, he heard something. Footsteps in the corridor outside. The walls of this apartment block were thin. Sound travelled. No doubt this neighbour heard his regular nighttime screams. It was unusual, however, to hear footsteps at this time in the morning. He checked his watch. Two minutes to six. Normally he didn't hear anybody until six-thirty. The footsteps stopped outside the door to the apartment. An envelope appeared under the door. Hamoud, sitting cross-legged on the threadbare sofa they had salvaged from a street corner, watched it with quiet astonishment. He stood up, hurried to the door, and opened it, peering outside to see who the delivery person was. The corridor was empty. The door at the end, which led to the stairwell, slammed shut. Silence. Hamoud picked up the envelope. It was addressed to him, and there was a stamp and postmark. It felt heavy. Distracted, he closed the apartment door with his foot and walked back to the sofa where he opened the envelope and emptied out its contents. There was a letter inside and a brochure for Walt Disney World in Florida. His eyes lingered on the brochure first. There was a boy and a girl on the front cover. Each had pale skin, blue eyes and blonde, tousled hair. They were hugging Mickey Mouse, and they looked so happy that Hamoud smiled. Then he felt sad. He wished his children might one day look as happy as that. It seemed unlikely. They were only eight and ten, and already they had the tired expressions of the world-weary. He turned his attention to the letter. At the top, beneath a letterhead that depicted the Cinderella castle showered in fireworks, was the word congratulations in a big, cheery typeface. It was just a piece of junk mail. On another day, Hamoud might have chucked it in the bin, but this morning he felt like reading. He loved to read as a child, but since Guantanamo, he couldn't hope to focus on something as long as a book, so he read on. Congratulations, you and your family have been chosen in our special summertime bonanza for an all-expenses-paid trip to Walt Disney World, Florida. He blinked, then glanced back at the brochure. A tiny flame of excitement ignited inside him. He snuffed it out quickly. There was obviously a catch. He read on. As part of our special promotion, you will receive complimentary flights and two thousand dollars spending money to ensure your family has the trip of a lifetime. Just call this number to claim your prize. There was a 1-800 number at the bottom of the page and a pre-printed signature. Hamoud read the letter again, and then, when he heard Rabia coming, stuffed the envelope and its contents under the cushions of the sofa. He didn't quite know why he wanted to hide them. Perhaps it was because he didn't want his family to get their hopes up. Perhaps it was because he felt embarrassed at the idea that his wife might think he believed this was anything but a scam. Was there someone at the door? Rabia said as she entered. Her hair was tied back, and she looked very beautiful. Hamoud shook his head. I thought I heard it, she said. The family always spoke English together, rather than their native Arabic. It helped Malik and Melissa to integrate and was a symbol of their intention to forgive the Americans for what they had done to Hamoud. Rabia walked over to him and put a hand on his cheek. Are you okay? she asked. He knew she was talking about the dream and nodded. 
We, we should wake them, he said. They'll be late for school. Their morning routine was the same as ever. Sleepy children reluctantly dressed. Bowls of Cheerios slowly eaten. Hamoud made little jokes with the kids, and gradually their sleepiness was replaced by smiles. They were so different from each other. Melissa boisterous and loud, Malik quiet and reserved, like Hamoud, but both kind and sensitive. Occasionally Hamoud caught them glancing at him with concern, because they knew that sometimes their dad was sad, even when he pretended to be happy. But they didn't say anything, and soon they were kissing their mum goodbye as she left for work. Hamoud urged them to pack their school bags and hurried them out of the apartment. They lived in a poor area, here, on the outskirts of Cincinnati. They weren't the only brown-skinned people, but they still drew stares from some of the passers-by, many of them unfriendly. Hamoud and his family were used to it, or so they liked to pretend. The children were clingy at the school gates, holding on to their dad for a few seconds longer than most other kids, unwilling to say goodbye. Hamoud stayed at the gates, one hand raised in farewell, until they were out of sight. Then he returned home. The apartment was so quiet without them. Ordinarily, he hated this moment, facing a day enclosed by the walls and his thoughts. As usual, he locked himself inside. When he'd been a prisoner, some habits were hard to shake. Normally, he would now sit in front of the TV and watch the shopping channel all day in an attempt to distract himself from his worries. But not today. Today he felt a tinge of anticipation. He removed the letter from under the cushion and read it again. Then he pulled his cheap, scuffed second-hand cell phone from his pocket. He keyed in the 1-800 number, but his finger hovered over the dial button for several minutes. Anxiety burned in his chest. He wasn't good at making phone calls at the best of times. He put the phone to one side and scratched at his palms so hard he thought they might bleed. He breathed deeply. His gaze fell on the Walt Disney World brochure and the smiling children on the front, and that gave him the courage to pick up the phone again and press call. It rang four times. Five. Nobody was going to answer. He should just hang up. Hello, Walt Disney World, where all your dreams come true. A cheerful female voice uh, uh, hello, said Hamoud. How may I help you, sir? Well, y you see, it's, it's it's probably nothing. I mean, I, I mean, it's probably a hoax, but I received the letter about a special summertime offer, uh, an all-expenses-paid trip. It sounded ridiculous, even as he said it. Of course, sir. May I take your name, please? Uh, Hamoud. Hamoud al-Asmar, he said it apologetically. And your address, please, sir? He gave his address. One moment, please, sir. There was a click. A swooning orchestra played When You Wish Upon a Star. It continued for perhaps a minute. Then there was another click, and the voice returned. Mr. Alasmar? Uh, uh, yes? Congratulations! You and your family are going to Walt Disney World for five magical days and nights starting Wednesday. Mr. Alasmar? Mr. Alasmar, are you there? Uh, I, I'm here. He, he, yes, I am here. It's just I, I don't understand. Why are you giving us this? Why, why, why us? Your names have been chosen at random, sir. All we ask in return is the opportunity to take a few pictures of you and your beautiful family while you're enjoying the magic of Walt Disney World. We'll be FedExing your plane tickets today. But can't we choose when to go? M my wife has to work, and the children are at school. I'm afraid the dates are fixed, Mr. Alasmar. Your flights are booked for Wednesday, and we have rooms booked for you until Sunday night. Wednesday? But, but that's tomorrow. The dates are fixed, Mr. Alasmar. But if you're unable to take advantage of the offer, we do understand, and we will find another family who have more flexibility. No! said Hamwood quickly. Uh, no, we'll, we'll go. Uh, my wife can ask for some time off. That's great to hear, sir. Everything you need will be with you first thing in the morning. You'll be flying from Cincinnati to Orlando. Is there anything else I can help you with? Hamwood shook his head, even though there was nobody to see it. 
no, he said. No, thank you. Then you have a great day, sir. Thank you for choosing Walt Disney World for your vacation. The line went dead. Hamoud stared at the phone for a little while. I didn't choose Walt Disney World, he wanted to say. Walt Disney World chose me. His hand was trembling. That was nothing new, but this time it was out of excitement rather than stress. He flicked through the Walt Disney World brochure, and instead of the happy American children screaming with joy on Space Mountain, he saw Malik and Melissa. It brought a smile to his face. He dialed Rabia's number to tell her the good news, but hung up before the call could connect. Better to tell her tonight, when she was not distracted by her cleaning job. The days passed slowly for Hamud. He prepared himself for today to pass more slowly than most. Chapter 6 Danny Black was always ready to deploy. He kept a grab bag in the squadron hangar, and his personal weapons were waiting for him in the armory. It took an hour to prepare himself, by which time the gear needed for his halo drop into the Jordanian desert had been stowed in the back of the unmarked transit van waiting for him. He didn't recognise the driver, nor did he want to speak to him. He took his seat in the back and sat silently. His mind churned. Events were happening quickly. An operation like this, to take out such a sensitive target, would usually be weeks in the planning. It would require a substantial team of guys. This wasn't the first time that Danny had felt he was taking on the work of more than one man, but he understood why it was necessary. It wasn't just the covert nature of the op. It was the difficulty of dealing with the other person involved, Bethany White. She was the most complicated person Danny had ever met, a mother and a killer, a grieving widow and a psychopath, a high-level MI6 operator and MI6's worst nightmare. She was poison and honey, light and dark. In his experience, the security services attracted many psychotic types, highly manipulative and able to kill without a flicker of fellow feeling. But Bethany White was an extreme case. She had manipulated Danny with skill and apparent ease. Danny would be lying if he said he wasn't attracted to her, but she repelled him too. He'd never hoped or expected to see her again, and the thought that they were to come face to face in a couple of hours made him apprehensive. Funny, he thought to himself, how calmly he could deal with whatever threats the life of an SAS soldier threw at him, but the thought of meeting a beautiful blonde thirty-year-old woman again dumped acid in his gut. The journey to Bryce Norton took two hours. It gave him time to examine the target pack they'd given him back in Hereford. He committed to memory details of the forthcoming halo drop, maps of the area, and plans Hereford had put in place to get them out of the desert into Oman and close to the general. Hereford's strategy was good, but it relied on a single, scarcely knowable factor, Bethany White's compliance. Danny suspected it would be unwillingly delivered. A Globemaster was taking off as they arrived at their destination. The deafening roar of its engines made the unmarked van shake as the driver flashed some ID at a security point that led straight onto the airfield. They slalomed around fuel lorries and military trucks as they crossed to the far side of the airfield, where a long, solitary porter cabin was manned by a couple of armed guys in camouflage gear. It was a hot day, unusually hot for the UK, and the airfield shimmered in the heat haze. A couple of hundred metres away, a Hercules was taxiing across the tarmac. Once Danny had alighted, carrying a grey sports bag stuffed with clothes, the van headed up in the direction of the Herc. Danny approached the porter cabin. Blackout linings covered the inside of the windows. The two armed guards were young and pimply. Danny could tell they were nervous. He smiled to put them at ease, but then realised he wasn't the reason they were on edge. Is it locked? he asked them, dumping the sports bag on the ground. They nodded. Give me the key. One of the guys handed it over. Has she been searched? Danny asked. Yeah, said the guy. 
Three times, but keep your distance if I was you. When we was bringing her in, she had a blade in the lining of her top that we missed. Cut my mate's face something nasty. Took three of us to get it off her. Danny nodded. That sounded like her. He felt for his Glock and made sure it was secure in its holster. He walked up the steps to the porter cabin door, unlocked it, then kicked it. The door clattered as it swung open. Danny entered. There were a couple of tables, chairs scattered around, some on their sides as if there had been a fight in here, whiteboards on the wall. The blackout linings on the windows were fixed with layers of brown tape. And there was Bethany White. She was huddled in a corner, clutching her knees. There was a table between them, but it didn't block his view. Her blonde hair was matted and dirty. There were mascara streaks on her cheeks that partially covered the golden freckles underneath. Her eyes were red. She was breathing heavily, and she was staring at him. The Bethany that Danny knew had always shown the world a smart, confident face. This pale creature, her face bleached both by the overhead light and her own distress, was wretched. Her shoulders shook, her left eye twitched. There was an unpleasant smell in the porter cabin. Danny was pretty sure it came from her. There was a smear of blood on her cheek, and Danny remembered what the guy outside had said about the blade. He looked around the room, searching for anything that might present itself as an incidental weapon. There was nothing, but that didn't mean she hadn't located any dangerous items before his arrival. Stand up, he said. She stared at him without moving. You heard me. I said, yeah, I heard you, she rasped. Her voice was hoarse, but that didn't hide her faint West Country burr. They locked gazes. Bethany pushed herself to her feet, her back sliding up against the wall. She was wearing what Danny supposed were the clothes she had on when she was brought in, tatty jeans and an oversized sweatshirt. The sweatshirt was streaked with blood. So were her hands. They were clawed, as though she was ready to scratch someone's eyes out. I didn't think I'd be seeing you again, she said. Makes two of us. I hear you've been getting handy with a razor blade. She managed to make an insouciant shrug. He got too close. A smile crossed her lips, and despite her feral appearance, Danny saw a hint of her dazzling good looks. I seem to remember you trying to get quite close too, Danny. What is it? Have you gone off me? He saw her clawed fingers relax. I don't want to be here any more than you want me here, Danny replied. Did I say that? said Bethany. She moved a strand of matted hair from her face. They took my son, she said. I know, he's safe. You want to know what I'm going to do when I find the people who took him? You'll never find them, he said. You want to bet? You're too smart, Bethany. You know what they'll do to you if you start going after people again. You won't give them any option and Danny won't have his mother. He doesn't have his mother now, but he will do. If you do what you're told, he will do. You have my word on that. She laughed scornfully. Your word? What's that worth? Danny stared her down. Something, he said. Your boy stopped you from killing me, remember? Maybe I owe him one. Bethany watched him uncertainly. She clearly didn't know if she believed him. But Danny was telling the truth. No matter what he thought of Bethany, he liked her kid. He tried not to think too hard about his instruction to make him an orphan. Listen, he said, I don't have any great love for the spooks. They've lied to me more times than I can count, and I don't like the way they've played this. I've got a kid too. I get it. I want yours to go back home no matter what I think of you. What a pretty speech, she slow clapped sarcastically and gazed around. So, do we get to leave this room? Those two boys outside look like they might soil themselves. This room is secure, said Danny. I can brief you here. We're heading to Jordan, tonight. She was obviously trying to hide it, but a flicker of interest crossed Bethany's face. You can take the girl out of MI6, Danny thought to himself. I haven't agreed to anything yet, she said, and then, unable to withhold her curiosity, why would we go to Jordan? We have a target, 
An American five-star general. His name's Frank O'Brien. He's been a bad boy. Show me a soldier who hasn't been, Bethany said. No one else has been bad like this. An image of the smoke-filled wasteland outside the Syrian prison flashed in his mind. He's passing sensitive military information to the Russians, including information about British troop movements. Thanks to him, my team was massacred. Now he gets paid back. So the Yanks have got a mole. A dismissive tone of voice angered Danny, but he did his best not to show it. It was only a matter of time. What's it got to do with me? The General's in Jordan for a peace conference. He has a CP team wherever he goes. It's hard for me to get close. But he also has an eye for the ladies. Danny didn't have to say any more. Bethany gave a cynical smile. Are you suggesting that you and your friends at MI6 suddenly feel a little less queasy about my methods? We do what we have to do, Danny said. Obviously, which is why you don't mind stealing a six-year-old boy from his mother. She took a step towards him. There was something in her gait. The Bethany Danny had seen when he walked in here had looked broken. Somehow, in the course of their conversation, she had started to put herself back together again. The trouble is... You seem to have forgotten something. I've lodged details of MI6's illegal actions with solicitors all over the world. One word from me and they'll release that information. So I don't think I need to do a single thing you say. And if my former employees don't get my son back to me, they'll only have themselves to blame. Danny put one hand in his pocket and removed his mobile phone. He offered it to Bethany. Go ahead, he said. Call your lawyers, any of them. I think you might find that each of them has met with a nasty accident. What do you mean? Come on, Danny said. You're not stupid. You really think you could go GCHQ six months and they wouldn't trace your precious solicitors? Bethany didn't seem to have a response to that. Her shoulders slumped again. But then, in an instant, she regained her poise. It doesn't matter, she said. So, let's say I agree. How do we go about this? We can't make a regular border entry, Danny said. Your face will ping every facial recognition system in the world. MI6 have seen to it. So we need to make a covert entry. There's a Hercules waiting for us. Tonight, we fly along the Israel-Jordan border and we do a tandem halo jump into the Jordanian side. They'll drop a quad bike in alongside us and we'll make our way across the desert into Jordan. We'll have passes waiting for us that will get us into the General's Hotel. Then you flutter your eyelashes at him. Bethany took a moment to absorb that. A halo jump, she said. Danny nodded. I'll talk you through it. I'm not one for heights, she said. You'll have to hold me tight. Danny gave her a level look. He was only human. He couldn't help being physically attracted to Bethany White, but he knew how dangerous that was and how ruthlessly she would use it against him. You weren't thrilled to see me walk into this room, he said. I'm not thrilled to be here. I've got a job to do, and so do you. Any of that other shit, forget it. If you want your kid back, let's get this done, and we never have to see each other again. Silence. I need to shower, said Bethany. Do you think the boys at the door will let me leave without peeing their pants? Danny held up his glock. Don't make a mistake, he said. I will do it. And then who's going to nail your precious general for you? Bethany said. Put the gun down, Danny. You're not going to shoot me and I'm not going to give you any trouble. At least, not until I have my boy back. She turned her back on him. Tell the kids I'm coming out, she said. I wouldn't want to scare them. Danny left the porter cabin. The two guys outside were gripping the weapons slung across their fronts. I'm taking her out, Danny said. She needs to get cleaned up. We have orders, said one of them. He held up a pair of handcuffs. As long as she's on sight, she wears these. Danny took the cuffs. You got the key, he said. The soldier handed it over. Danny clunked the cuffs shut, dropped them on the ground and pocketed the key. She's with me, he said. She doesn't need those. The two soldiers eyed each other uncomfortably. Danny re-entered the porter cabin. No cuffs, Bethany said. They wanted to. I said no. Bethany shrugged, as if to suggest 
that she wasn't fussed. Danny wasn't fooled. He could sense that she was suddenly more at her ease. Ditching the handcuffs had been the right call. He knew Bryce Norton well, having deployed from here more times than he could count. There was a functional shower and toilet block to the back of the main terminal. Danny led Bethany out of the porter cabin, picked up the sports bag full of clothes and handed it to her. She smiled at the two soldiers keeping guard, but looked gruesome with her dirty, bloodied face framed by her wild, matted hair. They crossed the tarmac in silence. When they reached the shower block, Danny stood outside. He wasn't really guarding the entrance. He knew that if Bethany wanted to escape the block, she'd find some way to do it. But he was certain that she wouldn't. Bethany White was many things, a killer, a traitor even. But everything she had done had been for family. She wasn't about to throw all that away. No peeking, she shouted over her shoulder as she entered the block. Danny was sweating heavily. The afternoon sun beat hard on the airfield and he had to shield his eyes to look across at the Hercules. The tailgate was down and gear was being loaded up, though from this distance he couldn't quite make it out in detail. Otherwise, all he saw were troops moving around in open-top trucks and fuel vehicles circling the perimeter, the regular sights and sounds of a working military airfield. Ten minutes later, Bethany re-emerged. She looked amazing. Her clean skin glowed. Her long blonde hair was damp and shiny. There was no vestige of the crazy-looking woman Danny had found in the porter cabin. She was wearing the camouflage gear Danny had supplied her with. It too was damp where her hair touched it. A perfect fit, she said, indicating the clothes. It's almost as if you knew my size. Danny ignored her flirtatious comment. He pointed towards the Hercules. That's a ride, he said. You ever done a halo drop before? What do you think? I'll explain everything once we're in the air. This is all pretty fast, Danny. It's not like the Hereford, I know. Don't they want a week of briefings and a full squadron in case somebody stubs their toe? No time for that, Danny said. And sometimes you need a scalpel, not a hammer. Very poetic. Shall we go? Bethany strode forwards. If she was feeling any anxiety, she didn't show it. He reminded himself that she had fooled him once before. Nothing, with Bethany, was quite what it seemed, and Danny didn't intend to make the same mistake twice. He caught up with her, and they walked side by side back to the porter cabin. The two soldiers were still there, sweating in the heat. Danny pulled out his phone and made a call. Seconds later, the white van pulled away from the Hercules and headed across the tarmac towards them. Chapter 7 Danny knew from past experience that Bethany White was as skilled an actress as she was an assassin. She was apparently a completely different person now she'd emerged from the shower. There was no sign of the broken, distressed mother crouching in the corner of a locked porter cabin. She walked with confidence, shoulders pinned back, head held high. Nobody would even begin to guess what she had learned in the last hour nor what she had agreed to do. It made Danny even more wary. He knew plenty of killers. He knew female soldiers more ruthless than even the most ferocious regiment guys. But he'd never met a person who could slip into a role quite so easily. It was impossible to tell what such a person was thinking, or what they intended to do. Bethany White was probably more dangerous than anyone he'd ever met. The unmarked white van deposited them at the bottom of the Hercules' tailgate. Five loadmasters stood together, drinking coffee from plastic cups. Two older men stood slightly apart. Each had aviator shades hanging from the top pocket of their fatigues. They were clearly the pilot and co-pilot. Danny walked up to them and shook their hands. Formalities over. What's our flight path? he asked. We're heading across the Med and over Cyprus. The Israelis have given us permission to enter their airspace, but my instructions are to keep the Jordanians in the dark, so we're going to head south along the Israel-Jordan border and make the drop when we're directly west of Amman. That'll put you down somewhere between the West Bank and the Jordanian village of Assault. What's the status in the West Bank? Any fighting? None reported, but it's volatile, as I'm sure you know. If we can nudge over the Jordanian side of the border, we will. He looked at his watch. 
It's nineteen hundred hours, he said. Wheels up in thirty minutes. Uh, we'll look to make the drop sometime after zero one thirty local, if that suits you. Danny nodded his agreement, shook the pilot's hand again, and walked over to the loadmasters. One of them, a bald guy with a crusty cold sore on his lower lip, stepped forward. He was clearly the main loady. Is the quad bike strapped up? Danny said. Dressed up like a Christmas turkey, the loady replied. Ready to go. The rest of my gear? The loady nodded in the direction of the tailgate. Danny thanked him and gave the remaining loadies a thumbs up. In advance of a halo jump, these were the guys you needed on your side. He was under no illusion, though, that they were more interested in Bethany, with her damp blonde hair and the pout that Danny knew was entirely affected than him. He ushered her up the tailgate into the belly of the Hercules. Danny remembered how, as a kid, the smell of his dog's damp fur had a calming effect on him. Nowadays, the smell of a military aircraft fulfilled the same role. It wasn't a pleasant smell. It was greasy and thick. The stench of aviation fuel caught the back of your throat. But it was a smell that told Danny he was in an environment where he knew what he was doing. He'd thrown himself out of these aircraft more times than he could count. This was his turf. The same couldn't be said of Bethany. As they entered the Hercules, her show of cool confidence faltered momentarily. He'd seen it before. The tightening of the eyes and the slump in the shoulders of arrogant young rookies, all piss and vinegar, as they entered an aircraft for their first freefall and were hit with the realisation of what they were about to do. When Bethany caught Danny looking at her, she quickly straightened herself up and made a show of looking around the inside of the aircraft. It was functional. There were benches along either side of the plane with webbing straps and medical boxes fixed to the interior fuselage. The space was dominated by a pallet with a quad bike strapped to it. The bike itself was a couple of metres long, with large, solid tyres that still held remnants of dust and mud from its last use. It was heavily strapped to the pallet, almost as if somebody had attempted to bandage it and its bodywork was sprayed in desert khaki colours. A robust, dependable piece of kit, which in a few hours would be dropped into the desert from 30,000 feet. An enormous parachute pack was strapped to the top of the quad bike and the pallet itself was resting on a set of rails that ran along the centre of the Hercules all the way to the tailgate. Danny's gear was stashed by one of the benches. He walked over to it, crouched down and double-checked the kit. First off, the tandem chute. He examined the release rings and cables, the routing of the strapping and the cutaway handles. Bethany watched him intently as he performed these standard checks. So, you never jumped before, Danny said. Never? She sounded a bit reluctant to admit her lack of experience. You'll be strapped to me. What are they for? Bethany pointed at a couple of canisters. Oxygen. It'll be thin where we're jumping from. We'll need it for the first few thousand feet, otherwise hypoxia, oxygen starvation. We don't want to pass out before we deploy the chute. Bethany looked a bit queasy. What if it goes wrong? she said. It's only the last inch that kills you. Is that supposed to be funny? Danny stood up and walked over to her. Which wrist do you want to wear your watch on? My left, she said. She held up her left wrist to show him. If anything happens, Danny said, that's the arm you want to hold in the air. She looked confused. Why? You want to break your watch. Fuck off! Nothing's going to go wrong, Danny said. He went back to the gear and held up the tandem rig. You're going to wear this, he said. I'll be securely clipped in behind you and I'll operate the chute. As soon as the quad goes out, we'll follow. Put your arms across your chest and keep your head up. Don't worry if we go upside down, it happens sometimes and we'll soon right ourselves. Do what I tell you and you'll be fine. I've done this thousands of times before. He managed a smile. It's going to be the best ride of your life. Bethany looked deeply uncertain. She pointed at the quad bike. I'm guessing we don't intend to drive that thing up to the front entrance of a swanky hotel in Amman. Right, Danny said. He had instant recall of the instructions in his target pack. 
There are some old Roman ruins in the desert on the outskirts of the city. We'll head for that location where we'll RV with a local fixer at dawn. He'll have a more suitable vehicle for us and will show us a place to hide the quad bike. Can we trust him? Of course not. But he won't get paid until we're out of country and he's not doing it for the shits and giggles. Once we have the new vehicle, we'll head to a safe house in Amman where there'll be civvies and press passes waiting for us so we can get into the General's hotel. He could see her assimilating this information. Just do as I tell you, he said. She gave him a contemptuous look. He went back to checking over the kit, wrist-mounted altimeter, twice the size of a normal watch and a smaller wrist-mounted Garmin GPS unit, personal weapons and ammunition, oxygen masks, two sets of night vision goggles for when they were on the ground, NV scopes, day packs, an entrenching tool. When he was happy that everything was in order, he turned his attention to the quad bike. He tugged at the strapping to ensure everything was secure. He checked the fuel tank was closed. The keys to the quad were hanging in the ignition. He removed them and placed them in a secure pouch in his camo gear. By now, the loadies were all aboard, performing their own final checks and readying the Herc for flight. The engines started up. The aircraft thrummed and the tailgate closed, blocking out the daylight. Lights along the fuselage illuminated the interior, but only dimly. Danny and Bethany strapped themselves into the benches, sitting opposite each other as the Herc began to move. It taxied for ten minutes, stopped for a few seconds, and then accelerated. Moments later, they were airborne. Danny watched Bethany carefully as the Herc gained altitude. Her eyes were closed and she was resting her head against the fuselage. She had looked almost inhuman a couple of hours ago. Now, despite her anxiety about the drop and her anger about being manoeuvred into this situation, she looked entirely calm. Danny wished he knew what was going on in her head. Which version of Bethany existed behind that impenetrable exterior? He thought about what he had been tasked to do to her once she had served her purpose. As the Hercules bank steeply straightened up and set its course for the Jordanian border. Alice had worked late, as usual. She had left the MI6 building just after ten and taken a train from Vauxhall to Mitcham, where she lived alone in a tiny one-bedroom maisonette. She'd called her mum, who told her, as she did every single day, that Alice was working too hard. Then she'd eaten some cold pasta bake from the fridge, drank a cup of herbal tea, removed her makeup, and fallen into bed. Alice's phone was on silent, but it still vibrated noisily on her bedside table as a call came through. She groped for it in the darkness, almost dropped it, then answered it sleepily. Hello? Alice, my dear. Who is this? Her bedside clock read 11.55. It's me, my dear, Mark. Mark Corey. His voice was slightly slurred. He'd been drinking. Alice quickly calculated that it must be just after 2 a.m. in Moscow. It's late, Mark, she said. Never too late to hear your delightful voice. When are you going to visit me in Moscow? I know a crack... Why are you calling Mark? She was fully awake now and keeping her voice level and patient. This was by no means the first time an officer in the field had contacted her in a state of inebriation. Drunkenness for many of them seemed almost unavoidable. The best way to persuade a target or informant to release information was to ply them with alcohol. It worked both ways, of course. You could hardly pour your guest vodka all night while drinking nothing but sparkling water yourself. A spy needed many attributes, bravery, inquisitiveness, tradecraft. But as much as anything else, they needed a sturdy liver and the ability to hold their drink. It's not really to hear my delightful voice, is it? Do you have information for me, Mark? Mark, are you there? There was no reply, but she could just make out the sound of splashing water. She realised he was urinating and screwed up her nose in distaste. Holding the phone between her ear and shoulder, she took a notepad and pencil that she always kept by her bed and waited for him to finish. Where was I? He said finally. In the bathroom? 
Oh, uh, yes, excuse me, my dear. Nature calls. Do you have information for me, Mark? I certainly do. Is it safe for you to talk? I checked into a hotel room for that precise purpose. I've been with my informant, Roman. A pause. And? Alice said, trying to keep her voice calm. Dreadful place he lives in. One of those Soviet monstrosities on the edge of Moscow. Concrete as far as the eye can see. No wonder the poor fellow wants to get blasted. He's been out of work for a year. Wife and three kids to support. Hardly room to swing the proverbial cat. Walls like cardboard. Did he know anything about Polyakov? Their old mates, my dear, went to school together. Of course, that was back in the 80s before Glasnost and Perry... Uh, Perry... He tried a few times to say the word perestroika, then gave up. He became a teacher while Polyakov went into government work. But they stayed in touch and their children are friends. Corley belched fruitily. Excuse me, he said. So, has he heard anything? I? Your informant. Has he heard anything about Polyakov? Bloody clever kids. We should tap them up for GCHQ. Of course, the Ruskies will get there first. Mark! Computer mad. Boffins, really. They're young. They drive my informant to distract them, you know. Always playing computer games on those damned Xbox contraptions. Did you know that they play with their friends online wherever they are in the world and even record their gaming sessions? Alice smiled to herself. Corley was a decent agent, but he was one of the old school and he was showing his age with his astonishment at the simplest piece of technology. She refrained from telling him that she herself had done the same thing with her friends ten years ago, hoping instead to keep him on track. Polyakov Mark? she said. Oh, sorry, my dear, sorry. So, it turns out that one of my informant's children, Sergei, has been playing online computer console games with one of Polyakov's children. Alice fell silent, and now it was Corley's turn to nudge her. My dear? How recently? Yesterday. Relief flowed through her. Alice knew Polyakov was a typical FSB hood, a bad guy who had done bad things. She wasn't fooled by the slimness of his MI6 file, and his disappearance was hardly regrettable, but she didn't feel the same about his family. Chances were they didn't know a thing about his secret activities. They certainly didn't deserve to be killed just because Polyakov had been exposed, which Alice had presumed had happened. But it sounded as if the family might, might just still be alive. How certain was your informant? He was a drunk, my dear, very drunk. Poor fellow could barely string a sentence together. Feel rather sorry for him for the way he'll feel in the morning. He chuckled. Feel rather sorry for myself, too. How certain was he, Mark? Neither certain nor uncertain, said Corley. For the first time during their conversation, Alice had the sensation that although he sounded drunk, his mental faculties were all in order. He rather mentioned it in passing, mumbled it, really. I didn't have the impression that he was trying to feed me false information. I didn't have the impression he was trying to feed me any information. It was just a drunken comment, and then we moved on. Alice's mind was moving rapidly. Mark Corley might be an un-PC old dinosaur, but this was good work. Listen to me carefully, Mark. I need you to go back to your informant's apartment. Do it first thing in the morning if you can. The kid's Xbox will be connected to an external hard drive. I need you to get that drive for me. If the kid's been recording gaming sessions with Polyakov's son, we need to hear that conversation. My dear thing, I'm a step ahead of you. What? I have the drive in front of me as we speak. Roman doesn't quite have my iron bladder. I popped into the other room and took it while he was splashing his boots. Alice smiled again. She was more certain than ever now that Corley's drunkenness was in part an act. He'd been having her on. 
You need to upload the contents of that drive for me, she said. As it happens, I have my laptop open in front of me. Uh, not for the usual reason single men in hotel rooms have their laptops open, you understand? Alice was out of bed now, pulling on her jeans. Upload it to the secure server, she said. I'll be at the office in an hour, and Mark... Yes, my dear. Good work. Great work. Thank you, my dear. I haven't forgotten about that lunch you promised me next time I'm in London. I'm looking forward to it, Alice said as she squeezed her feet into her feeler trainers, and she even half meant it. She hung up, finished getting dressed, and ordered an Uber. Chapter 8 Zero one thirty hours Eastern European time. The Hercules was heading south. They were somewhere over Lebanon, heading down to the Israel-Jordan border. It was time to get ready. Danny gave the quad bike a final once-over. Two loadies were doing the same, then headed over to Bethany. They had to communicate with gestures due to the noise. Danny fitted her tandem harness, helmet and visor. He showed her how to clip her oxygen canister to the side of her body and fit her mask with its elephant trunk oxygen tube to her face. He also showed her how to strap both their packs to her legs, then encouraged her to sit down while he prepared himself. The tandem chute was bigger than a regular one and slightly heavier. Its strapping was as thick as seat belts. He put on the pack, then clipped his suppressed C-8 assault rifle to his side, his pistol already securely holstered across his chest. He put his boxy altimeter onto his wrist. It told him they were at 27,000 feet and climbing, then strapped his GPS device next to it. He fitted and checked his own helmet, oxygen canister and mask, then looked over at the main loadie. He was holding up ten fingers, which told Danny they were ten minutes out. At the back of the aircraft, a red light appeared. Two of the other loadies were cracking loomy sticks and tying the glowing plastic tubes to the top of the quad bike. Danny moved over to Bethany and got her to stand up. He checked that the day sacks were firmly strapped to her legs, then stood behind her and clipped the tandem harness together. He noticed the familiar smell of her sweat. It smelled good. One of the loadies joined them. He pointed at the quad bike on its pallet and shouted above the noise of the engines, Automatic deployment at 3,500 feet! Danny gave a thumbs up to indicate he understood. With the help of another loady, they waddled awkwardly but carefully to the back of the plane. They stood to one side of the rails that carried the quad bike. Danny grabbed a piece of strapping on the side of the fuselage and gripped it tightly as the tailgate started to open. There was a distinct change in the atmosphere. Cold air hit the exposed parts of Danny's face. Although he knew that the next few hours were dangerous, that he was free-falling into hostile territory with a woman he couldn't trust to carry out an operation that everyone involved with would deny should it go wrong, he couldn't help but feel a thrill. If you didn't get a buzz from a halo jump, the SAS wasn't for you. The tailgate was fully open. There was no sign of the moon, but Danny could see the stars and far away and far below arteries of light on the ground. The head loady held up three fingers to indicate three minutes out. Danny waited for the red light to turn green while the other guys prepped the quad bike's pallet. He could sense that Bethany's nervousness was increasing. Her limbs were rigid and she was breathing fast. The oxygen mask amplified the sound of Danny's own breathing, which was slow and composed. It was impossible to ask Bethany if she was OK, so he squeezed her arm reassuringly. She flinched and withdrew it. Two minutes out, they edged a little closer to the tailgate, Danny still gripping the strapping. One minute out. Green light. Everything happened in a moment. The quad bike on its pallet shot along the rails and out into the sky, a tiny stabilising drogue chute stretching out behind it, flapping wildly. Danny threw himself and Bethany after it, arching his outstretched arms and legs back to ensure that they fell stably. They slid over the familiar curve of the Herc's slipstream. The deafening roar of the aircraft's engines instantly disappeared, replaced with the fierce, icy rush of wind in their ears as they accelerated towards the earth, their clothes and gear flapping madly. He needn't have worried Bethany about the risk of turning over. 
His body was arched rigidly, and they were falling face down to the earth, her legs tucked inside his. He quickly felt for his own drogue chute, which was folded into a side pouch of his rig. He grabbed it, threw it out, and immediately felt its steadying influence as they continued their acceleration towards terminal velocity. There was light everywhere. Danny could see the moon now, crescent and hanging low. Infinite stars clouded the sky. From this great height, he could see villages and towns on the ground, glowing yellow masses with arterial roots spreading in all directions. The curvature of the earth glowed faintly even in the darkness. He concentrated on the glowing loomy sticks tied to the quad bike. There they were, red and blue below them. It was not easy to judge distances in the air, but he estimated that they were separated by a constant fifty feet of altitude. He altered his body position so that they were falling a little closer to the vertical, but not so close that they would get tangled in the quad bike's parachute when the automatic deployment device activated. He checked the glowing altimeter on his wrist. The number on the display was decreasing rapidly. Twenty-five thousand. Twenty thousand. They had certainly reached their maximum rate of descent, well in excess of 120 miles per hour. The rush of air was louder, the lift of air resistance at its peak. Here, closer to the earth, Danny's field of view was smaller and diminishing. Fewer settlements, fewer towns. He had a much greater sense now that they were free-falling into a large, uninhabited expanse. The thick darkness of the desert at night. He saw spots of light here and there. Bedouin encampments, maybe. Or vehicles traversing the bare terrain. Civilian or military? Impossible to know. Either way, they were to be avoided. Directly below them, however, he saw nothing. The drop zone had been well chosen. Fifteen thousand. Ten thousand. Five thousand. Any moment now the quad bike's automatic deployment device would kick in. Four thousand. Three thousand five hundred. Suddenly he saw the quad bike's enormous chute deploy and bellow, blocking his view of the loomy sticks. He immediately deployed his own rig and sensed the rigging line shoot up above him. He felt the instant pull of deceleration. The wind noise diminished. Almost complete silence, just the gentle flapping of the spreader bar, a rectangular piece of material above him that held the rigging lines in place and stopped the chute from inflating too quickly and messily. They didn't need oxygen at this altitude. Danny reached for Bethany's mask, pulled it away, and removed his own. You okay? he said. There was no need to raise his voice. What if I said I wasn't? Her voice had a slightly wired timbre. Half thrill, half fear. You're doing great, Danny said, and instantly regretted it. I'm not a child! Danny reached for the toggle lines of their parachute, which he could use to follow the quad bike to the ground and guide them onto target. They drifted quietly. The air, so cold when they'd left the herc, grew warmer. Danny scanned the earth below, checking for threats or obstacles on the landing zone. It was a clear night, well lit by the moon, and he had a good view of the ground. He saw nothing to worry him. The quad bike made contact with the earth, and its chute started to deflate. Danny guided himself and Bethany to one side of it. When they were almost on the ground, he pulled both the toggle lines to flare the tandem chute and put them safely down. Their feet touched the ground, and he could sense Bethany's tension releasing. He immediately unclipped her from the tandem rig. She disentangled herself from the day packs round her legs and staggered forwards, plainly relieved to be on solid ground again. Danny gathered the chute. Once he had an armful of crumpled canvas, he took off his freefall rig. He opened his day pack and retrieved his collapsible entrenching tool. He unfolded it while scanning the area all around. The moon lit the terrain up well, but there was little to see. It was barren and almost featureless, hard earth with the occasional sturdy desert weed. The ground was level, giving Danny a 360 view of a couple of hundred metres into the distance. There was a shallow wadi, only a couple of metres wide and less than a metre deep, a little beyond the quad bike. He saw no vehicle marks on the ground, but that didn't mean people never came here, and Danny couldn't risk just leaving the parachutes. He would have to dig them in. Gather that chute, he told Bethany, pointing at the quad bike's rig. 
Then keep watch. Let me know if you see anything. Bethany nodded. Danny took his entrenching tool over to the wadi. The ground would be softer in the ditch, easier to excavate. He jumped inside and started to dig. It was hot, hard work. The entrenching tool could only cut into the earth inch by inch with the metronomic scraping of a gravedigger's shovel. It took a full twenty minutes for Danny to make a hole big enough to conceal both chutes while Bethany kept watch. By the time he'd stuffed them inside, he was drenched with sweat. Before filling the hole in, he jumped up out of the wadi and turned his attention to the quad bike. It was still fastened to its wooden pallet with a tangled mess of strapping. He loosened, undid and removed the straps, then carried them over to the hole and buried them. He shoveled the dislodged earth back over the stash, flattened it down with his boots and redistributed the surplus. He rejoined Bethany, took the quad bike's keys from the secure pouch, climbed on board and drove it off the pallet. What do we do with that? Bethany said, pointing at the pallet. We take it with us. Danny said, dump it somewhere else. If anybody comes across it in this location, chances are they'll start nosing around and find where I've buried the chutes. How are we going to carry it? We're not going to carry it, Danny said. You're going to carry it. He climbed off the quad bike and took the night vision gear from one of the day packs. We'll be driving blind, he told her as he fitted one of the goggles to her helmet. No headlamps. The moon's pretty bright, but we might need these. Bethany pulled the goggles over her eyes, looked around for a few seconds, then raised them and stared at Danny. They suit you, she said. Danny ignored her. He loaded the day packs onto the bike. Get on, he said. Bethany mounted the bike. Danny lifted the pallet, upended it and handed it to her, so it was positioned vertically with one edge resting on her lap. He took the driving seat again. This isn't easy to hold. Bethany complained. I guess not, Danny said. He checked the quad bike's GPS unit. It was set to night mode, so it gave off very little light. The coordinates of their destination were preset, and it gave them an estimated journey time of three hours. That meant they would hit the Roman ruins just before dawn, assuming they didn't encounter any problems on the way. They moved off slowly at first, but with increasing speed as Danny got a feel for the terrain and the level of light. The moon was sufficiently bright to cast a faint shadow from the quad bike, which trundled quietly over the rough ground. Only after they'd been going for five minutes did Danny stop and allow Bethany to discard the pallet. It broke up a little as she threw it to the ground. Danny drove off again immediately. His senses were keen. He scanned the horizon as he drove, aware of Bethany watching to the side and behind them now that she no longer had to handle the pallet. There was something strangely reassuring about her manner. Bethany was a difficult, dangerous woman, but Danny had almost forgotten what a capable operator she was, at least as capable as many of the guys back at Hereford. He respected her in a peculiar way. He drove without the aid of his NV goggles for twenty minutes, but then a bank of cloud drifted across the moon, severely limiting his vision. He lowered the goggles and viewed the world through a green haze. The envy gave him a good sense of the detail of his surroundings. Small undulations in the terrain became more distinct, and he could make out straggly patches of low brush. The use of goggles for extended periods could be tiring on the eyes, but right now it was necessary. Half an hour passed. In the distance, maybe 300 metres away, there was a road heading east-west. Danny's pre-programmed GPS route took them that way, but they had to stay clear of the road itself, dressed and tooled up like this. Danny turned right, a hundred metres before they met it, then followed the road's direction without getting any closer to it. The road was deserted, which made sense. It was a minor road leading straight to the Israeli border and into the West Bank. Any normal person wanting to travel in that direction would be safer taking a properly policed main supply route. A journey into that territory could go either way. It just depended if it was one of those days when the Arabs and Israelis were taking chunks out of each other. But deserted or not, Danny kept to the unmade desert. There might be Jordanian police vehicles in the area. There might be Hezbollah militants. There might be ordinary citizens. None of them would react well to the presence of two British operatives. Much better 
to remain unseen. Danny raised his NV goggles to relieve the strain on his eyes and allow some of his natural night vision to return. The moon was hazy but not completely obscured. There was just enough light to see by. He focused on the ground ahead. It had become slightly bumpier and required more of his attention, which was why he didn't see the threat until Bethany alerted him. Over there, she hissed. Danny brought the quad bike to a sudden halt and killed the engine. Bethany was pointing up towards the road. They had been travelling parallel to it, but now it was curving round to the south. If they continued on the same trajectory, they would hit it in about 200 metres. Danny cursed himself for his momentary lack of awareness. Pucked up by the road were several vehicles, at least three, perhaps more, hidden behind those he could see. A saloon car, two heavy trucks. There was movement of personnel around the trucks. Danny raised his night sight and surveyed the scene. Something was going down. The men moving around the vehicles, Danny counted four of them, were armed. Two had rifles. Two had something heavier. RPG launches, Danny guessed, though it was hard to be certain. Shamash covered their heads, and they were facing away from the vehicles out into the desert in Danny and Bethany's direction. They were obviously guarding whatever was in the trucks, and they had just as obviously clocked the quad bike and its two passengers. They started shouting at each other, hoarse, curt instructions in Arabic that travelled clearly across the still desert air. Danny recognised the tone of these shouts, even if he couldn't discern the words. He knew that he and Bethany were about to come under fire. He swore under his breath, twisted round, and with all the force he could muster, pushed her from the bike. Danny grabbed his C8 as she fell to the ground, leapt off the other side of the bike and crawled quickly away from it. Keep down, he shouted, pressing himself as closely as possible to the ground. Get away from the bike! Contact! The distant fizz of an RPG launch was a sound Danny knew well. Every time he'd heard it in the past, it had given him the same sensation, the bite of anticipation and fear, not knowing how or where the grenade would land or what damage its shrapnel would inflict. Tonight, the fizz triggered a specific memory. He was back in northeastern Syria, with eyes on an abandoned prison, and his team were unexpectedly under fire from a Russian ambush. For the briefest moment, he saw not the enemy before him, but a flashback of his burned and mangled unit mates, encased in coffins of twisted metal. He saw missiles hurtling through the air. He saw himself crouched in a cramped culvert as an earth-shaking fast airstrike detonated above him. He was there and not here. An explosion returned him to the present as the RPG hit the quad bike. The impact shook Danny from his moment of inattention. He felt a sour wave of self-loathing at his lack of focus. A shrapnel showered around him, and a second RPG flew towards the quad bike. His training kicked in. Instinct. Situational awareness. He didn't know who these people were, or why they had engaged him and Bethany. He didn't know if they'd been expecting them, or if they were simply in the wrong place or the wrong time, but none of that mattered. All that mattered was the fight, and right now, Danny was at the wrong end of it. That had to change. The second RPG hit the quad bike, knocking it back. As another shower of shrapnel fell, he heard the unmistakable bang of an exploding tyre. The quad bike was fucked. But it told him one thing, the enemy targets were focusing on the bike. It suggested that they couldn't see Danny and Bethany. Here, exposed and in open ground, that was their only strategic advantage. He had to make use of it, and quickly. Stay down, he told Bethany. Don't move. If you move, they'll see you. There was no response from Bethany. He couldn't see her and had no idea if she was hit. He suspected not. He knew how a person screamed when they'd been injured by hot shrapnel. Not even Bethany, cold-hearted and self-controlled as she was, would be able to suppress that kind of pain. And if she had been hit, there was nothing he could do. Priorities. He had to deal with the threat first. His C8, with its full 30-round magazine, was by his side. He placed it in front of him in the firing position. Through the sight, he could see the enemy targets, four guys artlessly standing in a line with no apparent thought for taking defensive positions. He would have to pick them off one by one and quickly before they were able to work out his position. The bad news for the four targets was that Danny Black had clocked up more hours on the range in Hereford than almost any other soldier in this precise position preparing for this precise moment. 
His weapon was also suppressed, which meant that although it was not silent, it would be difficult for the targets to identify the source of the dull knock of its retort. He rested his finger on the trigger, breathed in, and held his breath to keep his body as still as possible. Then he squeezed. He knew the shot was good the moment the empty casing ejected itself from the rifle and his shoulder absorbed the weapon's recoil. He half saw the first target crumple suddenly and heavily to the ground as he re-aimed and positioned the second target in his sight, the crosshair directly over his chest. It was one of the RPG guys. He had the launcher by his side and was scanning the desert, plainly not yet aware that his mate had been shot. Danny didn't give him time to twig what was happening. His second shot was as swift and accurate as the first. The target hit the ground. There was immediate panic now. The two remaining targets realised that events were not unfolding as they intended. They were shouting. Danny could hear their stressed voices. If they had any sense, they would run, but they were too busy yelling instructions at each other. Danny's third target was standing side on, waving his arms and rifle at his companion. His movement and position made this a more challenging shot. Danny raised the rifle just a little, so the crosshairs were aligned with the target's body. He fired and made no mistake. The fourth man ran. Danny tried to follow him with his sights, but he sprinted behind the nearest truck before Danny could release a fourth round. There was a deep silence. No movement. Danny glanced to the left. The quad bike was smouldering. There was still no sign of Bethany on the other side, nor any indication that she was all right. He didn't budge. He could feel his heart beating strong, but his pulse was slow, controlled by his regular breathing, as he turned his attention back to the vehicles. He appraised the situation. There was at least one enemy target left, but there could well be more, and he might be calling for help. The four guys had looked like they'd been guarding something or someone, Danny's money was on more personnel waiting. What would their next move be? Either they'd make a run for it, or they'd continue their attack. Stalemate wasn't an option, so Danny needed to be ready to suppress any contact from the targets. He continued to look through his rifle sight, panning the area from left to right. Truck, open ground, truck, open ground, saloon car, and then back again, saloon car, open ground, truck, open ground, truck. A minute passed. No movement. Another minute. Danny's mouth felt dry. He knew something was coming. Any moment. Now, he nearly wasn't fast enough. The target appeared from behind the middle truck just as Danny's sights had panned past him. He only saw a clip of movement on the edge of the sight. By the time he had panned back, the militant was in plain view, an RPG launcher on his shoulder ready to fire. From the angle at which he was standing, Danny knew the target was not now aiming at the quad bike, but at him. He released three rounds in quick succession, the first missed, striking the side of the truck. The second hit its mark. As the target crumpled uselessly to the ground, the third round flew over his head and into the desert beyond. Silence again. Stillness. And then, seemingly from nowhere, more movement and noise. Two of the vehicles pulled away, the saloon car and the truck that had remained untouched by Danny's ammo. Danny followed the vehicles with his weapon, but let them go. Shooting out their tyres meant prolonging the contact. He'd kept the upper hand so far, but firefights, when you were as heavily outnumbered as this, were unpredictable. Much better for him if the remaining targets got the hell out of here. The distant sound of the vehicle's screaming engines faded. The vehicles themselves disappeared along the road. Danny lay still for a further two minutes. He could see one truck and four corpses, but it would be a mistake to assume the threat had disappeared. There could still be targets behind or inside the truck. You OK? he called to Bethany. Just lying here enjoying the show? No injuries. I'm OK, all right. Who the hell were those people? Your guess is as good as mine. They weren't pros. My guess is we stumbled over some sort of deal. Drugs, maybe. He glanced at the quad bike again. One tyre was smoking, but that wasn't the full extent of the damage. The bodywork at the front was gnarled and twisted, and the whole thing was leaning to one side in a way that suggested a broken axle. The bike's fucked, he said. We're going to need another vehicle. Only one vehicle that I can see, Bethany said. Danny examined the distant truck. There was no option. If their journey was to progress, he would have to approach it at some point. Stay where you are, he said. 
I'm going to wrecky the truck. A pause. Be careful, Danny, Bethany said. She had momentarily lost the edge in her voice. Stay where you are until I give you a signal. He got up in two movements, firstly onto one knee, weapon still engaged and pointing at the truck. He flicked his weapon to the automatic setting. Then a minute later, when there was still no sign of enemy personnel, he got to his feet. The truck was two hundred metres away. He advanced, the butt of his weapon pressed hard into his shoulder, his finger resting lightly on the trigger. His boots crunched on the hard earth as he advanced, ready to fire at the slightest hint of a threat. Distance to target 150 metres, no sign of enemy personnel. 100 metres, 75. The attack, when it came, was sudden. A figure appeared at the front of the truck, head wrapped in a shamach, an ostentatious bandolier of ammo slung round his chest. He appeared crazed, screaming some kind of war cry, which served no other purpose than to alert Danny to his position. It only took a short burst of three rounds to silence him. His body was thrown back against the truck, then it slid to the ground. Even from this distance, Danny could see the dark swab of blood he left on the bodywork. He knelt down again in the firing position, waited a minute, then continued his advance. There was no further contact. As Danny reached the truck, he circled it, searching for enemy personnel. Nobody was left alive. He checked in the cab, under the body, and finally placed himself in front of the back doors. He lowered his rifle, pulled his handgun, and with his free hand opened the back of the truck. It was stuffed full of weapons. Serious weapons, assault rifles with underslung grenade launchers, sniper rifles, RPG launchers and wooden crates full of warheads, claymore mines, plastic explosives, detonators, coils of wire, boxes of ammunition. They hadn't stumbled on a drugs deal, they'd stumbled on a weapons deal. If the guys involved had had more tactical nows, they might have realised that they had enough gear here to take out an entire squadron, let alone a solitary SAS man and an unarmed former spook. He closed the truck up and checked the ignition. No keys. They had to be here somewhere. He approached the body of his final target. The man was lying at a gruesome angle by the front wheel, and the three rounds from Danny's burst had made a real mess of him. They had torn open his thoracic cavity. His chest still oozed blood and fragments of rib and lung poked through the tears in his clothes. Danny's hands became bloodied and sticky as he patted his victim down, searching for the keys that he finally found in a back trouser pocket. He took them, then jogged back to Bethany and the wrecked quad bike. She stood up as he approached. Danny raised his NV goggles so he could see her properly. All clear? she asked with the strained inflection of a stressed person trying to sound calm. Danny nodded. Enough weapons in that truck to sink a battleship. Smugglers? she said. Probably. Bethany looked over at the vehicle. Probably Jordanian criminals selling weapons to West Bank Palestinians, she said. We know it goes on. She frowned, clearly aware that she'd just inadvertently put herself back in the role of an active MI6 officer. I, I, I mean, I know what you mean. He nodded at the quad bike. We have to deal with this. What do you mean, deal with it? It's a British quad bike covered with our DNA. Nowhere to hide it. If the Jordanian authorities come across it, they'll start asking questions. So, what do we do? Burn it. Stand back. Danny unloaded all their gear from the quad bike, removed the GPS unit, and set it all in a pile 15 metres from the bike itself. Then he located the quad bike's fuel line, detached it, and allowed fuel to spill over the chassis and onto the ground. He located a stash of waterproof matches in his day pack, lit one, and threw it onto the fuel. It ignited immediately. He hurried back to where Bethany was standing and waited for the explosion of the fuel tank. It happened within seconds, and before a minute was out, the entire bike was alight, flames licking high and a plume of black, greasy smoke pumping into the desert night. Fetch your gear, Danny said. That fire's going to be visible from a distance. We need to get out of here. They grabbed their stuff, slung their day packs over their shoulders, and ran back up to the truck. Bethany stared at the corpses as they passed. There was a blankness to her expression that chilled Danny. She showed no sign of being disturbed by the sight. She'd seen worse. She'd done worse. 
That was why she was here in the first place. Israeli plates, Bethany said, pointing at the truck. They climbed up into the truck. It was old and dirty and stank of fuel. Danny placed the GPS unit on the dashboard and familiarised himself with the vehicle. The gear stick was stiff, hard to manoeuvre, but when Danny put the keys in the ignition, the engine turned over easily. Bethany looked out at the window, staring at the bodies again. "'You've killed a lot of men, Danny,' she said. "'That makes two of us.' "'When do you stop counting?' she asked. "'The trick is not to start in the first place.' She turned to face him. "'I was going to stop,' she said. "'For my son's sake, I promised myself no more. "'But here I am.' Danny shrugged. He didn't want her to see that the catch in her voice had triggered something like sympathy in him. "'Turns out it becomes a habit,' he said. "'As long as you limit it to the bad guys, you can rest easy at night.' "'And this general you all want me to deal with, he's one of the bad guys?' "'One of the worst.' For the second time in half an hour, he remembered the ambush in Syria and his dead mates. "'Will they look after him?' "'What do you mean?' Danny was confused. "'My boy! He's the only reason I'm giving you the time of day, you know. Will they look after him? Is he OK?' Danny couldn't bring himself to look her in the eye. He knocked the vehicle into first gear. "'He'll be fine. You'll see him again in a couple of days. He'll have forgotten about all this before you know it.' Kids are like that. It wasn't true, of course. In a couple of days, Bethany would be dead. She was one of the bad guys, and her son. Danny told himself that wasn't his problem. We need to stay off the road. The smugglers will want their gear, and if anybody stops us with half a ton of heavy weaponry, it's going to take some explaining. He released the clutch, and the vehicle rolled off the road and back onto the desert terrain. The quad bike was still burning and smouldering. He turned away from it, following the directions given him by the GPS. "'He talks about you, you know?' "'Who?' Danny said, even though he knew exactly what she meant. "'Danny, my son, you made an impression.' They drove in silence for a few seconds. "'Don't worry,' she said. "'I'm not about to suggest a cosy reunion.' "'Good.' He checked the GPS again. We should be at the RV point in about an hour. The Roman ruins? Right. Dawn is at ten minutes past five, but I want to make sure we're early. I prefer to see our contact arrive than the other way round, so I need to concentrate. Concentrate away? Bethany looked out of her window and fell silent. Danny killed the vehicle's lights, flicked down his NV goggles and drove. Chapter 9. London, 0100 Hours GMT The MI6 building was different at night. Alternative faces and a quieter atmosphere. Alice attracted some curious glances at security, dressed in casual clothes and shiny white feelers. She looked even less the typical MI6 employee than usual. She made her impatient way through security and hurried not to the fourth floor, but to the basement. Alice did not often venture to the sunless depths of the building. There were areas here for which she didn't have clearance, but this was also where the techies lived, where the huge cluster of comm satellites atop the building sent their incoming messages from around the world, where the secure servers were located. It was to this part of the basement that she headed. There were further security checks before she could gain access, a biometric iris scanner, a fingerprint check. All was good, and she entered the techie's lair. It was gloomy in here. The only light came from laptops and a few large screens on the far wall. There were perhaps 15 people working down here, all men, all under 25. They wore single-ear headsets, and there was a constant clickety-clack of fingers on keyboards. Alice strode up to the nearest techie. He had a hipster beard and a black polo neck, and he pretended not to notice Alice approaching. Alice had no time for such games. She didn't humour him with a polite clearing of the throat or a diffident excuse me. I need access to files that have been uploaded from an agent in Moscow, she said. The techie held up one finger and continued to type for twenty seconds 
before turning on his swivel seat and finally acknowledging her. Alice was used to the barely perceptible look of surprise when people saw her for the first time, and she recognised it now. The techie's demeanour visibly softened. He gently stroked his beard. Alice recognised that gesture too. If they were in a bar, the techie would start hitting on her about now. Here at work, he wouldn't dare. He wasn't of the old school like Mark Corley. Say again, he said. Alice repeated her request, even though she knew he'd heard every word of it. What's your assets identification code? the techie asked. Alice recited it. The techie did his thing at the keyboard. Here it is, he said. He frowned. Are these from a games console? Xbox, Alice said. I need to know if there's any audio files we can extract. It was always the same with the techies. They pretended to be so laid back, but as soon as you gave them a problem to solve, their inner geek presented itself. Alice watched his expression change from the self-confidence of a man who knew this wouldn't be a problem to the anxiety of a man who had encountered an unexpected difficulty to the satisfaction of a man who'd cracked it. Just the uh, audio files, he asked after a couple of minutes' work. For now... The techie took a new memory stick from his desk drawer, inserted it into his computer and transferred the file. Then he handed the memory stick to Alice and stroked his beard again. Anything else? he asked. Alice shook her head, rewarded him with a smile for his usefulness, then left the basement and headed back up to her tiny office. There were no trains passing outside her window at this hour, but there were several workmen on the tracks with high-vis jackets and head torches. Alice paid them little attention as she inserted the memory card into her computer and opened up the audio files. There were about thirty, but the metadata told her that only five had been recorded since Polyakov's disappearance, so she decided to focus on those. She moved the file icons to a separate part of her desktop, plugged in some headphones, took out a pencil and notepad, and clicked on the first of the five. The recording was obviously of a Call of Duty-type game, and the first sound she heard was the loud drilling of a computer-generated automatic weapon and the over-the-top screams of computer-generated death. She reduced the volume and listened to a good two minutes of gameplay before she heard any human dialogue. There were two boys, their unbroken voices teetering on the edge of adolescence. Their conversation was in Russian, of course, but that was no problem for Alice. At first, she heard little more than monosyllabic grunts or the occasional whoop of delight when an on-screen enemy was killed. But gradually, the conversation became more varied, if no more interesting. Comments about homework left undone or female classmates unkissed. There was one dominant voice on the first recording, and that was clearly the informant's son, the owner of the Xbox. She knew this because the second voice constantly referred to him as Sergei. After seven or eight minutes, Sergei referred to his friend as Alexander. This was not Polyakov's son, whose name was Ivan. Alice killed the recording and opened the next file. To her surprise, Sergei was talking to a girl called Masha. Recording three was more interesting. The metadata on the file told Alice that it had been recorded three days ago, and she knew within seconds that Sergei's gaming partner was named Ivan because he shouted his name as a massive explosion from the game resonated in her ears. Ivan, you bastard! Alice scribbled her translation of the Russian on her notepad. Her brow was furrowed with concentration, and she squinted slightly as she listened hard. For several minutes, there was nothing but gameplay. Then both boys shouted as there was another explosion. The gameplay fell silent. When are you coming back to school? I don't know. Are you on holiday? Not exactly. Do you want another game? OK. The violent noise of the gameplay started up again. The kids' conversation reverted to grunts and the occasional expletive. When it was over, they said a curt goodbye. End of recording. None of the remaining recordings featured the voice of Ivan Polyakov. Alice was disappointed. It was gone three in the morning now, and what she had thought would be a very substantial lead had turned out to be less fruitful than she'd hoped. She removed her headphones, rubbed her tired eyes, and looked back at the notepad. 
The fragment of conversation between the two boys yielded nothing other than proof that Ivan had been alive three days ago and was staying somewhere with an internet connection and an Xbox. She considered her next move. Maybe they could access the Microsoft service, find out the IP address of Ivan's console. Worth a try, but her gut told her it wouldn't lead anywhere. These kids, especially the Russian ones, were smart enough to keep their devices behind a VPN. Maybe GCHQ could do something with the hard drive, but she wasn't hopeful. She put the headphones back on and started up the recording of the two boys again, scrubbing forwards to the fragments of conversation. She replayed it several times, not quite certain what she was listening out for. Whatever it was, she didn't hear it. After listening to the fragment for the fourth time, she let the recording continue playing as she stared at the workmen on the railway track below. The Call of Duty explosions continued. In the distance, very faint, yet just discernible despite their headphones, she heard the distinctive sound of Big Ben striking the hour. She blinked and looked at her watch. It was 0327, and she had never, never heard Big Ben from her office. She hadn't heard it in real time. She'd heard it on the recording. She scrubbed back. The chimes had happened just after a particularly long burst of computer-generated fire and a howl of frustration from one of the boys. It was faint and distant, and the second half of the peals was drowned out by more game noise, but it was unmistakable, and it meant Alice had a lead. Three days ago, Ivan Polyakov had been in London. Had his father, Dmitri, been with him? Alice didn't know, but she was determined to find out. And to do that... She needed some more help from the techies. Hamoud's wife, Rabia, routinely returned home at 8pm. The final two hours of waiting for her were always the slowest. The kids were watching Nickelodeon. Hamoud would ordinarily pretend to himself and to the children that he was busy, folding and refolding clothes left on the floor, preparing food for a frugal meal that he knew Rabia would finish cooking when she got back, shooing him from the kitchen. Sometimes he would panic that she wasn't coming back, that she had met someone else, that she had grown tired of his constant anxiety. He knew it was paranoia, and he knew paranoia was a symptom of everything he had experienced at Guantanamo. But sometimes those paranoid thoughts multiplied in his mind and he wasn't able to control them. It was a disease. Tonight, however, he sat at the table while SpongeBob SquarePants played in the background. He constantly swiped his phone to refresh the page that indicated Rabia's location with a little blue dot. She had left her final cleaning job three blocks away and was making her way home. Hamoud was impatient for her to walk through the door. Impatient and nervous. He hadn't told the kids about Walt Disney World. He hadn't the heart to raise their hopes when he wasn't certain that Rabia would agree to the trip. There were, now he thought about it, many reasons not to. They would lose several days' income for a start. There was no sick pay for domestic cleaners. His wife never missed a day's work, no matter how unwell she was. And it would mean removing the children from school. She was very strict about that. She wanted her children to have the benefit of a proper education and not end up like their parents. And perhaps the biggest obstacle was her pride. She didn't want to rely on anybody else's charity. They were not victims. She often used those precise words, glossing over the inescapable truth that Hamoud was, or at least once had been, exactly that. He put his phone down when he knew she was close and busied himself in the kitchen. A couple of minutes later, the door clicked open and Melissa ran to greet her mother. It was as if a champagne cork had been pulled from a bottle. She started babbling about her lessons, her friends and what had happened in the schoolyard. Malik quietly joined her and even offered a few quiet observations about his day. Rabia enveloped them in her arms, laughing at their jokes and commiserating with their tiny problems at just the right moments. Only when they had finished talking to her and drifted back to the TV did she approach Hamoud, smile warmly, place one hand on his cheek and say, ''And how are you, my love?'' Ordinarily, it was the most difficult question of the day, because how could he tell her the truth? 
How could he tell her that all day he had been counting the seconds of his solitude, wrestling with the memories and dark thoughts that swirled in his mind? How could he tell her that today had been worse than yesterday, which had been worse than the day before? He had heard it said that a problem shared was a problem halved, but not for him. To share his problems would be to infect others with his negative thoughts. He could not do that to Rabia when she was so kind and worked so hard. So he would always reply with the same words, Today was better. And she would smile and nod and go to the kitchen. This evening, however, he said, Today was interesting. Rabia raised an eyebrow. How so? she asked. He tried to scratch his palms, but she gently stopped him. How so? she repeated. He told her about the letter, about the call, how they'd won a prize, and if they wanted to, they could take the children to Walt Disney World. He didn't tell her about the peculiar way the letter had been delivered. He knew she would find that suspicious. When he had finished explaining it all, he took Rabia's hand. I know it means taking some time away from your work, he said, and uh, removing the children from school for a few days. But we could hold back some of the spending money to cover what you don't earn, and when will we ever have this chance again? Are you sure it is genuine? she said. I spoke to the lady. She was very kind. The tickets will arrive in the morning. She nodded her head slowly. For a moment, Hamoud thought the crease on her forehead meant she was going to say no. But then she smiled. We deserve some good luck, she said. Heaven knows we haven't had much of it. Her eyes shone. We'll go. I'll call my clients and I'm sure the school will understand. For the first time in years, Hamoud felt light. He had something to look forward to, not just the relentless march of the days. You tell him. Rabia said, nodding towards the children who were still transfixed by Spongebob. Hamoud nodded gratefully. He released his hands from hers and went over to the kids. Children, he said, turn off the TV. I have something to tell you. And once he had told them, he was certain that he would never, until the day he died, forget the look on their faces. There were more CCTV cameras in London than anywhere else in Europe, or so they said. Alice didn't know if it was true, but she knew this. If the security services had a picture of your face and they wanted to track your movements in London, they had a good chance of finding you quickly. It was becoming a common strategy. The lawyers were increasingly queasy about phone taps and the resources to track targets in person were desperately limited, but there was a vast network of surveillance cameras and the advances in facial recognition technology meant the computers could do most of the heavy lifting. Of course, it also meant that the techies in the facial recognition department were permanently overworked, and they liked you to know it. Alice prepared herself to break through a brick wall as she returned to the basement with a photograph of Dmitry Polyakov. She swiped herself through to the correct department and found herself in another room, dominated by computer screens, laptops and the low hum of fans and electronics. A woman approached. She was about Alice's age, with pale freckly skin, red hair and black-rimmed glasses. "'You need something?' she asked. Alice nodded and handed over the photograph. "'I think this guy's in London. I've no other leads. Can you help me out?' The woman glanced at the photo. We're running quite a few checks at the moment, she started to say. I'm not sure how quickly we can do it. Alice had a choice. She could invoke her superiors, explain that her instructions came from the top, and hint that if she didn't get what she wanted, it might be all the worse for this woman and her department. Or she could take the more effective path. In situations like this, she had learned a little girl power went a long way. She glanced over her shoulder as though worried someone might be listening or approaching. Do me a favour, she said as appealingly as she could. I've got this bloody man in the department always putting me down. If I could ID this suspect before he hauls his arse out of bed in the morning, it would just put me a step ahead of him. She flashed her a smile. 
The woman's demeanour softened. She gave the photograph a more detailed look. Come on, she said. Let's see what we can do. Chapter 10 Hereford's target pack had included satellite imagery of the old Roman ruins. There was enough weaponry in the back of this smuggler's truck to mount a small siege. Hooking up with a local fixer ought to be routine, but he was on edge. The flashbacks he'd experienced earlier in the night had stayed with him. As he drove the truck towards the RV with the benefit of his night vision goggles, he couldn't help noticing the similarities with the Zero 22 up. This, too, was a covert nighttime approach on a supposedly friendly target. As a regiment man, Danny had learned to treat all operational situations with a degree of uncertainty. He had reason to be more uncertain than usual, with an unpredictable Bethany White sitting next to him, driving a vehicle that the fixer wasn't expecting. An hour had passed since the contact with the smugglers. They had driven in silence. This truck was less suited to the terrain they were crossing than the quad bike. Danny drove slowly and with extra care. He winced each time a wheel hit an unexpected dip and the weaponry in the back of the truck shook noisily. But they crossed 25 miles of desert with no further incident and now were close to their destination. Danny stopped the truck, took his rifle and night sight and stepped outside to scan the area. The word ruins was definitely apt. There was barely anything to see here. Through his sight, he picked out some stones protruding from the ground in regular patterns about 300 metres away and an old stone wall. This was no tourist site. There was a narrow road, little more than a track, leading from the far side. To Danny's two o'clock, there was a copse of cypress trees, atypical for the terrain. Danny figured there must be some kind of underground water source. If they poked around the ruins, they'd probably find an old well somewhere. He guessed that the copse was where the fixer planned to hide their quad bike. It was just about the only place Danny had seen for the last hour that offered enough cover to hide a vehicle. Hopefully they'd be able to hide the truck there. Time check, zero for twenty hours. Dawn, the time of the RV, was at zero five ten. This was open ground. There was very little cover. Danny drove the truck round the ruins and parked on the far side of the copse from the road, hidden from anybody approaching. He removed and stowed the GPS unit, took the keys and buried them at the foot of a tree with a distinctive knot on the trunk. Come with me, he told Bethany. They entered the copse together and headed through the trees to the other side. They could see the road from here. Danny knelt behind the tree line. Bethany took her position next to him. They waited. The desert was silent, just the whisper of leaves in a faint, cold wind. Danny kept his eyes on the road. He could feel Bethany looking at him and sensed that she wanted to say something. Danny didn't yield. His instruction to deal with her when the op was over was weighing heavily. He would do it, but he was only human. The more time he spent with someone, the greater the connection he felt. Headlamps appeared at 0500 exactly. Two sets. The temperature had suddenly dropped and the sky had started to lighten, though there was no sign of the sun yet. Danny was breathing clouds of condensation. He raised his weapon and followed the lead vehicle with the barrel as the two cars drew closer and stopped. Distance, 50 metres. Both driver's doors opened. Two figures appeared silhouetted by the headlamps. One of them stood in front of the car, blocking the left light. The other stepped towards the cops. Hello, he called. Salam. Danny and Bethany stood. Danny flicked a switch and the red dot of a laser sight appeared on the man's chest. The man noticed immediately and quickly put his hands in the air. Keep them there, Danny called. And your friend too. The man shouted something in Arabic. The guy by the car quickly raised his hands. The two men stood statue still. Danny kept the laser sight on his guy's chest. He let thirty seconds pass. He could see that they were dressed in regular Arabic garb, plain white dishdasher and sandals. They had full beards but looked young, maybe early twenties. Follow me, Danny told Bethany, and do exactly as I say. If they sense any tension between us, it gives them the upper hand. 
So you really don't trust them? I was only expecting one guy, and anyway, they're fixers. They work for whoever pays them. If someone's paying them more than us, guess where their loyalties lie. They emerged from the tree line, Danny with his weapon still raised, Bethany walking to one side and a little behind. As they approached the two men, Danny saw that they were younger than he'd first imagined, barely into their twenties. One of them had a chunky gold bracelet, the other an expensive watch. There was something about their wary yet arrogant demeanour that he didn't like. He and Bethany stopped five metres from where they stood. Without lowering his weapon or looking away from his guy, Danny spoke. "'Search them,' he said. Bethany stepped forwards and started to pat down the first guy. His outrage was clear on his face even before he complained. "'What is this? Why is a woman touching me like this? "'Trust me,' said Danny. "'She doesn't like you in that way.' Bethany turned, holding up a pistol she had found on his person. "'Anything else?' Danny said. "'Nothing?' You sure? Bethany gave him a do you want to do this look, but kept quiet. Do his friend, Danny said. The second guy had no weapon. Danny lowered his. OK, he said. Which is ours? The fixer pointed to the lead vehicle. The keys are in the car, sir, he said. He licked his lips and looked around. We were told there would be a quad bike. Change of plan, Danny said. He stepped up to the fixer. There's a truck behind those trees. When we leave here, you're going to be tempted to open it up and see what's inside. It's booby-trapped. You know what that means? The fixer nodded. Good. Don't touch that truck. If you do... He made an explosion gesture with two hands. And if it's not here when we come back in a day or two, you don't get your money. Is there anything about that that you don't understand? The fixer shook his head. May I please have my gun back, sir? He said. Danny gave him a withering look. He turned to Bethany. Get in the car, he said. They jogged over to the vehicle together. It was a beaten up Passat, covered in red dust, and with several dents in the panelwork. That suited Danny just fine. It was the kind of car nobody would look at twice. He stowed his rifle in the boot and took the wheel. With Bethany beside him in the passenger seat, he turned a full 180 and drove around the other vehicle away from the ruins. When he'd gone 20 metres, he held the fixer's pistol out of the window, brandished it for a moment to be sure it could be seen, then dropped it in the sand. "'You think they're going to stay away from the truck?' Bethany said. "'Probably,' Danny said. But other people might come nosing around. We need to be sure we have another way of getting back to the pickup point if we need it. He kept his eyes on the road as he spoke, carefully avoiding Bethany's gaze. An image flashed in his mind. He was standing over Bethany somewhere in the Jordanian desert. Bethany was on her knees, a gun to her head. He wondered if she suspected what was waiting for her. Danny had no need for the GPS unit for this part of the journey. The road headed east towards the rising sun. He knew that Aman lay in this direction, and within fifteen minutes they found themselves on a well-maintained main supply route, busy with early morning traffic. Large road signs in Arabic hung overhead, and the desert surroundings gradually became more urban. Warehouses on the outskirts of town, mosques and grim-looking tenement blocks. In many ways, it could have been any city in the world. He switched back on the GPS unit and set it to direct them to the preloaded destination. A couple of clicks further down the road, the GPS directed them off to the left. They followed a winding, maze-like route through a busy, run-down suburb. It was only just gone zero six hundred hours, and already the temperature was rising uncomfortably. The vehicle's paltry aircon did not so much keep them cool as recirculate the choking traffic fumes from outside. The roads were filled with the beeping of car horns. Danny, already sweating, drove soberly. He ignored the occasional raised fist from impatient Jordanians. His objective was to get to their safe house without incident, not to demonstrate to the drivers of a man what a big guy he was. The GPS led them to a squat four-storey concrete block that wouldn't have been out of place in the scummiest parts of Croydon. 
Its exterior walls were festooned with old air conditioning units and lines of washing. There was an open basement car park. Danny reversed the vehicle into a space directly opposite the exit, ready to get out of there quickly if necessary. A few guys in traditional Arabic clothes were getting into their own cars, presumably on the way to work. Danny let them leave before he and Bethany exited the vehicle. The fewer people that saw them, the better. Danny knew from his target pack that the safe house was apartment number 312 on the third floor. There was a lift from the basement, but he had no desire to put himself in an enclosed space with no exit. They took the stairs. A couple of curious kids playing cards on the ground watched them walk from the stairwell along the third floor corridor. But by the time Danny and Bethany were outside their apartment, the kids had gone. Danny tried the door. It was unlocked. They stepped inside. Danny was not expecting luxury. They didn't get it. The four rooms of the apartment were equally grim. The bare concrete floors were peppered with rodent droppings. The kitchen and bathroom had different but similarly foul stenches. The bedroom contained a double bed with a stained old mattress and no bedclothes. There was no furniture in the main room, where a dirty window looked out from the tower block towards the hilly urban sprawl of Amman, undulating under the blue morning sky. The city was a ramshackle, chaotic place, the sort of place you could easily lose yourself. Danny's sort of place. There was a key in the front door. Danny locked it from the inside and put the key in his pocket. "'You want me all to yourself, is that it?' Bethany said. Danny ignored the comment and pushed past her into the bedroom. There were two suitcases in here. He hauled them onto the bed and opened them up. Inside were sets of smart clothes for each of them, a navy suit, white shirt and shiny brown shoes for Danny, a black knee-length skirt, jacket and cream blouse for Bethany, and a bag of makeup. There was a brown envelope containing British passports with Danny and Bethany's photographs, but the names of Andy Waldron and Sophia Milton... Two press passes held the same photos and names, Danny's accredited to the Sunday Times, Bethany's to the Telegraph. A second brown envelope contained a sheaf of Jordanian dinars. There were two shoulder bags, a small leather handbag with detailing on the clasp and a larger black man bag. Each contained a blank A5 journalist's notepad and a few rollerball pens, along with a local mobile phone, the number stuck on the back. Danny had his own encrypted mobile, so he'd have no use for it, but he memorised the number on the back of Bethany's and took a moment to write his number on a piece of paper and hand it to her. She read it once, committed it to memory, and screwed up the paper. He wondered who had delivered all this to the safe house. An MI6 agent attached to the British Embassy, he presumed. He didn't much like the idea of the local spotting an obviously Western person carrying these suitcases up to the flat. He hoped they'd been discreet, and he double-checked that the door was locked before returning to the bedroom where Bethany was waiting for him. "'Not going to lie,' she said. "'I'm quite looking forward to seeing you in a suit.' Yet again, Danny found himself resisting her flirtation. A tendril of hair had fallen over her face in an appealing way. He wanted to brush it back over her ear. He forced himself to think about something else. "'We need to talk,' he said. Oh, yeah? We're going to the General's Hotel this evening. I need to know how you're going to do it. She cocked her head. How are you going to do it? He repeated. We won't be able to take weapons into the hotel. It's not as simple as a bullet in the head. You need a plan. Bethany didn't reply immediately. She walked over to the window, where she looked out over Aman while tracing a shape on the glass with her forefinger. I'll... Improvise, she said. Not good enough, Danny told her. And when she didn't reply again, he strode over to where she was standing, grabbed her by the shoulder and roughly turned her round to face him. He was surprised to see that tears were welling in her eyes. You think I'm a monster, she said. You think I spend my time working out inventive ways to kill people. You've got form, and so do you. But there's more to you than that, and there's more to me too. The men I killed, I killed for a reason. We're killing this man for a reason too, so how are you going to do it? He's highly trained. 
Bethany gave him a rueful smile and shook her head. She dabbed at her eyes with the same forefinger she'd been tracing on the window and walked over to the bed. Once a man has his clothes off, she said, you can do anything. You think you're so damn powerful in the bedroom. You're not. You're putty in the hands of a woman who knows what she's doing. We're talking about a five-star American general here. Don't underestimate him. I'm not underestimating anybody. But trust me, once a guy thinks it's on, he's a child again. I don't care who he is. If I can get him to take me to his room, it's a done deal. I don't need much, a pen, a razor blade, whatever comes to hand. His room might be guarded. You'll need to keep him quiet while you do it. Trust me, he won't make a peep. She pointed at the bed. I'm going to get some sleep. If I'm going to be all the general's dreams come true, I don't want bags under me eyes. You can stay or go. It's up to you. Danny left her in the bedroom, taking his press accreditation and passport. He returned to the front door, sat opposite it with his back against the wall and his handgun on the floor beside him. He opened up the passport and committed the counterfeit Andy Waldron's place and date of birth to memory. He calculated that Waldron would be 34. He put the documentation to one side. He barely wanted to admit it to himself, but Bethany's tears had affected him. He found himself wanting to comfort her. Maybe more. He did his best to put that thought from his mind as he closed his eyes and prepared to wait out the day. Alice's lack of sleep was catching up on her. The basement was warm from all the computer equipment which gave off a hypnotic whir. Her eyelids were heavy and she had to keep shaking herself awake. The young woman who had agreed to help had introduced herself as Karen. She sat by Alice's side at a workstation. Three curved monitors, a keyboard, a trackpad and a fingerprint scanner. The screens displayed a flickering succession of images. They changed so quickly that Alice couldn't identify any of them individually. Rather, she had a sense of a jumble of generic types of pictures, individuals standing at a zebra crossing, or queuing in a coffee shop, or stepping out of a bus, a bewildering blur of young and old, male and female, black and white. After scanning in Alice's picture of Polyakov, Karen had sat and stared at these screens for at least two hours, as if her brain was processing the tens of thousands of CCTV images that the systems were checking. Alice could see the flickering pictures reflecting in her glasses, which somehow made the whole experience more disorientating. Every twenty minutes or so, the pictures would stop, and Karen's fingers would fly over the keyboard. The first time this happened, she'd explained that she was changing to a new CCTV zone, but now they sat in silence as she went about her work, and Alice grew sleepier and sleepier. Her chin was on her chest when Karen's voice jolted her awake. "'I'm sorry, it doesn't look like we have any matches. We can set an alert, if you like. If your guy turns up, we'll let you know.' Alice found it hard to conceal her disappointment. "'Are you sure you tried everything?' She said, it's really important I find this guy soon. She knew instantly that Karen was holding something back. It was the tightness around the eyes, the hesitation. Please, Karen, she said, I know he's been in London. If there's anything you can do. There are some other CCTV databases, Karen said. We are not really supposed to access them without prior authorization. The lawyers get antsy. Alice was wide awake now. Please, she repeated, I promise I'll get you any authorization you need, but the sooner I get a lead... Karen bit her lower lip, then nodded. She turned back to her screen and started typing again. The blur of images reappeared. The two women stared expectantly at the screen. Five minutes passed, ten minutes. And then the blur stopped. A single image filled the screen. Alice felt her stomach lurch. It was him, Polyakov. Even though the CCTV image was monochrome and blurred, there was no doubt. It looked like he had just entered a building through a revolving door. 
He wore a black beanie hat and a heavy coat, and there was something decidedly shifty in the way he was half looking over his shoulder, half looking up, as if searching for the camera that was filming him, but failing to see it. He had several days stubble and dark rings under his eyes. It was, in Alice's experience, the image of an anxious man in hiding. Where was this taken? Alice said. Karen brought up a table of metadata. It meant nothing to Alice, but her colleagues seemed to decipher it with ease. She launched some mapping software on one of her screens and keyed in some coordinates. The map zoomed into a location in central London. Battersea, Karen said. And then, after a few more taps of the keyboard, one of the new residential blocks at the old power station. Which one? The mansion house. The footage was taken by a camera in the reception area. When? Yesterday, 22.13 hours. Alice felt a surge of heat through her veins. Even as she'd been researching him last night, Polyakov had been active in London. Doing what? Was he planning something? Every instinct she had told her that if so, it needed to be stopped quickly. The mansion house, she repeated, her voice much calmer than her insides. Do me a favour, Karen, keep the search running. If it crops up anywhere else, let me know. There must have been something about the way she looked or spoke, because Karen's demeanour changed. She seemed more alert as Alice stood up before hurrying out of the basement and up to her office on the fourth floor. Back at her computer, it was a moment's work to access all the information on the MI6 servers pertaining to the Battersea Mansion House. There was a full set of architect's plans, a record of police call-outs to the building, and, of course, a complete list of apartment owners and residents pulled from the land registry and council tax records. It was a big tower and a long list, but Alice didn't have to scan very far down it until a particular name jumped out at her. The penthouse apartment had been bought only six months previously for a sum of 17 million by a certain Boris Rostropovich. Alice recognised the name, but couldn't quite place it. She keyed his name into the database. A photograph of an elderly Russian man appeared. His face was deeply lined, his hawkish eyes hooded. His security services biography printed below the photograph was a melting pot of Soviet KGB collusion, post-Soviet asset stripping and personal acquaintance with high-ranking members of Russian administrations past and present. He was your classic oligarch, the type that was buying up high-end property in London by the sackful. And according to the Immigration Authority records, he had entered the UK on a private Learjet into London City Airport the previous week. So far as Alice could tell, he was still in the country. Alice sat back for a moment on her office chair, staring at the screen, rereading the biog and nodding thoughtfully. She wondered what kind of influence he had that would require the need to put his building on a special CCTV database. More importantly, was it chance that an FSB agent high on MI6's wanted list had, less than 12 hours previously, been visiting with an individual whose past and present was as murky as Boris Rostropovich's? Hardly likely. She picked up Polyakov's file, flicked through it one more time, and gazed at the image of Rostropovich that stared out from her computer. Then she picked up her office phone and dialed a number. Her boss... Maxwell Stark, head of the Russian desk, was clearly still in bed. He was a mild, polite man who nevertheless couldn't quite hide his annoyance at being woken. It fell from his voice as soon as Alice said Polyakov's name. She gave him a precy of her investigations and he listened attentively. When she'd finished, there was a moment of silence. Good work, Alice. Excellent work. The sound of his voice almost made her smell peppermint. What's our next move, sir? Another silence. There's a high probability that we'll find either Polyakov or Rostropovich, or both, in the penthouse apartment of the mansion house. I agree, sir. Then we need to make a hard arrest. It's politically sensitive and Polyakov is a trained FSB agent, so we can't hand this over to the Met. No, sir. I'm going to mobilise Hereford. We need an SAS team. 
Would you be so good as to stay where you are? We're going to force entry into the penthouse today. I'm on my way in. The line went dead. Chapter 11 Four members of the SAS anti-terrorist team were already on the ground in London. Their base, a run-down flat in Victoria, the look and smell of which hadn't been improved by the presence of four military guys over the period of the last month. Their names were Bobby Hunter, Mike Cracknell, Dan Finch and Craig Knowles. Hunter was the smallest guy in the regiment, but what he lacked in height he more than made up for in toughness. He was a broad-shouldered, stocky guy with a square chin and a taste for a fight. When the call came in from Hereford at 0830 hours, of the four men in the flat, he was the only one awake. That was the standard operating procedure, one guy on stag at any given time, ready to take instructions and mobilise the unit if necessary. Hunter was making his fourth coffee of the morning, when his phone rang and the terse voice of Ray Hammond, the ops officer back at Hereford, delivered their instructions. The mansion house, Battersea Power Station. A hard arrest of two Russian suspects. We could do with more guys, boss, Hunter said. There's another team mobilising from Hereford right now. They're flying in and they'll put down in the gardens of the Honourable Artillery Company at approximately ten hundred hours. Who's on the team? Cunningham Moore Parsons Hobbs. While they're inbound, get your asses down to Battersea and put in surveillance on the apartment block. I've uploaded pictures of the two Ruskies to the secure server. If you see either of them leaving the mansion house, follow and apprehend. If not, you'll force entry into the penthouse at 1700 hours, assuming we get the go-ahead from Whitehall. Hunter gulped down the rest of his coffee and unceremoniously woke the others. They were sleeping on mattresses in the living room, holsters and personal weapons on the carpet next to them. There was a ripe male smell in the air. They grumbled at Hunter's booming voice for only a fraction of a second before they realised that he was hauling them out of bed for a good reason. And as soon as he told them the details, they rapidly started to get ready. Each guy put his personal weapon in his waist holster. They fitted their radio packs and concealed earpieces. Hunter sat squat at his laptop and downloaded the images of Boris Rostropovich and Dmitry Polyakov and distributed them to the unit's encrypted mobiles. Within ten minutes of waking, the guys were ready to go. They had two vehicles, a black Audi and a midnight blue Kia, ordinary cars to look at, but souped up and with toughened glass. Hunter and Cracknell took one, Finch and Knowles the other. The London traffic was slow. It took twenty minutes to get to Battersea Bridge and across the river. They parked up in the shadow of the old Battersea power station and put their disabled driver badges on the dashboards of their vehicles. Then they performed a recce of the mansion house. It was a shiny new building in an area still largely under construction. Cranes and scaffolding loomed tall against the grey morning sky, but at ground level many things were finished. Fresh paving and newly planted trees surrounded the office workers walking briskly past, phones to their ears or in front of their noses. None of them paid any attention to four burly men circling the apartment block, identifying exits and planning their observation points. Aside from the main entrance at the front of the apartment building, there was a goods entrance round the back and three further side entrances at irregular points around the building. It was possible for one person to keep eyes on the two side entrances of the western edge of the block. Cracknell positioned himself on a bench in the shade of a plane tree. A service road led to the goods entrance at the back, where a bus stop offered an adequate OP which Knowles occupied. Twenty metres from the entrance on the eastern side was a busy cab rank, where at any one time there were five or ten people milling around. Finch expertly lost himself in that ever-changing crowd while Hunter took the front of the apartment building. Here, a coffee shop conveniently faced the entrance. Hunter installed himself at an outside table, ordered a large Americano and watched. Hunter had set up OPs in some desperate shitholes in his time. 
His diminutive stature meant he found it easier than most to conceal himself in muddy ditches in Afghanistan, fertilised by the locals' raw sewage, in wadis in the desert, covered by hessian sacks where you sweated faster than you could get water into your system, snow holes in sub-zero temperatures, so cold you couldn't feel your extremities. As surveillance gigs went, this was a peach, a seat, a hot drink, but in a weird way, that made it more difficult. Comfort, he well knew, could make you complacent. An SAS man was trained to thrive in extreme situations. When the elements and your surroundings were against you, it sharpened the mind, made you more alert. When things were easy, you had to up your concentration, force yourself to see past the ordinary. Nobody passing the coffee shop would have looked twice at Hunter as he sat facing the mansion house, sipping his drink. Nobody would have imagined that he was making accurate note of his surroundings with an almost robotic efficiency. He clocked the face of every person exiting the building. The blonde woman in an elegant business suit carrying a burgundy briefcase. The man in his fifties with a deep tan and a V-neck golfing sweater. The teenage girl, an au pair maybe, with two kids in tow. The podgy guy in an expensive suit, smaller even than Hunter himself, accompanied by two blondes who almost certainly charged for their services. When his earpiece crackled and Knowles made a lewd comment about a woman he'd seen exiting from the back of the apartment building, I wouldn't mind seeing her good entrance. Hunter smiled inwardly, but showed no sign that he was in contact with anybody else. The first rule of surveillance, expect counter-surveillance. Hunter continued to sip his coffee and watch. An hour passed, and there was no sign of Polyakov or Ostropovich. The SAS men swapped positions, because to stay too long in one location would be a red flag for any counter-surveillance operatives. From his new position on the bench on the western side of the building, he maintained his high level of situational awareness but something told him that their targets weren't going to appear. He glanced skywards. Up close, perspective made the building dizzyingly tall. He wondered what was going on in the penthouse apartment. Who were these two Russian men Hereford was so interested in? He snapped his attention back down to the exits. His curiosity would be satisfied soon enough. In the meantime, he needed to keep his focus. He watched and waited. As Hunter and his team staked out the ground floor of the mansion house, a Dauphin II helicopter in civilian colours was already airborne from Hereford. Excluding the flight crew, four men were on board. Dennis Cunningham, Johnny Moore, Rick Parsons and Ken Hobbs. They wore civvies, and as the chopper flew over the outskirts of the capital, were studying the architectural plans of the mansion house, as well as the same images of Dmitry Polyakov and Boris Rostropovich that the ops officer had sent the London team. Service left, Cunningham shouted at the others over the noise of the chopper in his broad Scottish accent. His three unit mates nodded their agreement. The chopper set down in the grounds of the Honourable Artillery Company in East London. A transit van was waiting for them here. It was marked with the Amazon logo, but there were no packages inside. Instead, there were three CO-19 armed police officers and enough space for the SAS team and the two flight cases of gear that they carried off the chopper. The police officers, a woman and two men, had an anxious air about them. Cunningham recognised the woman from a previous job, but he couldn't remember her name. She nodded at him in recognition. "'Who's dying tonight?' she asked with a raised eyebrow. "'Depends who's been a wee scunner,' Cunningham said. "'Can't you talk in fucking English?' Parsons said, and Cunningham grinned at him. "'What's the plan?' asked one of the policemen as the doors of the van slammed shut and it started to move. "'We'll go over it once we're on sight. Cunningham told him. They drove on in silence. Danny woke suddenly. He was still crouched on the ground opposite the door to the safe house. His neck muscles ached and he was sweating. The distant sound of a call to prayer had woken him and he spent a moment listening to the weirdly tinny chant. Danny had spent so much time operating in the Middle East that it was a familiar sound. 
but not comforting. It took him back to Damascus and Oman, to Afghanistan and to Yemen. It forced him to recall moments of his life he would prefer to keep locked away. Amman was a thriving modern city, friendly, welcoming to tourists, relatively safe. He grimaced, safe. Nowhere in this part of the world was truly safe for a regiment man. Like Northern Ireland in the 80s, these countries were full of violent men who would give their lives for the opportunity to take out a member of the British SAS. He was certain that here, holed up in the grim safe house, he was a literal stone's throw from an IS or Al-Qaeda sympathiser. He couldn't relax for a minute. The call to prayer fell silent. Danny was left with only the sound of his own breathing and a new thought. His enemies were not crazed jihadists or Middle Eastern terrorist sympathisers. They were Western and Russian. It would be easy to lose track of that here in this desert city, surrounded by mosques and people whose skin colour soldiers like him had wrongly been conditioned to think of as the enemy. An American general was feeding sensitive military information to the Russians. A former MI6 officer and killer of SAS men was currently lying asleep on a stained mattress in the next room. Danny pushed himself up to his feet and quietly opened the door of the bedroom. She was still there, lying in a fetal position, her blonde hair splayed over the mattress, her breathing slow and steady, her freckles glowing in the light spilling from the window. She didn't look like an assassin. Did anybody? Danny thought about a conversation they had once had. Bethany had told him about her father, himself a former MI6 officer, whose slippery moral code had skewered her view of the world. Danny had a moment of self-doubt. Who was he to talk about slippery moral codes when he was about to make an orphan of Bethany's kid? He put that doubt out of his head where it belonged. Do your job, Danny. Leave the thinking for those on a higher pay grade. Bethany stirred. Her eyes opened, and Danny could tell that she didn't know where she was for a second. She smiled drowsily at him. Not a cynical smile or a flirtatious one, she looked genuinely glad to see him. Danny closed himself off emotionally. He knew he had to keep his distance if he was to complete this op successfully. We need to get ready, he said. She sat up and ran one hand through her hair. I'll need the shower, she said, and then looking Danny up and down. So will you. Neither of us will get close to the general looking and smelling like this. It's all yours. Danny said. He stepped back out of the bedroom and returned to his sentry position opposite the front door. He could hear voices in the corridor outside and the creaking of floorboards somewhere in the building, but they faded soon enough and now all he could hear was the sound of water against the shower curtain. The stream stopped. Bethany emerged into the hallway, body and hair wrapped in towels. All yours, she said. In the bathroom, Danny stripped and ran the water as hot as it would go. He stood under the shower and let the stinging hot torrent flood over him. He washed the grime from his scarred body and he let the water wash away his doubts as well. When he stepped out, dripping onto the bathroom floor, his head was back where he needed it to be, on the job. He wrapped a towel round his waist and walked back into the bedroom. Bethany was dressed and was adding the finishing touches to her makeup. She looked incredible in her snugly fitting skirt and jacket, an inch of heel and her mouth just slightly plump with lipstick. Nobody would ever guess that in the last 24 hours she'd been incarcerated in a grim porter cabin, haloed into the Jordanian desert and been at the sharp end of a firefight with heavily armed Palestinian smugglers. "'You're going to stand round half-naked,' she said, "'or are you going to get dressed?' She left the bedroom without waiting for a reply. Danny put on the suit that had been left for him. Normally he was a weddings and funerals only suit man. The jacket felt tight across his shoulders, and it took him three attempts to get the knot of his tie right. Bethany entered again. She looked him up and down critically. Then she shook her head. You're supposed to be a journalist, not James Bond. 
she said. Loosen your tie. Undo that top button. Fair enough, Danny thought. Her attention to detail was good, and fashion was hardly his strong point. He did as she said. She approached him, took his right hand, and undid the button on his cuff. Up close, she smelled good. Danny had to make a conscious effort not to allow her scent to put him off the rails. You scrub up okay, she said as she adjusted his collar. I'll take that as a compliment. Bethany half smiled, and Danny sensed that she was nervous. You're going to be all right, he asked. Fine, she said, once we get going. She went to look out of the window. I want to speak to my son, she said, before we leave, in case anything goes wrong. Danny hesitated. It wasn't such a big thing to ask. He had a phone. He could put a call through to Hereford and make it happen. But what would a conversation with the boy do for Bethany's state of mind? Would it focus her or upset her? Right now, she seemed to Danny to be in the zone. He didn't want anything to mess with that. They won't do it, he said. You know Sturrock. She turned and looked at him. There was a tightness around her eyes, and Danny thought, Does she know? Has she worked out that there's no way MI6 would let her live after what she was about to do for them? The tightness eased. Bethany nodded. Yeah, she said. I know Sturrock. Her voice was full of bitterness. All right, then. If we're going to do this, let's do it. She gathered up her dirty clothes and stuffed them into one of the suitcases. Danny did the same. Hamoud was spared his nightmares because sleep had been impossible. He was too excited, as excited as his children had been the night before, although he would never have admitted it. When they had finally gone to sleep, he and Rabia had fallen into bed. She slept instantly, exhausted from a hard day of cleaning other people's houses. Hamoud lay awake, staring at the ceiling, and enjoying the anticipation of their unexpected family holiday. Now it was 6 a.m., and as usual, he was up before everybody else. He had made himself a cup of weak tea and was sitting cross-legged on the floor, as he had learned to do in his empty cell at Guantanamo. The Walt Disney World brochure was open in front of him. In his mind, he once again mapped the faces of his children onto the faces of the happy kids in the brochure. It warmed him even more than the tea, and for the first time in years he felt a sense of calmness and optimism. His tranquillity was broken by footsteps in the corridor outside. A knock on the door. Hamoud scrambled over to it, spilling his tea in the process. He opened the door. There on the floor was a FedEx package. He picked it up and looked at both sides. He'd never before received anything by FedEx and was surprised that nobody had asked him to sign for it. Perhaps they'd made a mistake. He wanted to call back the delivery person, but when he looked along the corridor, there was nobody there. Paranoia was a strange, powerful affliction. One moment you could be entirely free of it. The next, it hit you with tidal force, crashing over you, taking your breath away. It was happening now. Hamoud had to grip the doorframe to counteract his dizziness. Where was the delivery person? Why couldn't he see him? He drew some deep breaths, calmed himself. Recognize this for what it is, he said. You are paranoid. You are worrying about problems that don't exist. Perhaps the delivery person hadn't waited for a signature because it was so early. He felt a little better, but the paranoia had not completely subsided. Back inside the apartment, he carefully opened the package. It was all there. Plain reservations for that afternoon, in their names, from Cincinnati to Orlando. Their hotel booking and passes for the parks. Everything in order. So why did he still feel uneasy? He moved over to the window that overlooked the front of their apartment block. With one bony finger, he parted the curtains and peered out onto the road below. He saw his reflection faintly in the window, the grey-flecked beard, the prominent scar on his eye. He looked through it. 
He was searching for a FedEx van, but there was none. The road wasn't busy this early in the morning, but on the opposite side he saw a black SUV parked up on the curb. A man was hurrying across the road, away from the apartment block towards it. When he reached the sidewalk, he stopped for a moment and looked back over his shoulder. He gazed upwards, and Hamud had the uncomfortable sensation that the man was staring directly at him. He guiltily let the curtain fall closed as an electric shock of anxiety buzzed through him. It was the same feeling that he used to get in the prison camp whenever he drew the attention of someone in authority. Hamoud didn't like to be noticed. He took several deep breaths to calm himself again. Then he returned to the bedroom, the ticket still in his hand. Rabia was half awake. When Hamoud perched on the edge of the bed, shoulders slumped, she sat up and reached out to stroke his back. "'What is it, my love?' she asked. He almost didn't say. He knew how the conversation was likely to evolve. She would say to him, I think you have PTSD. I think you should see a doctor. But he didn't want to see a doctor. He wanted to get better by himself. But he also wanted to share his concerns with his wife. He frowned at the tickets in his hand. Something's not right, he said. Why would anybody send us to Walt Disney World? We're not the sort of family this kind of thing happens to. It feels... it feels wrong. He didn't mention the lack of a FedEx van or the man by the SUV. Hamoud, said Rabia, her voice gentle and cajoling. Hamoud, you need to stop assuming that nothing good will ever happen to you. The things in your past were terrible, but they are over now. God owes us a bit of luck. Perhaps this is the beginning of a change for us. Let's just enjoy it while we can. He nodded and smiled at her as reassuringly as he could. But while she was in the shower, he found his phone and he dialed the same number he'd called when the offer had first dropped through his door. Hello, Walt Disney World, where all your dreams come true. It was the same cheerful female voice as before, it struck Hamoud as a bit odd that he should have been put through to the same operator, but he told himself that it was hardly an impossibility. He stuttered his name. I, I, I just wanted to check, uh, to check that our all-expenses-paid trip, to, to check that it's a real offer. Of course, sir. We're looking forward to welcoming you at Walt Disney World. Uh, uh, don't you need to check? Mr. Al Asmar? Uh, that's right. We're looking forward to welcoming you. May I help you with anything else today? Uh, no, Hamoud said. N no, uh, nothing else. Then you have a good day, said the voice. Music played over the line. The Mickey Mouse song, its catchy refrain spelling out his name, sung by a choir of children over and over again. A relentlessly cheerful tune but somehow menacing to Hamoud as he looked from the door to the window and heard his little ones moving around in their bedroom, the sound of his wife's shower. His palms started itching again, and he wanted to scratch them. He ended the phone call. The song died. His children ran into the room as excited as they had been before going to bed last night. They flung their arms around his neck, squealing with delight, and Hamoud didn't have the heart not to join in with them. Rabia was right, he told himself. He needed to stop assuming that nothing good would ever happen to him. This was the beginning of a change for them. He would enjoy his good luck for as long as it lasted. He would not be paranoid. Chapter 12 11.37 hours. Hunter had rotated to the rear service entrance of the mansion house. He was perched on the plastic bench of the bus stop that faced the apartment block. Rush hour was over, and there were only three other people at the bus stop all ignoring each other and staring at their phones. Hunter was watching the vehicles entering and leaving the service entrance. In particular, he was watching a transit van with the Amazon logo on both sides as it drove down into the basement parking lot. 
He stepped away from the bus stop so he wouldn't be heard by the other pedestrians, put his sleeve to his mouth and spoke over the team's radio. Cunningham and the others are here, he said. Keep your positions, I'm moving in. Hunter headed across the street. A very narrow pavement followed the road leading into the underground car park. He walked along it, carefully scanning up ahead. When a green Mercedes overtook him on its way in, he instinctively made use of the side mirrors to check nobody was following him. It was clear. The tyres of the Mercedes squeaked on the smooth floor as it drove to the far side and parked. Hunter loitered in the cover of a white Range Rover while he listened for the slamming of the Mercedes door to echo around the car park and footsteps to fade. Only then did he approach the transit van. It had parked next to a fire door with a no-entry sign. The driver, Hunter didn't recognise him, looked straight ahead without even acknowledging Hunter's presence. When Hunter reached the van, the door opened as if automatically. Dennis Cunningham appeared. There was no superfluous greeting. Building manager's name is Ravinder Singh, Cunningham said. Indian laddie knows we're coming. He should be waiting for us in reception. Hunter nodded his acknowledgement and closed the van door. He quickly crossed the car park, past the green Mercedes, towards a lift on the far side. Inside the lift, he hit the ground floor button. As the lift ascended, he found himself examining the removable panel in the roof, force of habit. He could just about reach it if he needed to. The doors pinged open, and Hunter stepped into the reception area. A large, airy, open space with comfortable sofas and enormous indoor plants, mirrors everywhere, piped music. On the opposite side, Hunter saw the revolving doors he'd been watching earlier. There were ten or twelve people here, residents, Hunter reckoned, leaving and arriving, and he immediately identified the building manager. Singh wore a black suit and tie and stood by the reception desk, nervously clutching his hands and blinking frequently. He was looking round as though searching for someone. When his gaze fell on Hunter, Hunter nodded. The manager swallowed hard, looked around again rather conspicuously, then approached. "'Are you the gentleman I'm waiting for?' he said. He was much taller than Hunter and spoke very precise English with an Indian accent. "'We need a private space where we won't be disturbed,' Hunter said. The manager was still clutching his hands. "'Follow me, please,' he said. He called the lift and took them back down to the basement. He was blinking so often that Hunter assumed he must have something in his eye, but then decided it was a nervous tick. At first he thought the manager was leading him to the transit van, but it became apparent that he was heading for the no-entry fire door to its side. He lifted the security bar, opened the door, and switched on some flickering overhead strip lights in the room beyond. The space was large but with a low ceiling. Concrete floor, breeze-block walls, and exposed piping in the roof wrapped in silver lagging. It was warm, and against one wall was some kind of boiler or heat exchange pump. Hunter didn't know which, rattling noisily. Boxes of cleaning products were piled up, along with a stash of orange traffic cones, barrels of water for dispensers, and all manner of random stores required for keeping the mansion house running. Most importantly, it was empty of personnel, and it was private. Stay here, Hunter told the manager. He returned to the transit van, checked there was nobody in the car park to view them, and knocked on the back door. The door opened, and, at a word from Cunningham, the others filed out, the regiment guys carrying their flight cases. The driver stayed where he was. The regiment team and the three police officers joined the manager in the boiler room. Hunter closed the door, while Cunningham turned to the manager. "'You've been briefed by our people.' "'In a manner of speaking, sir,' the manager said. He blinked several times and didn't appear to know whether to look at Cunningham's face or the hardware in his ops vest. "'I have to say this is most irregular. The comfort and convenience of our tenants is my... For "'You need to do exactly what we tell you. You got that.' The manager swallowed hard again and didn't answer. Cunningham stepped up to him and repeated his question at half the volume. "'You got that?' The manager nodded nervously. Watch the personnel set up on the penthouse. The manager spoke hesitantly. M Mr. R Rostropovich is in town. 
he said. He's very infrequently here, but when he is, he keeps himself to himself. He hardly leaves the apartment. Who does he have with him? Some guests, I believe. A family. He's, of course, not obliged to inform anybody whom he invites into his apartment. We are simply here to ensure... And what about security? Mr. Rostropovich takes his security arrangements extremely seriously, said the manager. There are always two gentlemen guarding the corridor outside the penthouse apartment at any one time. Armed? The manager glanced uncomfortably at the police officers. Cunningham took a step closer to him. Listen here, laddie, the more we know about what's waiting for us up there, the less chance you have of ending up like the inside of a haggis. Are they armed? The manager nodded. Mr. Rostropovich pays a small surcharge, he mumbled. Cunningham gave him a bleak smile. He slips here backhander, not to mention the guns to the police. The manager looked away. We've looked at the plans of the building. The penthouse has its own dedicated elevator, correct? Correct, sir. The manager seemed pleased that the conversation had taken a different turn. Only Mr. Rostropovich and those with whom he entrusts a key fob may use it. But the service elevator also goes to the penthouse. Yes, sir, but that is not for public use. We're not the public, Cunningham said. You have a master key to get into the penthouse itself? The manager looked reluctant to reply. A key fob, he said. It accesses all the rooms in the building. You have it on you. The manager nodded. Hand it over. The manager looked from Cunningham to the others and back again. Realising he had no option, he took a fob from his top pocket and handed it over. Sir, he said as Cunningham took the card, I must inform you that both elevators sound a brief alarm when they reach the penthouse to alert security that somebody is arriving. You understand? Aye, said Cunningham. I understand. He turned to Hunter. Your guys are still watching the exits. Yep, Hunter confirmed. Keep them there. Our targets could leave at any time. Wish the fucking would, Hunter said. Save us a job. I don't think that's likely. Cunningham pointed at one of the flight cases. Your missus told me you like a bit of role play. There's a couple of BT engineer uniforms in there. Get one of them on. He looked over at Parsons. You too, he said. Hunter didn't much like the way Cunningham was curtly taking charge, but he knew better than to make a meal of it right now. He opened the flight case. It didn't only contain BT uniforms. There was a canvas bag containing engineering equipment, a thick wadge of sturdy cable ties, three assault rifles nestled at the bottom of the case, and several cardboard packs of ammo. The manager's eyes widened when he saw the weaponry. Cunningham, Hobbs and Moore each took a weapon. Hunter took out the uniforms and handed the larger of the two to Parsons. Unembarrassed about changing in front of the others, they switched clothes. The uniforms were creased and had a faint hint of body odour. That was by design. Fresh, neatly pressed uniforms were more likely to stand out. Very fetching, Cunningham said. OK, everyone, listen up. This is what we're going to do. You three, he pointed at the police officers, stay down here. Once we've secured our targets, we'll call you in to process any family members. You, he pointed at the manager, Escort Hunter and Parsons to the penthouse in the service lift. When the guards meet you there, tell them the guys are from BT and they need to investigate a fault on the line in the penthouse. Sir, they will not believe that. They know I would have made such an appointment well in advance. Then you'd better be convincing when you're up there, laddie. In my experience, oligarch bodyguards are a short-tempered bunch. You don't want them using those secret weapons on you. But I would normally ring in advance at the very least. We can't risk it. They might tell us not to come. Then they'll be suspicious when we turn up anyway. Where? Where will you be? Close behind. Everything goes according to plan. You won't notice us until it's too late. As soon as things go noisy, I want you to get face down on the ground and put your hands over your head. You think you can do that? Please, sir. What do you mean by go noisy? You'll work it out, laddie, Cunningham said. He looked over at Hunter. You know what to do? Hunter nodded. All right, then. He pulled out his phone. 
I'm going to call Hereford. As soon as we get the green light, we move in. While we wait, we'll examine the plans of the building so we know what's waiting for us up there. He dialed. It was 12.30. Alice was tired, and for the first time since working at MI6, she found herself wishing she was more soberly dressed. She was still wearing the casual gear she'd thrown on the night before. But now she was sitting at a boardroom table on the fifth floor, not only with her boss, Maxwell Stark, but also with Alan Sturrock, head of the service. Stark was opening a fresh packet of extra-strong mints. The boardroom was heavy with the smell of peppermint, but somehow Alice didn't mind that. Sturrock repelled her. The oily hair, the way he regularly rubbed moisturising lotion into his hands with a repulsive, slimy sound. But these were serious men, seriously dressed, on serious business. It was a big deal that she had a seat at the table. There were two tablets in front of them. One had an open line to SAS headquarters in Hereford, the other to number 10. Alice had been with Stark when he explained to Sturrock her deduction that Polyakov was being sheltered by Rostropovich, and she sincerely thought the chief's eyes might fall out of his head. Apparently, Rostropovich was a no-go area, at least without the say-so of the PM. Alice could only imagine what kind of messy political deal she had stumbled across, but she was certain that Sturrock was not the type to take action that might be detrimental to his career. A voice came over the Hereford line. We have confirmation from our team on the ground that they're ready to make the arrest. Not until I give the instruction, said Sturrock. He tapped a button on the tablet connected to number ten. We're ready. Uh, do we have approval? A pause. Approval withheld. Repeat. Approval withheld. Sturrock's lips thinned. He looked at Alice as if the lack of approval was her fault. Then he spoke again. Hereford, uh, this is Sturrock. Uh, you have no green light. Repeat, you have no green light. Sturrock turned to Alice. Let's hope your intelligence is good, young lady, he said. This could be an embarrassment for us all if you've made a mistake. Does this mean the operation is over? she asked. Sturrock didn't answer her directly. Instead, he continued his communication with Hereford. Keep your men on the ground. Is that understood? Understood. Alice glanced at Stark. Her boss gave her a reassuring smile as if to say, wait and see how this plays out. Then he leaned across the table and offered her a peppermint. Alice declined. Five o'clock, Aman. Danny and Bethany's suitcases were in the boot. Their press passes were in their shoulder bags. Danny's handgun was stowed in the glove compartment. He had the wheel and was once again negotiating the city traffic. The GPS unit was set to take them to the Hotel Grand, but the route it chose was not direct. Amman is a city built on hills. Although there were broad tree-lined thoroughfares heading through central parts of the city, these main arterial routes were clogged with traffic, and so they found themselves winding carefully through narrow side streets and over cobbled semi-pedestrianised areas bustling with people. Almost all the women they saw wore headscarves. A very few wore a more concealing niqab. The men seemed more westernised in jeans and T-shirts, though some, mainly the older ones, wore traditional dish-dash. Danny had his window down to get some airflow going in the intense afternoon heat. It let in the sounds and smells of the city. Exhaust fumes, street food stalls, deep-frying falafel, market traders bellowing outside covered bazaars, loud Arabic pop blaring from cars and first-floor windows. The buildings were a colourful mixture of browns and mustard yellows. Danny had the impression of a busy but friendly place. A man was originally built on seven hills, Bethany said as the vehicle laboured up a particularly steep incline, reminding Danny that she was a Middle East specialist. Nineteen hills now, they say, with the urban sprawl. Lots of refugees. 
Palestinians originally after the Arab-Israeli war, more recently Syrians. I didn't realise I booked a tour guide, Danny said. He was less interested in the geography of the city than in getting to their destination without incident. As they passed some kind of ancient monument, sand-coloured pillars and a tiered half-circle arena, he paid it barely any attention. They drove on in silence, through various sprawling districts of the city, up and down hills, until finally the GPS unit returned them to one of the main arterial routes, where the traffic had eased and Danny was able to up his speed. Five minutes later, the Hotel Grand appeared. It was a long building, four storeys high, with an elegant roof turreted and tiled. It took up the entire side of a pleasant square, in the middle of which was a flower garden. A couple of palm trees grew by the entrance, their leaves motionless in the still air. Between them, three flags drooped pathetically on flagpoles. The road around the square was fairly busy with traffic, but it was the military vehicles parked right in front of the hotel that drew Danny's attention. There were three khaki-coloured open-top trucks parked in a row directly in front of the main entrance, noses pointing outwards. There were at least 15 soldiers surrounding the vehicles, all armed with assault rifles. "'Looks like our general's got quite a rat in you,' he said. Bethany didn't reply. She was eyeing the soldiers steadily. Danny allowed himself to drive a single circuit of the square. He knew there was a good chance that someone was observing the traffic to identify suspicious patterns of behaviour. Any more than twice round, they were likely to be observed and possibly trailed. As they drove past the front of the hotel, he noted the two armed guys at the main door checking the ID of three Middle Eastern men entering the hotel. He glanced upwards and saw an open window on the top floor where another armed man was looking down onto the square. There was no getting away from it. The Yanks in this hotel were on high alert. "'You think someone's tipped them off?' Bethany said, her voice edgy, as Danny continued his circuit of the square. "'No,' Danny said. "'The general's meant to be overseeing a peace treaty between the Turks and the Kurds. It's an obvious target for terrorist activity. If I was them, I'd be jumpy too.' "'They're right to be,' Bethany said quietly. Danny couldn't argue with that. He drove down one side of the hotel and then round the back. There were more soldiers here, guarding either end of the street. They passed three exits, one with a cluster of large plastic refuse bins outside. Two soldiers guarded each of the three exits. There was no way of getting in or out of this place without your ID being checked. I don't like it, Bethany said. What did you expect? Danny said. A walk in the park? She didn't answer. They were able to park the car, about 800 metres from the hotel, along a narrow road lined with cafes and small shops. The route back to the hotel would take them to a crossroads where they would turn right onto a main road that led to the hotel. They parked outside a small shop selling fabrics. Danny stowed his handgun under his seat. He felt naked, not wearing it, but there was zero chance of getting into the hotel if he was carrying if he needed a weapon when he was inside, and he hoped he wouldn't, he'd have to improvise. They exited the vehicle. Danny locked it and pocketed the key. He looked up and down the road. There were plenty of pedestrians, but they all seemed to be going about their business. If any of them were paying any special attention to the two smartly dressed Westerners who had just stepped out of the dented old Passat, Danny didn't notice them, and he was trained to do just that. This is where we split up, Danny said. They couldn't enter the hotel together. Once they were inside, nobody could know they were associated if Bethany was to lay her honey trap successfully. You get in first, I'll be watching. It's almost like you don't trust me. When it's done, we meet back here. Any problems, get a taxi back to the safe house. I'm about to walk unarmed into a hotel heavily guarded by American troops and kill their top guy. What makes you think something's going to go wrong? You have your phone. Contact me if there's a problem, but do it discreetly. She gave him what was obviously meant to be a don't patronise me look, but she couldn't hide her anxiety as she glanced over Danny's shoulder in the direction of the hotel. How do I look? 
She said, right for the job, Danny told her, and he meant it. Bethany would turn heads. With any luck, she'd turn the generals. She set off along the pavement. There was no need for her to weave in and out of the other pedestrians. There was something about her seemingly confident stride that made others get out of her way. He waited until they were separated by a distance of fifty metres before following her. His skin was damp with sweat as he walked past the entrance to a souk, fragrant with incense, and ignored the shouts of a street food vendor offering him something wrapped in flatbread. Bethany didn't look back. At the end of the street was the crossroads where she turned right, and Danny lost sight of her for a few seconds. As he himself turned right, he saw the back of her head as she continued down the road towards the hotel. They passed one of its side entrances on the opposite side of the road. Then they entered the recently wrecked square at the front of the hotel. Bethany approached the main hotel entrance. Danny stopped outside a cafe with a green awning where young Jordanians sat in the shade drinking tiny cups of coffee. He noticed, with a certain amount of satisfaction, that a few of the American guys on patrol outside the hotel watched her appreciatively as she passed. One guy, stationed between the two palm trees, risked a bollocking by moving from his post and approaching her. He noted the way she flounced her hair as she walked away from him, and how the soldier made a rueful arms-in-the-air gesture to one of his mates, as if to say, ''Hey, I tried.'' Bethany trotted up the wide steps leading to the main entrance. Danny could see that the guys on guard here were a more serious prospect. There was nothing about their body language that suggested they had any flirtatious intention. They examined Bethany's ID and press pass for a full thirty seconds. For a moment, Danny thought they had a problem, because the soldier passed the documentation to his mate, who studied it just as intently. After another thirty seconds, however, he handed it back to Bethany. The two soldiers stepped aside, and she disappeared into the hotel. Danny took a seat at the café and ordered a coffee. He would give it ten minutes. He watched as an official-looking black car pulled up in front of the hotel and three Jordanian men in suits emerged. They received the same treatment from the American soldiers at the door and appeared impatient with the security arrangements. It didn't do them much good. The soldiers prolonged the ID check before allowing them in. There was more movement. A group of guys in Arabic dress exited the hotel. A minute later, the soldiers directed a courier to another entrance round the back. Danny checked his watch. 17.45 hours. He decided it was time to enter. He put some money on the table and left the café. He attracted considerably less attention than Bethany as he approached the hotel. To the soldiers standing between the palm trees, he was invisible. Walking up the steps to the entrance, he fixed one of the two guards with an easy smile. "'State your purpose,' the guard said. Close up, Danny could see that he was carrying an MP5 submachine gun, and he noticed the handgun holster bulge under his camouflage jacket. He had a shaved head and the kind of leathery complexion that Danny recognised from men operating in hot countries for extended periods. He decided this guy was probably part of the General's SF retinue. Press, Danny told him. There was an uncomfortable moment as the guy looked Danny up and down. Danny knew what he was probably thinking. You're the biggest journalist I ever saw. He felt self-conscious of his size, as though he was squeezed into a suit too small for him and was glad that Bethany had loosened his tie. He held the guy's gaze with the same easy smile. If he showed any sign of uncertainty, he might be denied entrance. "'You have ID?' the Yank asked. He had a sturdy New York accent. Danny dug into his shoulder bag and took out his fake passport and Sunday Times press pass. The guy handed the press pass to his mate, who started keying his name into a handheld device. He opened up the passport himself. He checked the photo against Danny's face, then continued to examine the details. "'How old are you, Mr. Waldron?' he asked. Danny was glad he'd done his homework. Thirty-four, he said. The soldier nodded and handed back the passport. "'Let me see the bag.' Danny handed it over. 
The soldier removed the notebook and flicked through its empty pages. He replaced it and returned the bag to Danny, just as his mate handed back the press pass, saying, "'He's on the list.' "'Purish, huh?' said the first guy. "'One of yours already came in here a few minutes ago. "'Good looking, Bright. Maybe you'll get lucky.' "'Business, not pleasure, mate. "'Lots of interest in the peace talks in London,' Danny said. "'He smiled more broadly. "'Hey, when do you get off duty? "'Maybe we could do a little interview. "'It would be an interesting piece, no? "'Day in the life kind of thing.' "'Nice try,' said the soldier, "'clearly free of all suspicion now. "'He jabbed one thumb over his shoulder. "'You're in.' "'Well, if you change your mind,' Danny said. "'But the soldier's attention was already on one of his colleagues "'walking up the steps, perhaps to take over guard duty. "'Danny entered the hotel. "'The interior was rich Arab gaudy. "'The entrance hall was lined with glass presentation cases "'filled with chunky gold jewellery and expensive trinkets. "'There was an enormous chandelier in the reception area, "'decorative columns at regular intervals.' gold paint on the elaborate architraves, and an attractive young woman playing cocktail jazz on a white grand piano in the very middle of the room. There was no overt sign of any military presence inside, but Danny wasn't fooled by that. He saw the white man standing by the ornate elevator casually dressed, watching Danny as he entered. He saw the man and woman sitting wordlessly at a comfortable sofa, Tea things in front of them, both of them checking all the other guests in the reception area, of whom there must have been at least thirty. There were several exhibition boards, with information in English and Arabic regarding the preliminary talks that were ongoing in the hotel in advance of the main peace talks. A plan of the hotel and its various conference rooms was pinned to one. The day's schedule was pinned to another, hourly meetings between nine and five, and lists of attendees. General O'Brien's name appeared several times. He'd had a busy day, and Danny hoped that once his official duties were over, he'd be ready for a spot of R&R in the hotel bar, as was his habit, according to Hereford's intel. Danny took in the hotel plan at a glance. He confirmed that there were three floors, one elevator and one staircase. The bar was ahead of him, the staircase beyond that. A couple of smartly dressed blonde women with clipboards were standing by the exhibition boards. It appeared that they were there to help delegates with information, but the business day was over now, and they looked more interested in their watches than anything else. Danny kept moving before the blondes could ask him if he needed any help. He calculated that the best way to avoid suspicion was to make contact with a member of the hotel staff, an open display that he had nothing to hide. He walked straight up to the reception desk, where a friendly-looking Jordanian woman greeted him with a lovely smile. "'May I help you, sir?' "'I hope so,' Danny said. "'I'm looking for the bar.' He already knew its location from the plan on the exhibition board, but he nodded politely as she directed him to a corridor to the right of the elevator. As he walked in that direction, he saw that the watchers all had their attention elsewhere. The bar was even plusher than the reception area, a thick burgundy carpet with low glass tables surrounded by comfortable armchairs. The bar itself was twenty metres long, with an impressive display of alcohol bottles and optics on the wall behind it. A rare sight in the Arab world, but not apparently in Jordan. The three bartenders were not busy. There were no punters at the bar itself, and only a smattering of people sitting at the tables. One of those people was Bethany. She had installed herself at a table in the far corner, next to a bookcase filled with leather-bound books. She had a full glass and a mixer bottle in front of her, and she sat with her legs crossed, nonchalantly swiping her phone. She made no attempt to acknowledge Danny's presence, but her own was having the desired effect. The three bartenders were staring at her quite openly. One of them even seemed to be making an appreciative comment to his colleague. Danny felt a pang of antagonism towards the guy for doing that, then cursed himself for feeling it. Mind on the job. He took a seat in a position where he could keep an eye on Bethany, as well as all his exit routes. There was the way he'd come in, two doors leading to the male and female lavatories, 
and a further corridor at the far end of the bar leading away from it. One of the bartenders approached. Danny ordered a bottle of water. It came, accompanied by a plate of nibbles, a small wallet of hotel-branded matches, and an eye-watering bill. Danny put some notes down to pay and pocketed the matches. It was ingrained behaviour for him to take possession of any object that might come in useful at some point in the future. He found it hard to imagine somewhere he would feel more out of place. The same couldn't be said for Bethany. She looked as if she belonged here, and she looked stunning. Danny did what he needed to do to quell his discomfort. Back in Hereford, the CO had told Danny that there had intelligence about the General's routine, that he was in the habit of coming to the bar for a cocktail at 1800 hours every evening. But what if he broke his routine? What if he didn't turn up? Plan B would mean that Bethany had to go looking for him. That could get interesting. For now, all they could do was stand by. He sipped his drink, surveyed the exit routes, kept Bethany in his peripheral vision, and waited. Chapter 13 The room was silent. Alice felt uncomfortable sitting here with these two older men. They'd been in and out for the past four hours, one person always remaining, waiting for the call from number ten. Now all three of them were back in the room together. She checked the time, twenty past four. Starrock was moisturising his hands again. Stark seemed to be making a special effort not to watch the procedure, but the slick, greasy sound was impossible to ignore. Alice's boss removed his spectacles and made an attempt to clean them with his tie. When he put them back on, they were no less dirty, but Starrock had finished moisturising his hands, so the process had served its purpose. "'Peppermint, Alan?' Stark offered. Starrock shook his head bad-temperedly. He obviously wasn't handling the pressure well. The gravity of the situation was obvious. For Starrock and Stark, the two top guys in the building, to be running this operation themselves, that was unusual. Unprecedented, so far as Alice knew. They were clearly nervous in their own ways. When the speaker on one of the tablets burst into life again, Starrock visibly started. Alice recognised from earlier the voice on the line to number ten. You have a green light to proceed. Repeat, you have a green light to proceed. Starrock stood up immediately. Tell Hereford it's a go, he said to Stark, and keep me updated. He left the room without another word. Stark gave Alice a thin smile. Let's see what Messrs. Rostropovich and Polyakov have to say for themselves, shall we? He said, and he popped another mint into his mouth. Cunningham's phone rang while the SAS men were still poring over the plans of the building. He put it to his ear for only a few seconds before killing the line. Hereford, he told the others, it's a go. The five SAS men went silently to work. Cunningham, Hobbs and Moore pulled black balaclavas over their heads and performed one last routine check of their personal weapons. Hunter and Parsons approached the manager. He was sweating profusely, clutching his hands and blinking a couple of times every second. Hunter had two options, to scare him into compliance or try to calm him down. He knew Cunningham would default to the former strategy. Hunter didn't think that would be the right call. The more nervous the manager looked, the more suspicious the oligarch's bodyguards would be. These wouldn't be goons. Rostropovich sounded to Hunter like a guy who could afford the best, and that meant ex-SF, probably. Hunter put one hand on the manager's shoulder and gave him a reassuring smile. "'It's going to be fine, buddy,' he said. We do this kind of thing every day of the week. So long as you do what we say, it'll be a walk in the park. The manager gave him an I hope you're right kind of smile. Over his shoulder, Hunter saw Cunningham raise an eyebrow. He ignored it. Take me to the service lift, Hunter said. He picked up the canvas bag of engineer's tools. The manager led him back out into the car park. The tire screech of a departing vehicle faded away. Their footsteps echoed against the concrete walls as they walked across to a far corner of the space. Here, tucked away next to another fire exit, was the service lift. 
A sign read, Staff Only. There was a single button next to the doors, and beneath it was a keyhole. The manager produced a sizable bunch of keys and selected one. He slotted it into the keyhole and turned it. Then he pressed the button to call the lift. Thirty seconds later, the doors opened and the empty car presented itself. Hunter looked back across the car park. Parsons was standing outside the fire door, watching for his signal. Hunter double-checked there was nobody else around. It looked clear, then gave Parsons the thumbs up. Keep the doors open, he told the manager, and he stepped inside the lift. There was enough space for twenty people inside. Its metal walls were scuffed where trolleys had bashed into them. Hunter looked up. As expected, there was a detachable panel in the ceiling, no latch. They just needed to push it up, and they would be able to gain access to the top of the lift. The others arrived, Cunningham, Hobbs, and Moore in their civvies, Parsons in his BT uniform. They entered the lift. Moore gave Cunningham a leg up so he could reach the ceiling panel. Cunningham lifted the panel up and moved it to one side. Then he hauled himself up through the hole and onto the top of the lift. Hunter helped Moore and Hobbs follow him up there. Within 30 seconds, the three balaclavered men were out of sight, the detachable panel back in place. Hunter and Parsons were inside the lift alone. The manager was still standing nervously outside. OK, buddy, Hunter said. Get inside. We can close the doors. Let's take her up to the penthouse. The manager swallowed hard and blinked again. He removed the key, stepped into the lift and looked up. Won't they be crushed when we reach the top? Hunter shook his head. There's always headroom, he said. Let's go. The manager inhaled deeply and pressed the button marked P. Danny checked the time. 18.20 hours. No sign of the general. He should have been here 20 minutes ago. He slowly sipped his water. The bar was filling up. There were 30 or 40 people in here now, and Danny was anxious. Would they have to go looking for the guy? He still had line of sight to Bethany, but occasionally some hotel guests would get in the way and he'd lose visual contact. Each time that happened, he experienced a twinge of apprehension. Did he trust Bethany to go through with this, even if they found the general? He didn't know. Movement by the entrance at the end of the bar. Four men walked in. Three of them were in camouflage gear. The fourth wore civvies, but it was clear from his demeanour that he had authority over the others, who walked slightly behind him, and with the faint stiffness of gait that Danny recognised as soldiers in the presence of their superior. Danny subtly examined the man in civvies. He was well built and had a deep permatan, silver hair, twinkling eyes, a good-looking man, and a face Danny recognised not only from his target pack, but also from the CCTV still Sturrock and the others had shown him back in Hereford. In that still, the man had been wearing a straw trilby and flamboyant shirt. Here, he was more soberly dressed. His shirt was a pale pink, which, to Danny, suggested his flamboyant nature hadn't quite deserted him. A sports jacket, chinos, for some reason, Danny found himself noticing the general's shoes, expensive brown brogues, very shiny. The whole ensemble was a direct contrast to the camo gear of the soldiers surrounding him and elsewhere in and around the hotel. It was unmistakably General O'Brien, and he was unmistakably different to any top brass Danny had met before. At a glance, Danny could see that there was something unusually easygoing about him. He seemed relaxed, like a wealthy man on a golfing holiday. He turned to speak to his three men and clasped one of them on the shoulder, an unheard-of gesture in Danny's world between men of such different ranks. The three men laughed at whatever it was he said, then left the room chatting to each other. The general remained at the bar alone. He took a stool and sat with his back to Danny, who could see him raise a finger to attract the attention of one of the barmen, and instinctively made a mental note that he was right-handed. Danny glanced over at Bethany. She hadn't moved. She didn't even seem to have noticed the general's arrival. Danny hoped she was just playing it cool. He pulled out his phone and made a show of playing with it. In reality, he was simply swiping icons while surreptitiously keeping eyes on the room. A corner of his mind was analysing everything he'd seen. Something about the general didn't seem right. 
The civvies, the easy-going nature. Danny had met top military guys like this before, and they were all the same. Army through and through, straight as the barrel of an assault rifle, and twice as threatening. But then it occurred to him that perhaps this easy-going nature was precisely the character trait that made him so suited to this job of brokering peace between warring factions. The world expected him to be the point man at talks that could save any number of lives in the region. Sturrock expected him to be secretly planning to sabotage those talks, but this outward show of relaxation and friendliness was a good way of confirming his quiet self-confidence. Maybe he cultivated it to distract anyone and everyone from the truth. Or maybe he just didn't care about what he was doing, about the things he had done. Danny remembered the Zero Twenty Two patrol, his mates dead within moments of the Russian ambush, the twisted hunks of metal smouldering on the wasteland of the bomb site. A bitter taste rose in the back of his throat. None of that would have happened had it not been for the man at the bar in front of him. His mates would still be alive. It was all Danny could do to stop himself rising from his chair and dealing with the bastard himself. But he remained seated and sipped his water again. Bethany had stood up. She walked across the room, weaving her way around the tables, avoiding all eye contact with Danny. He was reminded once more what a skilful actress she was. Her body language had changed again. Her hips sashayed appealingly. A tendril of blonde hair tumbled across the side of her face. Her lips seemed somehow fuller than earlier. Hotel guests, male and female, watched her as she passed. Bethany approached the bar, but not the general. He still had his back to her and was being presented with a cocktail. As Danny reflected that this was the first time he'd ever seen a military man order anything other than a beer or a shot, Bethany continued walking along the bar. She sat next to another guy. He had dark skin and wore a business suit. Probably a local, Danny thought. There was an orange juice on the bar in front of him. Bethany didn't strike up a conversation. She gestured at one of the bartenders, but he was already hurrying to serve her. He leaned in a deliberately nonchalant way against the bar as he took her order. Bethany was plainly having the desired effect on the men around her. She ordered a drink and looked pointedly away. The bartender flinched at the rejection before pouring her a glass of champagne. By now the local man in the suit had noticed her. He swiveled on his chair and started making conversation. There was no way Danny could hear what the guy was saying at this distance, but he could see Bethany's reflection in the mirror behind the bar. It was a study in boredom. She was by some distance the most attractive woman of the fifteen or so in the room, but also the least accessible, a challenge to any alpha male in the vicinity. Right now there were two. The guy in the suit was leaning towards her. Danny could see him side on, the forced smile, the fast talking. Bethany remained unimpressed. When her champagne arrived, she idly traced her finger around the rim of the glass, apparently impervious to the guy's charms. It didn't seem to deter him. He leaned a little closer. Danny thought he might be at risk of falling from his stool and stretched out one arm so that he was almost touching her. Bethany recoiled, but in such a way that made her seem superior rather than threatened. The guy took the hint and retracted his arm, but he was still leaning towards her, still chatting, still clearly of the opinion that his luck might be in. However, by now, the general had noticed her. Danny had to hand it to Bethany. She was playing this well. The first rule of a honey trap was to make the target come to you. Make a clumsy approach, and you do nothing but cause suspicion. Let the target think this is all their great idea, and you're halfway there. Especially if your target is an oversexed yank with a highly developed sense of his own attractiveness. The general had picked up his cocktail in its delicate martini glass and was sauntering towards Bethany. Bethany was tracing the rim of her champagne glass again, pointedly ignoring the guy in the suit. As the general sat on the stool to her right, she made no attempt even to acknowledge him. The arrival of the general had a strange effect on the man in the suit. 
Maybe he thought this broad-shouldered white guy was there to ensure Bethany wasn't being hassled. Maybe one alpha male had seen off another. The man sat up straight again, made a big show of looking at his watch, then downed his orange juice and left the room. Danny could immediately see that the general was the more skilful player. He didn't rush it. He didn't appear too keen. Both he and Bethany had their backs to Danny, but so far as he could tell, the general hadn't yet initiated a conversation. Danny felt like he was in the presence of two predators slowly circling each other, waiting to go in for the kill. He stood up and headed to the gents. Bethany was handling this well, and he didn't want to draw attention to himself by sitting there staring at them for too long. It was a long time since he'd taken a piss in a room this posh. An obsequious toilet attendant handed him a fresh towel once he'd washed his hands. Danny dropped a banknote in his dish. A failure to tip would make the attendant more likely to remember him. Then returned to his seat in the bar. As he passed Bethany and the general, he could see they were talking. A slightly flirtatious smile played across Bethany's lips, and O'Brien was leaning in towards her and waving one hand. There had still been no eye contact between Danny and Bethany as he took his seat again. He sipped his drink, swiped his phone, and in the quiet of his mind said to himself, Contact made. Cunningham, Hobbs and Moore were crouched low on top of the lift. The shaft extended into the darkness above them. Dim service bulbs glowed every ten metres, but there was insufficient light to see to the top of the building. Three sets of cabling extended from the body of the lift up along the chute, the main cable and two security ones. At the front of the lift roof, housed in a grey panel, were a set of external controls for safety and servicing purposes. Cunningham hunkered down over them. There was an override switch, a red button to move the lift up and a green one to move it down. To the left, clipped to the side of the control panel, was a piece of apparatus, a half-metre-long metal lever somewhere between a 